Mira and Harper Audio present Two Dead Wives by Adele Parks Performed by Kristen Atherton March 2020 Chapter 1 D.C. Clements There is no body a fact D.C. Clements finds both a problem and a tremulous, tantalising possibility. She's not a woman inclined to irrational hope, or even excessive hope. Any damned hope, really. At least, not usually. Kylie Gillingham is probably dead. Statistically speaking, it's not looking good for her. The 43-year-old woman has been missing nearly two weeks. 97% of the 180,000 people a year who are reported missing are found within a week, dead or alive. She hasn't been spotted by members of the public or picked up on CCTV. Her bank, phone and email accounts haven't been touched. She has social media registered under her married name, Kai Janssen. They've lain dormant. No perky pictures of carefully arranged books, lattes, Negronis or peonies. Kylie Gillingham hasn't returned to either of her homes. Statistically speaking, it's looking very bad. Experience would also suggest this sort of situation has to end terribly. When a wife disappears, all eyes turn on the husband. In this case, there is not one but two raging husbands left behind. Both men once loved the missing woman very much. Love is just a shiver away from hate. The evidence does not conclusively indicate murder. There is no body. But a violent abduction is a reasonable proposition. Police speak, disciplined by protocol. Kidnap and abuse, possible torture is likely. Woman speak, fired by indignation. They know Kylie Gillingham was kept in a room in an uninhabited apartment just floors below the one she lived in with husband number two, Dan Janssen. That's not a coincidence. There is a hole in the wall of that room. Most likely, Kylie punched or kicked it through. The debris created was flung through a window into the street, probably in order to attract attention. Her efforts failed. Fingerprints place her in the room. It's unlikely she was simply hanging out, or even hiding out, as there is evidence to suggest she was chained to the radiator. Yet despite all this, the usually clear, logical, reasonable Clements wants to ignore statistics, experience, and even evidence that suggests the abduction ended in fatal violence. She wants to hope. There just might be some way, somehow, that Kylie, Enigma, Bigamist, escaped from that sordid room and is alive. She might be in hiding. She is technically a criminal, after all. She might be hiding from the law. She can hardly go home. She will know by now that her life of duplicity is exposed. She will know her husbands are incensed, baying for blood. She has three largely uninterested half-brothers on her father's side and a mother who lives in Australia. None of them give Clements a sense that they are helping or protecting Kylie. She will know who abducted her. If alive, she must be terrified. Clement's junior partner, Constable Tanner, burly and blunt as usual, scoffs at the idea that she escaped. He's waiting for a body. He'd settle for a confession. It's been four days now since Dan Janssen left the country. Skipped justice, as Tanner insists on saying but the constable is wet behind the ears. He still thinks murder is glamorous and career-enhancing. Clements tries to remember. 
Did she ever think that way? She's been a police officer for nearly 15 years. She joined the force straight out of uni, a few years younger than Tanner is now. But no, she can't remember a time when she thought murder was glamorous. He hasn't skipped justice. We're talking to him and his lawyers, she points out, with what feels like the last bit of her taut patience. You're being pedantic. I'm being accurate. But you're talking to him through bloody Microsoft Teams, says Tanner dismissively. What the hell is that? The future, Clement sighs. She ought to be offended by the uppity tone of the junior police officer. It's disrespectful. She's the detective constable. She would be offended if she had the energy, but she doesn't have any to spare. It's all focused on the case. On Kylie Gillingham. She needs to remain clear-sighted, analytical. They need to examine the facts, the evidence, over and over again. To be fair, Constable Tanner is focused too, but his focus manifests in frenetic frustration. She tries to keep him on track. Look, lockdown means Dan Janssen isn't coming back to the UK for questioning any time soon. Even if there wasn't a strange new world to negotiate, we couldn't force him to come to us, not without arresting him. And I can't do that yet. Tanner knocks his knuckles against her desk as though he is rapping on a door, asking to be let in, demanding attention. But all the evidence is circumstantial. Tanner knows this. He just can't quite accept it. He feels the finish line is in sight, but he can't cross it, and it frustrates him. Disappoints him. He wants the world to be clear-cut. He wants crimes to be punished. Bad men behind bars. A safer realm. He doesn't want some posh twat flashing his passport and wallet, hopping on a plane to his family mansion in the Netherlands, and getting away with it. Dan Janssen's good looks and air of entitlement offend Tanner. Clements understands all that. She understands it, but has never allowed personal bias and preferences to cloud her investigating procedures. We found her phones in his flat, Tanner insists. Kylie could have put them there herself, counters Clements. She did live there with him as his wife. And we found the receipt for the cable ties and the bucket from the room she was held in. We found a receipt. The annual number of cable ties produced is about 100 billion. A lot of people buy cable ties very few of them, to bind their wives to radiators. Anson might have wanted to neaten up his computer and charger cords. He lives in a minimalist house. That's what any lawyer worth their salt will argue. Clements rolls her head from left to right. Her neck clicks like castanets. His fingerprints are on the food packets! Which means he touched those protein bars. That's all they prove. Not that he took them into the room, not that he was ever in the room. Exasperated, Tanner demands, Well, how else did they get there? They didn't fly in through the bloody window, did they? Clements understands he's not just excitable. He cares. He wants this resolved. She likes him for it, even if he's clumsy in his declarations. It makes her want to soothe him offer him guarantees and reassurances that she doesn't even believe in. She doesn't soothe or reassure, because she has to stay professional, focused. The devil is in the detail. She just has to stay sharp, be smarter than the criminal. That's what she believes. She might have brought them in from their home. He might have touched them in their flat. That's what a lawyer will argue. He did it all right. No doubt about it, asserts Tanner with a steely certainty. Clements knows that there is always doubt. A flicker, 
like a wick, almost lit, then instantly snuffed. Nothing is certain in this world. That's why people like her are so important. People who know about ambiguity, yet carry on regardless. Carry on asking questions, finding answers. Dig, push, probe. That is her job. For a conviction to be secured in a court of law, things must be proven beyond reasonable doubt. It isn't easy to do. Barristers are brilliant, wily. Jurors can be insecure, overwhelmed. Defendants might lie, cheat. The evidence so far is essentially fragile and hypothetical. I said, didn't I? Right at the beginning, I said, it's always the husband that's done it, Tanner continues excitedly. He did say as much, yes. However, he was talking about husband number one, Mark Fletcher, at that point, if Clement's memory serves her correctly, which it always does. And even if her memory one day fails to be the reliable machine that it currently is, she takes notes, meticulous notes so she always has those to rely on. Yes, Tanner said it was the husband, but this case has been about which husband? Dan Janssen, married to Kai, dedicated daughter to a sick mother, classy dresser and sexy wife. Or Mark Fletcher, husband to Lee, devoted stepmother, conscientious management consultant and happy wife. Kai, Lee, Kylie. Kylie Gillingham, the bigamist, who had been hiding in plain sight. But now she is gone, vanished. The case against Janssen is gathering momentum, says Clements carefully. Because Kylie was held captive in his apartment block. Yes. Which is right on the river. Easy way to lose a body. She winces at this thought, but stays on track. Obviously, Mark Fletcher has motive too. A good lawyer trying to cast doubt on Janssen's guilt might argue that Fletcher knew about the other husband and followed his wife to her second home. Tanner is bright, fast. He chases her line of thought. He knows the way defence lawyers create murky waters. Fletcher could have confronted Kylie somewhere in the apartment block. A row. A violent moment of fury, adds Clements. He knocks her out cold, then finds an uninhabited apartment and impetuously stashes her there. Tanner is determined to stick to his theory that Janssen is the guilty man. Sounds far-fetched. How did he break in? This thing seems more planned. I agree. The point is... Either husband could have discovered the infidelity, then, furious, humiliated and ruthless, imprisoned her. They'd have wanted to scare and punish, reassert control, show her who was boss. They know this much, but they do not know what happened next. Was she killed in that room? If so, where is the body hidden? And you know we can't limit this investigation to just the two husbands. There are other suspects, she adds. Tanner flops into his chair, holds up a hand and starts to count off the suspects on his fingers. Ollie, Kylie's teen stepson. He has the body and strength of a man. Clements finishes his thought. But the emotions and irrationality of a child. He didn't know his stepmom was a bigamist. But I did know she was having an affair. It's possible he did something rash, something extreme that is hard to come back from. Then there's the creepy concierge in the swanky apartment block. Alfonso. Yeah, he might be our culprit. Clements considers it. He has access to all the flats, back stairs, the CCTV... He's already admitted that he deleted the CCTV from the day Kylie was abducted. He said that footage isn't kept more than 24 hours unless an incident of some kind is reported. Apparently, the residents insist on this for privacy. It might be true. It might be just convenient. 
Clements nods. And then there's Fiona Phillipson, the best friend. Bloody hell, we have more suspects than an Agatha Christie novel, says Tanner, with a laugh that is designed to hide how overwhelmed and irritated he feels. His nose squashed up against shadowy injustice, cruel violence and deception. Right. I still think the husband did it. Which one? Crap. Round and round in circles we go. He scratches his head aggressively. Do you want me to order him pizza? It's going to be a long night. Is anyone still doing deliveries? I don't think they are, points out Clements. You know, lockdown. Crap, he says again, and then rallies. Crisps and chocolate from the vending machine, then. We'll need something to sustain us while we work out where Kylie is. Clements smiles to herself. It's the first time in a long time that Tanner has referred to Kylie by name, not as her or the bigamist, or worse, the body. It feels like an acceptance of a possibility that she might be somewhere. Somewhere other than dead and gone. Did she somehow, against the odds, escape? Is Kylie Gillingham, the woman who dared to defy convention, the woman who would not accept limits and laughed in the face of conformity, still out there, somehow just being? God, Clements hopes so. Chapter 2 Dan Dan Janssen is volunteering to cooperate. He is not under arrest. A fact his lawyers tell him repeatedly, in calm, confident tones that maybe makes them think they are justifying their exorbitant fees, and a fact that the police officers inform him of at the beginning of each meeting, spat out by rote in a bored manner that somehow suggests the word yet is floating across the video call. It is the fact he reminds himself of with increasing regularity as he tries to go about his day. When he dresses in the morning, when he is eating, cleaning his teeth, listening to music, whatever. Outwardly, he's striving to appear unconcerned, unruffled. It matters. He dresses in suits when he has to speak with the British police, combined with an impeccably iron shirt. On more casual days, he wears chinos and a polo shirt, never just a tee. He wants to look crisp, despite the pressure of police interviews, the stress of the global pandemic and the issue of his wife vanishing. Not his wife at all. The woman he thought was his wife, but who is a bigamist. His four-year marriage to her, a stylish ceremony in the Chelsea Register office, followed by an oyster and champagne reception at the original West Street Ivy, isn't worth the paper the certificate was issued on. Apparently. He plays it over and over. She was another man's wife. She lied to him, betrayed him repeatedly. And now she is dead, but is still going to ruin what is left of his life if he is sent to prison for her murder. He can't exactly blame her for that. But he can't exactly forgive her for it either. It is important he keeps up appearances, retains standards. He will not slump sag, admit defeat, like most of the world's population. He's better than the vast majority. Although, when the fact comes into his head that he is not under arrest yet, it puts him off the carefully prepared, nutritionally balanced meals made by his private chef. It blasts into his head when he's playing a round of golf with his father. It puts him off his game. The tone of his internal monologue continually shifts. Sometimes he is brash, dismissive. Other times the fear and dread leak in. Insidious. Threatening. He didn't kill his wife, 
He didn't do it. But Dan is aware that innocent men are sent to prison from time to time. Miscarriages of justice do occur. He is white, privileged, extraordinarily wealthy. People like him are very unpopular right now. It's a pity. Any other time in history, he would have been practically worshipped, often above the law. Look, he's not saying that's right, you know. Just that for him, personally, it would have been convenient. But now people vilify men like him, which is inconvenient. They want him to be guilty. But he is not. He can see that the evidence is stacking up against him. There is motive, opportunity, and circumstantial data. Each meeting with the police reveals that there are more and more things to be concerned about. I just want to share the screen for a moment, if that's okay. I want to show you some photos, says the senior policewoman, D.C. Clements. He thinks of her as senior because she's a higher rank than the cocky youth who is also in the interview room, but she is still younger than Dan himself. It's a cliché, but the police are getting younger. He is turning 40 this year. It sounds old. He doesn't want to turn 40 in a prison. He doesn't want to lose years and years of his life. He is too vital for that to happen. He has too much to do, to see, to be. The police officers are staring at him through a computer screen. Dan is glad he's on his home turf, back in Holland, where his influential family are known and know everyone. He wouldn't want to be in that depressing interview room where criminals have sat and sweated. This is the room your wife was kept in, says Clements. The photos turn his stomach. The room is pocked with debris. Food packages, empty water bottles, papers, plasterboard. It radiates chaos. They show him close-ups of a radiator that has a chain attached to it. She was chained like a maltreated dog. There is a photo of a plasterboard wall that has a hole in it. We're assuming she kicked through this wall here, probably while she was still attached to the radiator. She couldn't crawl through the hole, but she created debris, and then she threw the debris out of the open window in the other room, so that it would land on the street below. Some of it did, some of it didn't. They show him photos of the second room, the open window, the debris that had missed its target. Working theory, she was trying to attract attention, says Constable Tanner, laconically. I guess she must have been pretty desperate. This sort of thing comes long after banging on the door and asking for help, I'd say he adds with a sniff. His tone and the sniff irritate Dan. It seems disrespectful, casual. People ought to carry handkerchiefs. Where were you residing between Monday 16th of March and Tuesday 24th of March this year? Asks the DC. You know where I was. You visited me there in my apartment. Can you state the address? St. Marina Riverview Apartments. He rattles off the full address and postcode. He can't resist adding, The penthouse. These photos were taken in apartment 1403, St. Marina Riverview, says the police officer. Dan gasps. She was held captive in my apartment building. Yes, 14th floor. Just a few below you. Six. Sorry? Six floors below me. You said a few. I stand corrected. Dan blinks. He can't understand what they are saying. This is bad. Very bad. The thought of her so close for all that time and yet completely out of his grasp. He picks up a glass of water takes a gulp. And during those dates we mentioned, 
Did you go about your usual business? I was looking for my wife. Of course. And what did that entail? Did you put up posters to alert the public to her disappearance? No. Did you walk the streets looking for her? No. Did you visit her friends, ask if they had seen her? I didn't visit her friends, no. The DC obviously knows the power of silence. She lets his last negative echo. It's a technique Dan himself sometimes uses in business meetings. He's made a lot of money by judiciously saying nothing, doing nothing. Today, he counters assertively. I called you. I called the police. You were looking for her. Did you leave your apartment building at any point from Friday the 20th to Sunday the 22nd of March? Dan thinks. Where is this going? What trap is he walking into? He answers honestly, because of course they already know the answer. Yes, I went to the local deli that is just next door, a few times. To buy food and drink. Alcohol? He sighs. Yes, alcohol. I'm over 18. It's not a crime. His lawyer coughs quietly. A subtle sign to remind Dan to be careful what he says. No one likes a smart ass. And when you were popping in and out the deli for your organic vegetables and single malt, did you notice the debris in the street? Asks Tanner. No one coughs to indicate that he should lay off the sarcasm. Dan shakes his head. It's an automatic response. Did he see the debris? He'll think about it more later. Not even as you left for the airport? Dan shakes his head again. Because we noticed it straight away, didn't we, DC Clements? Awful mess. Practically tripped over it, I did. And we arrived at St. Marina Riverview Apartments just a short time after you left there. The constable frowns to indicate that he's mystified as to how that could be. Dan remains silent. The DC picks up the baton. And when you were up and down the stairs, in and out of the elevator and the building, you never saw or heard anything unusual? No. And you will have been especially vigilant, I expect. What do you mean by that? The DC pulls her face into an expression of surprised innocence. Well, only that as your wife had vanished, you'd have been keeping your eyes wide open. You'd be alert. They show him another photo of a filthy bucket of shit. He blanches. It's not pretty, is it, Dan? No, it's not pretty, he repeats. His lawyer clears his throat again. Taken out of context, that comment might sound dismissive, sarcastic, cruel. He's been warned to avoid elaboration, explanations, and theorizing. The thought of Kai being demeaned so, his beautiful, elegant woman makes his heart beat faster. His heart that is aching, imagining her chained to a radiator. She was a bitch for marrying him when she was married to another man, while mothering another man's children, certainly that. But he doesn't want to think of her this way. Thank you for giving us permission to search your flat, Dan. As if he could have refused. His lawyers had told him they'd easily secure a warrant. It looked better if he appeared helpful. The lawyers might be regretting that decision. On their previous video call, the police revealed that they'd found both of Kai's phones hidden at his apartment, the ones she used to facilitate her double life. They also focused on a receipt from home base for zip ties and a plastic bucket. Dan told them he had no idea where the receipt had come from. He realises now that they are revealing evidence to him in a particular order. 
They are trying to trap him, frame him. He did not buy a bucket. He was rushing to the airport. He possibly stepped over the debris as he jumped into his taxi. He was in a hurry. There was some banging. I recall it now. He lights up, pleased to show that he isn't careless, negligent. One night, the Saturday night. I thought it was something to do with water pipes. Or at least that's what she... He stops abruptly. She... Oh, fuck. He has to tell them. It will come out. Someone might have seen her arrive or leave. I had a friend stay over on Saturday night. I slept through the noise, but she said there was clanking. That I should get the concierge to call a plumber. She thought maybe it was trapped air in the pipes. I didn't think anything of it at the time. I had bigger things on my mind. Your missing wife. Of course. And who was this friend? Dan turns to his lead lawyer. Do I have to say? Is there a reason you'd rather not? Asks Clements, overriding his lawyer's assurances that he's not obliged to say anything at all. Her name is Fiona Philipson. And how friendly are you exactly? Asks Tanner with a smirk. Not very, Dan asserts. Clements puts up a picture of Fiona on the screen. It's a good one. Her profile pic that she used on the dating app, which was how she first reached out to him. She must have used filters. In real life, she looks her age, and her eyes are smaller. Is this Fiona Philipson? Yes. Well, we've talked to Fiona, and she says you two are more than friends. He doesn't know why they are talking to Fiona Philipson, nor how they might have found her. Is there CCTV in the corridors and hallways of his building? He thought that was limited to the gym and the pool. Perhaps she came forward in response to an appeal for witnesses after Kai went missing. He knows it's not good news that they've spoken to her. Fiona Philipson is a woman he's had sex with a few times, a casual hookup, a way to pass the time when Kai was away. And you know what? He's glad he did so, considering how things had turned out. When he thought Kai was in the north of England tending to her sick mother, she was in fact living around the corner with another husband. Unfucking believable He still can't accept it. All he did in terms of infidelity was bend a few women over his kitchen table from time to time and bang them hard from behind. He never promised them anything. Most of them understood what they were getting. A glamorous night, a fun anecdote, a satisfying orgasm. This Fiona woman was a mistake. The timing of their latest hookup makes him look bad. He last had her a few days after Kai went missing. He wasn't thinking straight. He was confused, a total mess. He'd just heard that his wife was a bigamist, for God's sake. But Fiona didn't mean anything to him. But he let her stay over. Again, a mistake. She woke up clingy. She asked him if he was married. He got the feeling she left in a bit of a huff. Hurt. But Christ, is that his problem? He's got far bigger ones. Have you ever visited Fiona Philipson's home in London? What? No. Dan has no idea where the woman lives. It might be Highgate, it might be Brixton, north, south, east, west. How would he know? He never asked. He has no interest. Why would he visit her house? What about her holiday home in Dorset? No, no. He shakes his head. He briefly wonders if this woman has gone missing too. Is there some sort of serial killer on the loose? Did she disappear after she left his? No, that's not right. They said they were talking to her. He's not thinking clearly. He's panicking. Unless she's vanished since. God, might she have? It's insane. 
but is that thought any more or less insane than his bigamist wife vanishing? He feels heat pulse across his body. I hardly knew the woman. You hardly knew her? Know her? I hardly know her. Fuck, what's the proper grammar? He's normally careful on this sort of stuff. He's tripping up. His words are sounding shaky, imprecise. He doesn't want to think about serial killers. He doesn't want to think about Kai crapping in a bucket. He takes a deep breath. It wasn't that sort of relationship. It wasn't any sort of relationship. Is that right? Says the DC. She looks triumphant, which worries Dan. I don't want to say anything else. He looks to his lawyers, but before they can respond, he hits the button that says, leave meeting, and the screen turns black. Chapter 3 D.C. Clements The lockdown measures, which were just a whisper, a recommendation when Kylie Gillingham disappeared, have bloomed and bypassed the stage of being a threat and are now a fact. Immovable law. Shops, restaurants, cafes and libraries are closed. People are locking themselves behind doors, behaving like convicts serving time, grateful for a permissible hour of exercise. They've been instructed to work from home, if they can, something that for decades harassed mothers have begged for, something they've argued they need to ease the burden of childcare. The concept of working from home has always been dismissed, seen as a scam for skivers. Now there is no alternative. Bosses everywhere are crossing their fingers, hoping their employees will play fair. Although nothing can ease the burden of childcare at the moment, as schools are closed and teachers are beaming lessons through laptops and smartphones, parents are going mental. Clements doesn't have any of that to worry about. Childcare. She can't imagine what it must be like. Trying to do your job, trying to get your kids to pick up a pen and tackle some maths. Unlike some of her colleagues, she is not interested in working from home, alone. Maybe she would be safer from the virus, locked in her tiny flat, stuck at the little table under the window, but she couldn't stand it. She's always done her best thinking in the field. She could call Fiona Phillipson, but she decides she needs to see her face. It's a matter of catching her unawares. People reveal more than they want to in their faces, and the DC has a feeling there is a lot more to be revealed yet. She and Tanner visit Fiona's house together, a well-kept terrace in Clapham. Victorian black and white tiles, a dark blue gloss door, succulents in oversized stone pots in the tiny front garden. Smart, standard for a certain sort. This will be worth a fortune, mutters Tanner, a slight hint of resentment in his voice. People in their twenties and thirties unilaterally resent those in their forties and fifties, because a generation ago, it was possible to clamber onto the property ladder, even in London. Tanner rents in Woking. It's a long commute, boring and expensive, but as close to his workplace as he can afford. Clements has arranged for him to have a car at his disposal as they investigate this case. That way, he can get backwards and forwards without being held hostage to the reduced train timetable. Very nice, he adds, nodding towards the house, but there's no hint that he's paying a compliment. He rings the doorbell for a second time. They listen to it echo around the silent building. Clements peers in through the window. No sign of her. Taking a walk, suggests Tanner. I have a hunch. Let's call in on Mark Fletcher. She only has to ring the bell once at the Fletchers. As she expected, Fiona Phillipson opens the door. She's flustered. 
Her first words are, Mark suggested I move in with him and the boys during lockdown. Probably only going to be a couple of weeks, right? After all, I've known him and the boys for ages. I was there the day Kylie met them. Clements nods. Nothing illegal about that, Fiona, relax. The woman is clearly nervous, maybe even apologetic. People are just getting their heads around the new laws and rules. They don't want to put a foot out of line. Most of them. Do you want to come in? Fiona opens the door a little wider. No, sorry, best if we stay outside. Social distancing and all that. Behind Fiona, Clements can see the younger Fletcher boy, Seb, lingering in the corridor. Her stomach contracts slightly in sympathy. He looks exhausted, blue bags hanging under his eyes. His limbs seem angular, awkward. He's holding himself in such a way as to suggest he is bracing for more sorrow. Clements has been up close and personal with tragedy before. She knows it's very possible that he will never regain the carelessness and ease that is associated with being young. He's only twelve years old, but his childhood has been brought to an abrupt halt by the actions of his stepmother and someone else. An unknown other. Adults are bastards to kids. They should take better care. He has been wrenched into a tawdry, brutal, grown-up world. And he's frightened. He should be. Clever boy. Have you found my mum? He asks. Fiona looks startled. Have you? No. Thinking of Seb, stretched, taut, desperate for news, Clements adds, not yet. But we're following a lead. Fiona, you can help with that. Of course, anything. You mentioned a holiday home in Dorset. We'd like to take a look around there if it's okay with you. Do you think she might be hiding there? Asks Seb, light flooding into his eyes. Ollie, his elder brother by three years, emerges into the hallway. From previous visits, when Lee Fletcher, a.k.a. Kai Janssen, a.k.a. Kylie Gillingham, was first reported missing, Clements knows that's the doorway to the living room. She guesses Ollie has been listening to the exchange with just as much keenness as his younger brother, but less willingness to show his interest. He pushes Seb in the chest. Don't be an idiot. The words, the shove, appear violent, angry, and they are. How violent, how angry. Or, Clements wonders, are the words standard bro-speak? Is the shove innocent? An immature, unprocessed excuse to make physical contact from someone who won't show his vulnerability and simply hug it out. She isn't sure. She'd like to rule him out of her inquiry. No one wants a 15-year-old to be responsible for this mess, but she might be being too compassionate because of his age. She has to be alert to that, careful of it. Kids can be monsters too. Does he know more than anyone? Does he know it's idiotic to hope? His next comment does nothing to help her decide. She's probably dead, bro. Get used to it he mutters as he pushes his way past his brother and heads up the stairs, feet slamming down heavily, each step a protest. Fiona grimaces apologetically. They're dealing with a lot. That's why I moved in for a while, to help out. Keep things calm. Or should I get you the keys to my Dorset place? I can give you directions. Clements and Tanner drive through the deserted streets, feeling privileged to be getting out of the city. Tumbleweed, Tanner mutters, shaking his head. He's disconcerted, a bit moody, because he hasn't been able to pop into his usual coffee shop, and while there is the occasional place selling takeaways, the queues are too long to waste time in. He's suffering from caffeine withdrawal, constantly jiggling his knee. Clements wishes he wouldn't. It's distracting.
She needs to think, piece it all together. Somehow the empty roads and pavements are more insidious now than when they teemed with disorder. Clements isn't used to civil obedience on this sort of scale. She can't quite trust it. Take Fiona, for example, so compliant and cooperative, readily giving them permission to search her house without a warrant, handing over her key at speed. Normally, members of the public, no matter how innocent, are uppity about this sort of thing. They say stuff like, I know my rights, and start quoting from TV scripts, suggesting they don't know their rights, or much at all, actually. She just happened to have the keys to her country home to hand. Is that odd? Or is she, like most Londoners who can afford to, simply keeping her options open? Planning on bolting to her second home to see out lockdown, despite entreaties to stay put. Did you see her face? Clements asks Tanner. Fiona's? Yeah. When the kid asked if we had any news? Right. It should have been her first question, shouldn't it? She takes her eyes off the road for a nanosecond and turns to Tanner. As it was Seb's, but instead she was justifying why she's moved in with them. She's fast getting her feet under the table at her dead friend's house, isn't she? Her missing friend, Clements corrects, but without much enthusiasm or certainty. People in the States have started to call it forming bubbles. For Christ's sake, I hope that doesn't catch on in the UK. Bubbles. Tanner shakes his head in derision. As if the middle classes need to be taken any further from reality. They've always lived in bubbles with their sourdough bread bake-offs, their quinoa and kale juicing and what have you. His disgust is palpable. It's not just the middle classes that are forming bubbles, Clements points out. And I'd say Mark Fletcher and his boys have had quite the dose of reality these past couple of weeks. What with Kylie going missing, then discovering she's been living a double life. So you reckon it's a good thing the best friend is keeping an eye on them? Maybe, Clements murmurs. Just saying, it's very cosy, Tanner says cocking his eyebrow, as he does to suggest suspicion. Clements wishes he wouldn't. He looks like a little boy pretending to be a detective. It makes it hard to take him seriously, surely the opposite effect to the one he's hoping for. However, the point he makes is valid. It is, she admits. She's everywhere, though, isn't she? Living with husband number one, casually shagging husband number two. The same thought has entered the DC's head, but she's trying to stay open-minded. Look at the facts. Gather the evidence. Resist jumping to conclusions. The feminist in her wants to believe in the friendship between Kylie and Fiona. Twenty-three years they stretch back. She wasn't aware that Dan was married to Kylie when she was shagging him. Or at least, she says she wasn't. Feminist or not, Clements is careful about how much trust she lends anyone. True to say Fiona has had her fair share of shocks recently too. Shocks can make people vulnerable. It's possible she just wants to be around other people who love and miss Kylie. That she simply wants to be helpful and provide comfort but shocks also make people angry, unpredictable, dangerous. Clements recaps the facts. She hooked up with Dan Janssen through a dating app, one that identified potential matches in close vicinity. She bumped into him in his apartment block, right? Chips in Tanner, pleasing his boss by keeping up. Correct. Remind me. Why was she there in the first place? She says she was there for work. She's an interior designer and was pitching to redesign Mr. and Mrs. Federova's apartment. Which just happens to be the apartment Kylie Gillingham was held captive in. 
Yes. The two officers share a look. Coincidences do happen, more often than people think. Some people believe in fate and destiny. Clements thinks both things can be explained away through coincidence. Even good and bad luck can be attributed to something akin. But she doubts a cluster of coincidences is a coincidence. A cluster of them is usually a crime. So she continues to count them up. Fiona's timeline, as she has presented it to us in her statement, is as follows. One, she finds out her boyfriend, Dan Janssen, is married. Two, she finishes the relationship. Three, her best friend goes missing. Four, she finds out her best friend is a bigamist. Five, she discovers her best friend's second husband is the very man she's been shagging. She shakes her head slowly. Maybe letting the information settle. Maybe doubting it. Of course, it may not have happened in that order, she adds darkly. You mean? One, she finds out her meaningless shag, Dan Janssen, is married to her best friend. Two, her best friend vanishes. She did admit to shagging him at least once after she knew he was married to her bestie. Said she was emotional and drunk. That she made a mistake. The accusation lingers in the air. Jealousy, fury, revenge, all create a toxicity that leads to desperate acts. Crimes of passion have been a thing since time began. She had access to that apartment, Tanner says excitedly. Probably. She certainly knew it was standing empty, but there's nothing at all to place her there, and Dan Janssen might have known it was empty too. Clement sighs. Let's see what we find in Dorset. Tanner sniffs and gazes out of the window, attention once again drawn towards the relentless emptiness. Then, to fill the silence and the void, he flicks on the radio. They are still talking about the exhausted nurse who cried in a supermarket car park and begged people not to panic by because after her double shift in the critical care ward, she'd gone shopping and found the shelves empty. They are also reporting that someone has suggested that people stand outside their houses and clap to show their support and gratitude for our NHS heroes. Clements wonders how it can be that people are clapping for the carers and simultaneously starving them. The world is bloody mad. A journalist describes how walkers heading to beauty spots in the Peak District are being watched by a fleet of drones and reminded that rambling 60 miles from home does not constitute an essential journey. Clements wonders what this all means for Kylie. Is it easier or harder to hide in a lockdown? Is it easier or harder to hide a body in a lockdown. Chapter 4 Mark Mark can hear the police speaking to Fiona downstairs. He should possibly go and see what they are talking about. But what is the point? If they've found her, he'll know soon enough. He hears Ollie stomp up the stairs his bedroom door slam closed behind him. The air in the house seems to quiver. There is no news. If there was, Ollie would come and tell him. He rolls over and stares at the wall. He tells himself he's not in bed mid-morning, just lying on it. Which isn't the same. Getting into bed would suggest a level of defeatism. Depression, maybe. He's not in bed. Mark cannot imagine a harsher agony. This is not a light claim to make. After all, he is a man who has been widowed, left with two small sons to bring up alone. He lost his first wife after six years of marriage, Francis fell down the stairs in their home and broke her neck. He rarely admits that to anyone. 
for a number of reasons. And now he is a man whose second wife is missing. Gone. Vanished into thin air. Something she's done not once, but twice. The first time when she left their home, leaving him and the boys behind. Aching. Angry. The second time she vanished was from the room she was being held captive in. It's impossible not to be sardonic about this fact. It's impossible not to think, well, Lee likes doing things twice. Marrying, for instance. His wife is a bigamist. Mark still shakes his head in disbelief when this fact punches its way into his mind. Who the hell does that? Who the hell marries two men and runs two lives concurrently? It's a rhetorical question, though, because now he knows. Lee does. Or did. It's unclear which tense he should use. So no, he can't imagine a harsher agony than the one he is facing now. He's furious to have discovered he's been betrayed so comprehensively, so unashamedly. And he's terrified, heartbroken. When he discovered her bigamy, he wished all manner of vile things on her. They were just thoughts. Really, they were. He doesn't want her dead, cut up into tiny pieces and fed to someone's dog. Of course not. It's just something people say to themselves. He would cross the road to piss on her if she was on fire. Obviously. The police have confirmed that there is evidence that Lee, Kylie, as they call her, was in one of the apartments in Dan Janssen's swanky apartment block. They have not said what the evidence is. DC Clements did let slip that she thought she had been in that room just hours before the police broke down the door. He wonders what makes her think this. What was the wisp of smoke coming from the burning cigarette that suggested recent occupancy? A chance just missed. A case nearly solved. Nearly resolved. But instead left raw and jagged. An open wound. He can't work out if they think his wife escaped from that room or was taken from it. Further, if she was taken, is she already dead? They won't tell him what they are thinking. They are staying very tight-lipped. Until there's an arrest, he's still a suspect, he supposes. Dan must be the prime suspect, since she was held captive on his property. But Mark has watched enough TV shows to know that he too must remain under suspicion for a little longer. It's always the husband. Trickier when there are two. He has his own thoughts on whether Lee is dead or alive. And those thoughts fluctuate all the time, depending on his mood, the weather, the news, the boys' moods. He's normally a man who is fixed and solid. But this situation has left him amorphous, liquid. He keeps clicking his finger and thumb together, just to hear the sound, just to check he is real and has agency. He feels nebulous, imprecise. Lee has not only vanished herself, she's made him vanish too, to an extent. He doesn't know who he is anymore. He doesn't know what he wants. It was a mistake telling people that his first wife had died of cancer. Doing so made Francis's already tragic and painful death into something else. He made it into a difficult, messy secret. One that is proving to have repercussions all these years later. One that might hurt him and his boys. He realises that lying about something so big makes him appear untrustworthy. Is he untrustworthy, or is he simply doing his best? He's not sure himself anymore. Francis did have cancer, that much is true. 
People were expecting her to die of it, and that was already enough of a thing at the nursery gate. People were in the habit of talking about him behind their hands, tipping their heads to one side when they caught his eye, a cartoon approximation of sympathy, but really, he believed, ghoulish fascination. They pitied him, the landscape gardener, father of two, who had to soldier on as his wife got sick, got a diagnosis, got sicker, was operated on, got sicker still, underwent chemotherapy, got sick again. A woman in her early thirties dying of cancer is a tragedy. They stared at him with a look that clearly declared, there but for the grace of God. Some dodged and avoided him, as though he was infectious. Two or three women propositioned him. He was never sure if it was out of sympathy or perversion. Screwing the dying woman's husband was possibly a turn-on for some really messed up types. It's a big, odd world. So he didn't need the drama when, weak with the disease and the attempts to treat it, Frances fell down the stairs and broke her neck. She was simply trying to cross the landing of their small home, a few steps from bedroom to bathroom. She just tripped and then fell down the stairs. But a fall might have turned the tragedy into a farce. Or worse, a mystery. A murder mystery. Because people have fertile imaginations and fast, gossipy tongues. He heard it happen. The clatter, the recurring thump, 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 then a more violent smash. The exact sound stays with him, haunts him in the dead of night or when he's at work, or playing football in the garden with the boys, watching TV, making dinner. It's there, an insidious earworm in his head. He just can't get it out, even all these years later. He was in the kitchen making a cup of tea when it happened, dunking the tea bag in the boiling water. Dunk, 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 stir. He knew instantly, at some deep level, that it was her conclusion, her end. Thump, 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 smash. Her body bouncing from one stair to another, four bangs and she fell head over heels. Such a funny, antiquated expression, usually associated with love. Of course, she was not falling in love, but instead, to her death. He ran to her immediately. Immediately wasn't fast enough. Because they were alone, the police asked lots of questions at the time. Naturally, it was their job to do so. And there was an autopsy, an inquest. In the end, it was labelled accidental death. Still, Mark felt responsible. Francis's sister, Paula, tried to comfort him. It's not your fault, Mark. You were doing your best. You were making her a cup of tea. You were trying to look after her. Except he was making the tea for himself. He had offered Francis one, of course, but she'd said no. He decided to go to the kitchen and make tea anyway, because he needed space. He wasn't even thirsty. Not really. He just needed a couple of moments away from the smell of his sick wife. Away from her grey skin and the slightly fusty bedsheets which needed changing. Away from the responsibility of it. Why did he choose to do that? He should have stayed in the room, been with her around the clock. Then, when she felt the need to go to the toilet, she could have asked for his help. He would have been happy to help her. He had done so on dozens of occasions, hundreds. Had she sensed his need to get away from her, even momentarily? Was that why she had struck out independently, if waddling to the bathroom on unsteady legs can be thought of in such vigorous terms? So after it happened, he decided that when talking to acquaintances or to strangers, 
he wouldn't admit that she'd died because of a fall, rather than cancer. He blamed himself, and that was bad enough. He couldn't stand the idea of the judgment of others. He just couldn't carry it. There's only so much one man can take on. He's never even told the boys the truth about how she died. At the time, they were too young for it to matter. The difficult bit was explaining that she'd gone away and wasn't ever coming back. But don't they have buses from heaven? Ollie had asked. If they had buses, she could visit us, or a train. Explaining the lack of public transport in the afterlife to a four-year-old was complicated enough. They already knew she was poorly, that she had an illness. They didn't need to become scared of stairs, for God's sake. What did it matter? What difference did it make? It was a long time ago, and it was his decision, his and no one else's. Because there had been no one else at the time. When Francis died, Mark remembers a vast, gnawing emptiness, a broad and deep gap. He didn't sit in his depression. His father would have called that wallowing, even if his mother would have called it processing. Either way, he didn't indulge in it. He couldn't. Not just because he had the boys to deal with, it wasn't just that. He was scared of it. He was scared of how dark it got. How everything trembled on a point where it might so easily become nothing. And it scares him again now. Now that Lee is gone too. It was a lot being left with two young sons. The weight of them. Obviously, back then, aged four and eighteen months, they didn't really weigh much, not physically, but by God, the weight of them. Ask any single parent. How much does that child weigh? That kid you owe everything to. That kid you are everything to. And they'll tell you. Your shoulders will never be broad enough. Pick me up, Daddy! Carry me! Carry me! No, carry me! I want to piggyback! You bear the weight of the world on your shoulders. They are your world, which is frightening enough. You are theirs, which is outright terrifying. Mark is worried that all this attention about his second wife's disappearance will inevitably mean that the cause of death of his first wife will be brought into the spotlight once again. There will be more questions coming, if not from the police, then certainly from the press, from friends, from his sons. He ought to explain about their mother's death before they read about it in the Evening Standard. How will they react? Will they be angry that he lied to them? Not only all those years ago, but consistently ever since. Or will they simply accept it as another weirdness in their already complicated and convoluted lives? Mark sighs with the thought of it. The weight of it. It seems too late to tell them the truth now, all these years later. The tragedy of how their birth mother died is dwarfed in comparison to the tragedy of their vanished, most likely murdered, bigamist stepmother. A current nightmare. It's a mess. What was it that Fiona said? She mentioned a famous Oscar Wilde quote that might prove awkwardly relevant. Mark isn't into poetry or plays and stuff. He doesn't really know anything about Oscar Wilde, except that he was gay and Irish. Fiona, however, was able to quote off the top of her head. To lose one parent may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Two dead wives. What did that look like? Trouble. Chapter 5 D.C. Clements 
Fiona gave precise and detailed directions to her holiday home, which turns out to be helpful because the sat-nav struggles to commit to a route once they are off the beaten track, and they are both city coppers, not used to venturing this far out. This is it, remarks Tanner, already unclipping his seatbelt, practically hanging out the door he's in such a hurry. Clements is surprised as a 90s bungalow looms into sight. She was expecting something with more charm. Still, she feels her heart quicken a little. She wonders, might they open the door and find Kylie sitting there in front of a roaring log fire, perhaps holding a mug of coffee? Shame-faced, no, guilt-ridden, but alive. Alive is all that matters. Fiona mentioned that she hadn't visited here since last autumn. She commented, Wish I'd made more use of the place, to be honest. Hate to think of it standing empty. Kylie would have known the place was empty, wouldn't she? There was a possibility that she could have bolted here. Clements mentally shakes herself, notes that there is no smoke coming from the chimney. Why would there be? It's a warm spring day. There probably isn't a fireplace anyhow. More likely modern central heating, considering the relative newness of the place. She is vaguely aware that she's being fanciful, and she's embarrassed by that. It's out of character, and not a tendency she should ever encourage. She gets out of the car. There is a breeze in the air. Fat, pearlescent clouds race across the pale blue sky as she dashes up the path. Her jacket flies open and flutters around her in an energetic way. She feels a sense of expectancy. Chance. There is no body. Not alive or dead. Tanner charges from one room to the next and quickly establishes as much. The beds are made, cushions plumped, towels hung neatly over the side of the bath. No one here, he looks disappointed and mutters resentfully. Wasted journey. No, look, someone has been here recently, Clements asserts. She points to a wine glass on the kitchen table. We need to find out who. The glass has some red wine still in it. Just a few drops. But if it had been there since October, the wine would have evaporated to nothing other than a residue. Tanner carefully places the glass in an evidence bag. They will check for prints and DNA. The tips of his ears are pink. He admires his boss, but her careful approach draws attention to his more impulsive style. No one ever likes being made aware that they are trying to run before they can walk. He was so busy looking for a body, he nearly missed this. Evidence. Whose prints do you think we'll find on it? He asks. Well, it's Fiona's property, so finding her prints wouldn't be a surprise. But why would she leave a dirty glass on the table when she locked up the house for winter? Everything else is immaculate. Clements glances about. A folded washing up cloth hangs neatly over the kitchen sink mixer tap. Pale sunlight, the colour of perfume, falls through the window. Almost suspiciously so, adds Tanner. The kitchen tiles do not have a film of dust on them, as might be expected. They gleam as though they have been recently cleaned, as does the bathroom. Clements touches the cloth. It's not cardboard stiff. It still has the suggestion of malleability. It's been used since October. The glass may have Kylie's prints on it, or Dan's. Or it may be wrapped in the fingerprints of a tipsy cleaner who helps herself to a tipple as she works. The prints will reveal something. The science doesn't lie. A thorough search of the bungalow, shed and garage confirms that it's probable that a man has stayed over, made himself at home. They find a single, solid silver cufflink and male underwear. 
there are two toothbrushes in the bathroom, an electric one and a new-looking blue plastic one. Tanner bags everything up, commenting, Didn't you say Fiona told you Janssen had visited just once? If these things belong to him, he certainly made himself at home on that one trip. Of course, they might belong to someone else, another lover or a brother, although Fiona hasn't ever mentioned anyone else in particular. Well, I think we'll be able to establish if these things belong to Janssen or not. Prince, DNA on the toothbrush. Yes, and if they are his, things look very bad for him, since he's denied ever coming here. Tanner and Clements grin at one another. Bloodhounds scenting something in the air. Getting closer to the stench. The kill. They take another look around the neat little house in case they missed anything. It strikes Clements that despite the expensive soft furnishings and artfully arranged furniture, the place has an air of sadness lingering about. It's tasteful, no denying it, but it looks a bit like a show home. The walls are painted warm peach and bright tangerine in places, but it still appears sterile. It could do with a bit of mess and stuff scattered about. Maybe some starfish coasters or mugs with anchors on them would make it more homely. It's a house that suggests a life half-lived. A place where someone waits. Clements recognises the atmosphere, and doing so embarrasses and irritates her. The house feels disappointed disappointing. She wonders if she's imagining this, if she's manifesting the vibe because she's gutted Kylie isn't here. Another door closed, another day finished, each one reducing the chances of locating Kylie alive. And that's everything, isn't it? When it comes to it, it's not about soft furnishings, fancy clothes, or houses. It's not even about the lies she's told, the men she's had. It's life and death. That's all it's about. What's that noise? asks Clements. But she knows. She recognises it. Her pulse quickens. A helicopter, low-flying confirms Tanner. They are both out of the door in a flash. Instinct pulls them towards the coast, the same direction as the search and rescue helicopter is flying. Someone must have called something in, yells Clements above the roar of the blades. As they run, Tanner calls the station. What have they found? What other copter? He demands. Clements doesn't try to telephone anyone. She knows the information will be piecemeal, not through any deliberate obstruction or incompetence, but because the latest is unfolding in front of them. A body, maybe. Alive or dead, she doesn't know. She's not as fit as she should be, her breath shallow and high in her chest. Or maybe she's struggling due to adrenaline, fear, hope, something primal rather than her lack of fitness. Her strides are long and firm, her feet slam into the ground, fast and desperate. Not a jog, a sprint. She can't get there fast enough. She literally can't. She strains to calculate where the helicopter is going to land. In her peripheral vision, she notices two or three other people heading in the same direction. A spike of irritation jabs her. Permitted exercise doesn't include rubbernecking, but she doesn't allow this to distract her. She speeds on only occasionally glancing to the rough ground to avoid loose stones and dog crap. She almost doesn't stop to examine the bottle. Her mind processes it and dismisses it as litter. Left behind, no doubt, by someone drinking on the cliff edge, enjoying the view with a friend or lover. This sort of tryst is not legal, strictly speaking, but it's inevitable. She doesn't know what causes her to stop, Instinct, or less romantically, but more practically, a thorough training and a lifetime of experience that has taught her to leave no stone unturned. Bugger. She doesn't want to lose a minute, 
She wants to run the next 200 yards to where the helicopter is now landing. She wants to get there before Tanner. This isn't competitiveness. This is concern. She wants to find Kylie. If she's dead and decomposing at the bottom of a cliff, Clements wants to be the one who reaches her, the one to shield her dignity posthumously. If by some miracle she's lying injured at the bottom of the cliff, she wants to be the first to comfort and reassure her. She's only been on this case a couple of weeks, but Kylie has got under her skin. She finds herself admiring the rebellious woman who wouldn't accept the world's limitations, who risked disrepute and shrugged at notoriety. The police see a lot, deal with too much, no more than most. She shouldn't let it get to her. She shouldn't get so personally involved. It does not matter if Tanner reaches the site first. She's not here to play the bloody heroine, protector or savior. She's here to gather evidence. Firm, straightforward, non-fanciful work. So she stops. She digs out a plastic evidence bag and carefully picks up the wine bottle. The science doesn't lie. Then she starts to sprint once again in the direction of the helicopter and whatever else there is to find. June 2020 Chapter 6 Stacy. I wake to the sound of the sea, the noise of it, the power and thrust is always surprising to me. Odd, since I've grown up living on the shore. I should be used to it by now. It must have lulled me to sleep thousands of times. It surely has been my alarm clock, the background accompaniment as I did my homework, when I played in the garden with my friends, when I sneaked in the back door, coming home late from parties and did not want to wake my dad, and then had to sit through an excruciating 15 minutes while he drilled my boyfriends on their intentions and prospects. Better to let them slip away undetected, their footsteps cloaked by the noise of the sea. I ought to be used to it, but I'm not. Since my surgery, I found it to be louder than I expected. I believe it's generally imagined that living by the sea must be calming, therapeutic. People think of a gentle lapping that soothes and lulls. Those who live near it know that's not how it is. Even on a bright day, the waves crashing against the shore can sound aggravating, angry. Shale and shells spin and tumble in the water, caught up in the turbulence, then spat out on the beach. My dad says that the trick is accepting the relentless ebb and flow, the swoosh and smash of chucked debris, and think of it as a comforting constant. Any sort of constant helps, right? He commented just last week while we were having lunch. Hey, Dad, I'm 37 and I'm living back in my parental home. Clearly, I'm a fan of consistency. I replied, with not quite an eye roll, but certainly a hint of exasperation. Dad laughed, choosing to see the humor rather than the sarcasm. He's a good-hearted man, always looking on the bright side. A happy man. He wakes up every morning thinking the day is going to be a good one, and then he sets about ensuring as much. I envy him that. I wake up every morning and drum down on the existential questions. Who am I? What's it all about? I guess I must take after my mother. Living back in the parental home at my age was never my plan. I'm single. I don't have a job, a partner, offspring or a home of my own. Even friends seem thin on the ground. It's really depressing if you think about it, and since we've been locked down for three months, I have done little else other than think about these things. You have your health, though, Stacy. Thank God for that. That's what counts. 
Dad often says. He's right. Well, almost. I am heading towards a full recovery. And that is the priority, obviously. But as someone who is recovering from a brain tumour, and the operations necessary following that, I don't feel I can comfortably claim to have my health. I am still currently incapacitated to a huge degree. Besides the cluster of tablets that I have to take every day, there are side effects that may or may not be permanent. They are certainly expected to linger in the mid to long term, that's what the doctors said. What does this even mean? Three months? Six? A year? There is a lot that I'm still processing. Still dealing with. Worse still, I can't even always remember what the doctor said, and Dad is constantly having to remind me. It's frustrating. I know, I know, I'm alive. Better than the alternative, so I don't bother to argue with Dad. It seems so mean to pick at his positive assertions when they are the bedrock of his existence, and he is the bedrock of mine. I do realise that it is a hopeless, pointless, fruitless thing to do, to resent the sea for the noise it makes. I should accept the crashing waves because I can't do a thing about them. King Canute made that point, didn't he? I shouldn't get worked up by it. I shouldn't push against it. But I find I do. I am what I am, right? We're always being told to be ourselves. I've seen it written on notebooks and mugs. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. The assumption is that we are all pretty great. Am I, though? I don't really know. Here's the thing. The side effects I'm dealing with are not just a matter of headaches and lethargy, occasional panic attacks and a general sense of anxiety. The big one is that I don't have any pre-operation personal memories. Not one. I'm horrified that this is my reality and yet still awed at the drama of it all. I don't remember my father, my mother, myself, my cancer and the subsequent treatment to save my life. Precarious, experimental, but essentially the only option. Eradicated us. It's not easy. By which I mean it's bloody hard. Sorry to be sweary about it, but my God, how much is one person supposed to take? I open my bedroom window. The stuffy air, trapped all night in the room, is pushed aside by a fresh breeze. The heat of the sun licks my face and forearms. It's only 9.30 in the morning, but it seems like it's set to be another scorcher. For all the problems this year has presented, it's some compensation that it's been unusually hot. Temperatures have soared to record-breaking levels, which I'm loving. I hope the sunny days stretch throughout the summer. I scan along the shoreline. The only people I spot are a small family, a mother with two preschool-age boys at her side, T-shirts and shorts, buckets and spades. One child is leaping about, a jumble of skinny, tanned limbs, the other is very young, maybe 18 months, and therefore less sure-footed. That one is tottering, waddling. Other than them, the beach is deserted. I suppose if it hadn't been for lockdown, it would have been swarming with tourists and their noisy kids and barking dogs and their tendency to leave behind litter. Dad has more than once commented with a chuckle, so oh, that's a bullet dodged. Typical of him to find the silver lining in the fact that the entire populace is pinned to their homes like dead butterflies to a board in a Victorian drawing room. I know he's trying to make light, make the best of things, but to me it seems greedy that we have all this to ourselves when others are clamouring for space. 
There are reports on the news showing entire families of four, five, six and more squeezed into small apartments in high-rise tower blocks in London's inner city. Journalists interview people leaning out of their windows three or four flights up. They say they feel trapped, that the kids are driving them up the wall. Watching those reports of families stuck and confined disturbs me leaves me with feelings of discomfort and unease that makes my breathing a shade faster. I lean further forward out of my bedroom window and take deep gulps of the salt-tinged air. There are also reports on the news that incidents of domestic violence are going up. Trapped women. Violent men. An age-old problem. Besides that... The divide between children's education levels is widening. It's all hideously awful. Some kids don't have access to computers and therefore are missing their online lessons that beleaguered teachers across the country beam out with hope and desperation. I feel the injustice of this pinch me in my core, as though I'm personally affected by it, which of course I'm not. I suppose it bothers me because a generation with limited education is such a depressing influencer on our global future. Maybe that's why I'm unable to shake off the thought of the misery of struggling school kids who are no longer being tested by exams, but are now being tested by uncertainty instead. Someone with no past to speak of is perhaps more invested in the future. Dad is right. Watching the news is miserable. Why don't you just switch off your television set and go and do something less boring instead? The phrase and the theme tune of the old TV show that I watched as a kid blasts into my head. Complete and perfect. I wonder how that can be. Why do I remember that trivia so clearly when many more important things elude me. I screw my eyes tight shut and concentrate very hard on recalling something more. I remember sitting in front of the TV, alone, picking at scabs on my skinny knees, no doubt the result of a playground scrape. But try as I might, I can't recall any more detail. I make an effort to think of something more recent. Last Christmas, for example. How did I celebrate? Who did I celebrate with? I wait a moment or two. The waves crash on the shore, agitated and unsettling. The blackness of my mind is a swamp, and I think I might fall into it. I open my eyes. The walls of my bedroom tilt, the floor rises, then sinks. I have to stop trying so hard. Dad is always saying I shouldn't force it. It will all come back to you when you least expect it. I have to trust that he's right about that. So far, all I have is half-formed impressions, senses, feelings that from time to time come to me fractured. They hurtle towards me and then speed right past, taunting me. The weirdest thing is that I remember impersonal facts, general knowledge. I'd still be okay in a pub quiz. I know that there is such a concept as a pub quiz, where little pockets of keenly competitive adults are desperate to show off their ability to recall the date a person first stepped on the moon, 21st of July, 1969. It was Neil Armstrong. I know Henry VIII was a king with gout and six wives. I know that the UK voted to leave the EU by 52 to 48 percent. I know Game of Thrones is a cultural phenomenon, and the final episode caused controversy among George R.R. R. Martin fans. I concentrate on taking deep breaths. A day at a time. Trust. I spot Dad about 50 metres along the beach, ambling back towards the cottage. Ronnie, 
Our bouncy, balmy golden retriever is running alongside him, barking at the waves, dashing towards them as they ebb, retreating at pace as they flow forward. I watch as Dad stops, stoops, and picks something up. It will be a smoothed piece of glass, pearlized, shimmering, blue, green, or brown. We both take walks along the coast every day, separately in the morning, as he's an early riser, and he doesn't hang about for me, and then together in the late afternoon. As a result, Ronnie is a very well-exercised dog. Sometimes Dad returns from his walks with a rounded piece of glass. He will turn it in his palm, hold it out for me to admire in all its smooth iridescence. We have a pile of sea glass in the garden, a huge bed of it, hundreds of weighty pieces that he must have brought home over the years. I visualize him holding them in his big, strong hand, offering them up to me to inspect. A delighted child, an uninterested teen, a polite woman feigning curiosity to generate chatter. I visualize these versions of me and try hard to recall them. But I can't. They are ghosts wandering aimlessly in a void. I don't know who taught me Tudor history, how I voted on Brexit, or who I watched Game of Thrones with. I don't remember the games I played in the garden with school friends, and I really don't know if I ever did sneak home late from parties as a teen. I just want to believe that's something that probably happened, because everyone wants to think they had friends and that they were cool, right? I don't know if being myself is a good thing. I mean, I probably can assume I'm pretty great. The odds are with me because most of us are fair, kind, honest, aren't we? We believe in right and wrong, law and order, actions and consequences. Most likely, I'm a total delight, a sort of mix of Malala Yousafzai and Greta Thunberg. My dad acts as though I gave lessons to Kate Middleton on how to be lovable. It would just be good to know for certain. Chapter 7. Stacy. I notice that Dad is almost back to the cottage, so I quickly dress, pulling on the t-shirt and shorts I wore yesterday. No one ever sees us, so there's no imperative to make an effort. I barely look in the mirror these days. Staring at my bald and scarred head is difficult. I'm exposed. Diminished. My hair is growing back slowly. There are downy, feathery patches coming through. It's something, but it's uneven and imperfect. So I am still self-conscious. In a way, I'm glad not to be seen. I slip on flip-flops and rush down the stairs, making it into the kitchen just as Dad pushes open the back door. Morning, love, he says, cracking a smile puts a green piece of smoothed sea glass on the table, as I predicted. A mermaid tear. That's what some people call them. I remember that. How are you feeling today? He asks. Fine, thanks. No headaches? Right as rain. Well, that's great news. Uh, did you take your tablets? He always leaves them in an egg cup next to the kettle so that I don't forget. I haven't taken them yet this morning, but move to do so now. I can swallow tablets without water. I've had that much practice. He beams, obviously relieved. I'm sorry that I'm such a concern to him at this age, when I should really be off his hands. However, I'm so grateful for his concern and the safety net he provides. What would I do without him preserving my identity? I'd literally disappear if he didn't keep reminding me who I am, what I've done, what I dreamt of. I am shut out of my own life. And until that door opens again, 
I need him to safeguard me. It's not fair on either of us, but it is what it is. A living nightmare. I reach for the kettle and put it on to boil. What is it with you in the sea glass, Dad? What attracts you to it? In part, I'm curious. In part, I'm just making conversation. Months with just the two of us for company, no outside stimulus whatsoever is limiting. Dad bends and pats Ronnie's back to encourage him to calm down. The dog is still circling my father's legs. Energetic, like a puppy, even though he's not. He's leaving a trail of wet and sandy paw prints on the floor. They will dry, and the sand will crunch under our feet until it blows out the door or into the corners of the room. I glance around the kitchen, which is, as usual, in a state of chaos. Neither of us cares. Neither of us values tidiness or has a particular proclivity towards it. Dad must have had fried bacon for breakfast earlier. The smell lingers in the kitchen. Scalded animal fat. Well, my attraction to sea glass, Stacy, is to do with how it comes about. You see, diamonds and other such precious gems, you know, emeralds, rubies and the like, are mined from the earth, spat out raw and sharp. Then mankind smooths and polishes them to perfection. Humankind, I interject. He chuckles, if you like. But sea glass is the opposite way round. Humankind carelessly tosses glass into the sea or leaves it discarded on a beach. And it is nature that does the polishing and refining. It's a fine example of nature's indomitability, I think. He sits down at the kitchen table, stretches his legs out in front of him. Dad is 72, with a thick head of snow-white hair, a ramrod posture, skin that tans easily. He can pass for younger most of the time. It's only after a long walk, when I see his need to rest, stretch, recoup, that I'm reminded that he's no longer in his prime, and really, I ought to be looking after him, not the other way round. He takes a moment, and then carries on answering my question. I think it's amazing, a spiky piece of glass tumbling in the waves, being lifted up, tossed about for all that time, abrasion working at it until it's smooth and frosted, until it's beautiful. He pauses, smiles at me. That's what I like about it, Stacy. Sea glass takes a battering, but is all the more beautiful for it. I eye him slyly. Am I reading too much into what he is saying? Or is he trying to tell me something with all this talk about smoothing out rough edges, surviving, and in fact, being improved upon by being tossed and tumbled by nature's forces? Is he relating it to my circumstances? Or even his own? I appreciate him trying to pass on his wisdom, if indeed that is what he's doing. But it's a bit early to be philosophizing. I need coffee first. I've been out for the papers, he adds, as he pulls them from his canvas bag and lays them on the table. I've had a flick through them already, on the bench up at Willerton Cross. Oh, anything in them? Not really, same old, same old. Hospitalizations on the rise, hope for the high street declining. How can they call it news when they print the same stuff every day? I'm not sure why I buy them. He doesn't always bother. Sometimes he comes home with croissants for a treat instead. I prise open the canister of coffee beans, and as I do so, something swells inside me. A wave of yearning. My legs quiver. A memory nearly knocks me over. I recall specifically yearning for someone. I lift the canister to my nose and inhale deeply hoping the sensation will linger, balloon. Apparently, the olfactory system 
can help restore memories. I have a nebulous feeling that the yearning, the longing, was a perpetual state. This someone I wanted didn't give me a sense of completion or contentment. He's not about that. It is a he. I'm certain of that much. I pause and allow the thought to swell. The teeth of a zip, parting slowly. My dress falling to the floor. I don't care. I don't worry about it creasing. He drops to his knees and edges my underwear down my thighs. The idea makes me inwardly squeal with joy and surprise, but outwardly blush, because I can't imagine that world being mine. Sexy. Glamorous. So at odds with my scarred head and flip-flop shod feet. I've had this thought before. This sense of him doing various things to me. With me. Then, frustratingly, the impression, thought, memory, call it what you will, snaps and vanishes. It feels like an elastic band has been twanged somewhere deep in my gut. I wonder what has just played out on my face. The longing, the lust, the disappointment. Because Dad asks, What is it, Stacy? Nothing. I lie. I'm not about to tell my dad that I have memories about a man kissing and licking me, climbing inside me. I was just thinking, maybe we should plant something in the back garden, I say instead. Like what? He asks. I don't know. Roses? Or sweet peas? I'm looking for the joy of progress. I'm imagining green shoots poking up from the earth, promising a future. Dad shakes his head swiftly. Won't grow, not with the wind and the sand. Nothing much grows in our garden. You tried that when you were a little girl. He glances at me quickly, not quite confident enough to make eye contact. Don't you remember? A categorical, no, I don't remember upsets him maybe even more than it upsets me. I work around it, offering the sort of sentence that can be interpreted as a statement of fact, but is really a question. I was into gardening for a time. When you were about seven or eight, you had your own patch of the garden. We turned it over together, built a little fence around it. You enjoyed painting the fence yellow, then you planted snapdragons, flocks, and a rose bush. I am excited at the thought of this idyllic childhood. I try very hard to recall the abundance of pretty bobbing snapdragons, roses pink, and bright colourful flocks. A country garden blossoming, almost overripe. I think... I recall the pungent scent of blooms hanging in the air. I almost see a bed of flowers that is so full, it's somehow fleshy. But I don't feel joyful or soothed by the thought. I feel uncomfortable and cross. Perhaps this is understandable when Dad adds, They didn't grow. It was a wet spring. The shoots drowned. The salty air, the sand, everything worked against you. Was I disappointed? No, you didn't even notice. You'd already lost interest. Something else caught your attention, probably. Gardening is not your thing, Stacy. The memory of the blossoming garden doesn't make sense, then. Another mix-up. Dad used to be a doctor. Not a specialist, a GP. Still, he's been really helpful in trying to get me to understand my unique position. After surgery such as mine, a temporary memory loss is expected. Temporary being the hopeful word. However, I've been warned that false memories 
and susceptibility to suggestibility can also occur. It's confusing. Exhausting. Was mum into gardening too? I asked carefully. My mother is not an easy topic for my dad. That much has become abundantly clear. It's understandable, but I have to ask about her. How will I remember my past if I self-censor and avoid important subjects? When I think of my mother, I can't recall her hair colour, height, or smile. But I sense a keen desire to please her. Nothing particular, just an all-pervasive sense that I wanted to make her happy. My mother walked out on us before my ninth birthday. Can't remember the specific moment, but I remember feeling abandoned, confused. I wouldn't mind forgetting that feeling, but I can't. My damned head. Dad says, no, she was not in the least bit interested in gardening. I was the green-fingered one. Here one day, gone the next, I mutter. It must have seemed sudden to you, Dad says, turning away from me. And to him? Was it sudden for my dad? Or had he expected it? Maybe they had been rowing for months before her departure, a house whipped by hissed whispers behind closed doors. Or maybe they did not row at all, instead were simply unhappy, disconnected. Did sullen, weighty silences drench the room after I'd gone to bed, and they were alone together? She went far away. I struggle and stretch for the memory. It's like a tin on a too high shelf in a supermarket, very definitely there, but just out of reach. Not so much as a backward glance. Moved abroad? Dad nods. I pick up a tea towel, but don't really know what to do with it. There are no pots to dry. This is a heavy conversation for so early on in the day, but our weird world, centred around a pandemic, life-threatening illness and memory loss, means we don't follow the usual conversational guidelines. I am constantly attempting to piece my jigsaw mind back together, slot things into place, so I blurt out questions whenever they come into my head. Dad tries to provide answers. Yes, she did. Was there someone else? Yes. I see. Moving abroad, leaving your child for another man, delivers a certain message, received loud and clear. Did she remarry? I ask. Dad picks up the bottle of ketchup that's on the kitchen table and puts it in a cupboard. I realise that clearing the table is preferable to bearing his soul. I think so. I don't know for sure. She didn't stay in touch directly. Sometimes there were rumours. From time to time, an indiscreet friend we had in common would let something slip. Did she have any more children? I think I remember something about that. I can't recall if they were sons or daughters. Brothers or sisters. But I remember feeling replaced. He nods, seeming stiff and reluctant. Yes, I believe so. I don't ask anything more. I've pushed him far enough on this topic for one day. What does it matter now, anyway? She isn't here. She hasn't been in touch. I'm obviously not part of her life. She is not part of mine. Her leaving knocked Dad for six. His words. He's told me that was when he gave up being a GP. He just couldn't hold everything together. Taking care of me, dealing with his own broken heart, 
and absorbing his patients' problems was too much. He became quite reclusive, prioritizing time with me above everything else, including other people's company and a career path. He took casual work that fitted around my school hours and holidays. I look out of the kitchen window. The view to the back of the house is a gloomy field and a scattering of outhouses. There is a solid line of trees and bushes in the far distance that blocks out the light and acts as a curtain drawing a veil between us and the outside world. The tarmac around the house is framed by nettle patches and scrubby, parched grass strewn with dented drink cans and litter. I'm not sure where the litter came from. Surely not Dad. Most likely chucked over the hedge or blown through. The place has a sad, neglected air to it. It's time to change the subject. So, gardening is not my thing. That's okay. Good to rule it out. I wait a beat. Fairy lights, then. Colourful ones. Something to bring some cheer. The back garden, which butts up against the beach, is always covered in a fine layer of sand. The grass, the stone path, even the vibrant piles of sea glass are muted. If you like. I'm not sure where we'd buy them. I bet we could get them online if we had internet. Dad chuckles, amused by the very thing that frustrates me. We need broadband. We should find a provider, I add firmly, not for the first time. Oh, that's not so easy when you're out in the sticks. It's not like living in a big city, oozing choice. He smiles at me as though he's delivering good news. I know he isn't interested in being online in the same way I am. Dad gets all the entertainment he needs through his television. He has an enormous library of DVDs, mostly films that were popular in the 90s and noughties. He supports local shops. He reads his news in papers. He thinks constant updates are bad for our mental health, especially at the moment. That's fair enough. I can understand why he sometimes snaps the radio off and insists we think about something more pleasant. But the lack of access to the internet frustrates me. I'd like more regular updates on what is happening beyond our cottage. I'd like to see if I had social media accounts. I must have had. I certainly know that TikTok and Insta exist and are considered by many a great way to lose hours. Was I one of those many? Could my social media accounts help jog my memories? Of course, I'd have to recall my passwords first. Googling Stacy Jones would be a starting point. I long to be back out there, to be part of it. Dad is forever telling me that there isn't anything to be part of right now. He has a point, I suppose. He keeps saying that if I'm going to be ill at all, this is the best time. I'm not missing out. I just need to concentrate on getting well. Dad is someone who enjoys taking life slowly. Naturally content in his own company. He doesn't seem to find lockdown much of a struggle. I get the feeling that he's never been one to socialise much. Happy to keep himself to himself. That much is revealed by his eternally tatty clothes, which only make it into the washing machine when I nag him. You know what, Stacy? You've always reminded me of that princess in the fairy tale. Which one? I ask sceptically. My life seems a long way from a fairy tale. The one who slept on twenty mattresses, but could still feel the pea that was hidden under the bottom one. You're saying I'm a bit of a spoilt bitch? Dad laughs. You're not a spoilt bitch. I'm just aware that you struggle with the mundane stuff that others accept more readily. I'm okay without internet. All these years, it's never once crossed my mind that it's a problem not having it. You're home now, and it matters to you. You want more. I nod. He's right. 
he's identified something that feels true about me. I'm not very good at making do. I'm an unsettled sort of person. I always want to optimize, to strive forward. Dad continues, Natural enough. You're young. Ambition is a good thing. Thwarted ambition, or unfulfilled ambition, is less of a good thing. It's simply difficult and painful. This goes unsaid. You feel more than most. That's all I'm saying. I understand that it's not easy, he adds with a sympathetic smile. I feel more, but remember less. What a crap combination. For a moment or two, there is no sound in the room other than Ronnie's claws scratching on the floor. The silence screams. Hey, Stacy, are you making coffee? Dad prompts. I am. Is there enough for two? Of course. I make a big pot of coffee every day. There's always enough for two. More than enough. I allow myself to be distracted because Dad needs to think he can distract me. Dad isn't someone you'd rush to describe as in touch with his feelings, but he reaches for them when he knows it's important to me. And that's pretty amazing. He's undoubtedly a good guy. The best. Maybe that's why I'm not married. I've struggled with meeting the right man because my dad set the bar too high. I don't know. I really don't. I grind the beans, glad of the noise that fills the kitchen, making conversation redundant. I throw yesterday's granules and filter bag into the recycling bin. Swirl the glass pot under the tap. I take another sniff of the fresh granules and will the man I can't quite remember, can't quite forget, to crawl into my head again. This sense of him settles into my consciousness. It's where he belongs. I recall his eyes meeting mine. I think I do. It feels real. And the way he looked at me. Wow. I was his world. His entire world. And yet, simultaneously, it's as though he was indifferent. As though he was playing with me, or experimenting with me, or simply confused by me. What is that about? I don't know. I don't understand him, but it excites me. I have to find that man. Chapter 8 Stacy I spend the day sunbathing and reading. The heat is the sort that means even doing nothing becomes exhausting. I feel the sweat pool between my thighs and at the base of my back. I watch the sun slowly shunt across the sky. Our cove is deserted once again. I consider seeking out the relief of the cool sea, but lethargy overwhelms me and I stay put. It's too much effort to reapply sun cream after a dowsing. When the tide is out, a few more people stroll along the shore. There is a wooden plank walkway that stretches along the coast, but stops abruptly about 40 metres from where our garden meets the beach. I spot a familiar figure at that point. A woman in a wheelchair. I've seen her in the same place a few times before. She obviously follows the walkway as far as she can, then usually she turns back towards the village. Today I notice that her chair isn't facing out to sea, as you might expect. It's turned towards me. I glance behind me to see what it is she might be staring at. There isn't really anything. Just our house. A run-down 1930s Pebble Dash cottage. Dad isn't in the garden. He's probably still napping in his room. 
so there's no one other than me who can be attracting her attention. I suddenly feel exposed in my bikini. Judged. I reach for my sarong. I consider waving to her and raise my hand, but squinting in her direction, there is something about her expression that makes my arm freeze at my side. It's as though the sun has scuttled behind a cloud. I shiver. She's too far away for me to clearly see her face, but somehow I feel she radiates hostility. I pull myself up for having this thought. Most likely her posture has more to do with her own situation in life, nothing to do with me. She is perhaps physically uncomfortable, not scowling, but grimacing. I look away from her, train my eyes onto my book. The next time I look, she is gone. And I feel relieved. I allow the crash of the waves to lull me, send me into an almost hypnotic state. Something close to sleep that makes the words on the page start to slip and slide. It's hard to concentrate. I shut my eyes and feel the sun on my lids. And that's when I see it. Actually see it, not just sense it. It arrives, a glorious, perfect memory. I'm in an enormous copper bathtub. My arm is hanging over the edge, covered in soap suds and bubbles. I'm laughing. I can't see my face, which suggests this is real, not imagined. But I can see my belly quivering with joy. I must be in a hotel because the bathroom is so beautiful. Sensual. Classy. The mosaic tiles shimmer. The room smells of something woody and dark. Ginger or citrus. Nothing like a bathroom in a normal home. He climbs into the tub too. I watch his long, strong, tanned legs. Water sloshes over the side and we laugh. Careless of the mess on the floorboards. There's a sense that there is no responsibility between us. We're playful. There is a dress on the floor, hastily discarded, and I believe that my clothes are always hastily discarded when he is around. Tugged off me with joy and enthusiasm. A flattering impatience. I remember the dress clearly. Not just the colour, the fabric and the texture, although I do remember those things. It is burnt red, almost orange, ribbed wool. But I remember more than that about the dress. I remember how it made me feel to wear it. I remember buying it. I know I chose it because he would find it, me, sexy. He'd like to see me in it see me out of it. I remember being in a plush changing room and having that exact thought. He'll want to strip me bare. It was expensive and I bought it without a second thought. I slid the credit card across the smart glass counter. Casually, not in the slightest bit concerned whether there were funds in my account, I knew there were. It's strange to realise that I once had the sort of wealth that meant I didn't care if soapy water slopped over the bathtub and splashed onto my expensive dress. Where is that money now? My memory stays with his thighs in the water, wet and attractive. It annoys me that I remember all this detail, but I can't remember his name or his face in its entirety. Just his eyes, and the feel of his wet hands on me, soaping my breasts. Who is he? Was he something meaningful, or a brief holiday romance? Either thing is possible. If we were in a current relationship, why hasn't he been in touch? 
I suppose he must be someone from long ago. Our thing, whatever it was, could have been long over before I got ill. Or maybe he doesn't belong to me. Married. The thought lands like a slap. My skin prickles. Am I that sort of woman? The bit on the side, the mistress? God, I hope not. I believe mistresses are chorus girls. I'd like to think I was this man's leading lady. I just don't know. I sit up, reach for my water. The ice cubes have long since melted, and the glass glints with condensation. My memory is leaning further back to the start of this relationship. It's steeped in something besides desire. It's a complicated play, a game of cat and mouse. A step forward and backward. I want him, but I shouldn't. I remember thinking it would weaken and disturb me if he undressed me, but it would kill me if he didn't. A rock and a hard place. And I know that even when we became lovers, I was not quite his. Why not? Why didn't I give in to him? Why couldn't he take me completely? I'm 37. These are crucial years for me in terms of fertility. Fact, I'm already past my prime for all that. Honestly, I feel older. I've been through so much. What have I been doing with myself? Was I bothered about the fertility countdown before I got cancer? Did I ever want to make a baby with the intense man with the eyes that bored into me? Did he ever want that too? Did we try? I look about me and see nothing other than the sea meeting the shore, the sun slipping behind the horizon. Another day closing down. I try not to think life is passing me by. Other beaches may be teeming by now. Near resort towns, there will be plenty of local people wanting to make the most of the unexpected heat wave. Our remote corner of the world remains empty. The emptiness does not feel peaceful. It feels like a void. I know that a woman my age ought to be out there meeting people, having relationships, scrambling up a career ladder, buying a property, seeing friends, planning mini-breaks, at least attending a damned book club. That's what I should be doing, all things being even. Which clearly, they are not. Of course, I have had boyfriends. Dad has shown me photos of Giles Hughes, a man I was in a relationship with for four and a half years. For 18 months of those, we were engaged. Apparently, I called off the relationship a fortnight before the wedding, citing a nebulous need to do more first as my reason to break his heart. This story was recounted to me by Dad with a notable dollop of regret. Secretly, I feel a flutter of pride at that decision that past me made. It's a brave thing to call off a wedding at such a late stage, and I can't imagine it was easy to do, but far easier than living in a marriage full of regrets. I guess I was quite gutsy once upon a time. I need to find that again. Channel that. The photos show Giles to be ruddy and earnest. An open, hopeful face. I don't remember him at all, but I can't believe he is the man who clambered into the brass tub with me, whose glance excited, then dismissed me. I don't get the sense that Giles ever played cat and mouse with any woman. Apparently, after I called off the wedding, I moved to Paris. My best guess is the man I almost remember is a Parisian. He's out there somewhere. He made my pulse gallop as though I was a heroine in a tacky paperback. He made me swell with lust, low at the pit of my body, a feeling that rushed through me and left me happily agitated. 
I do remember Paris. Countless fountains, rows of elegant lampposts and grand cream buildings, wide avenues, delicious food and wine consumed at small round tables in the bustling streets. There were charming stone bridges, smartly dressed couples who regularly stopped on the pavements to passionately kiss. I can barely speak French. What the hell? I can remember verb tables and that sort of stuff that you learn by rote. Je suis, tu es, il, elle est. But I can't string a sentence together. I can't imagine holding a conversation. Was I the idiot who lived in Paris for a decade and didn't bother learning the language? If so, I hate myself. Or did I learn to parler français, but that is another part of my brain that has been eaten by the cancer? If so, I hate myself. Or at least I hate my body, which has betrayed me, let me down so badly. Dad tells me that I was a teacher in Paris. I taught English as a foreign language. I think I taught at an all-boys school, because I frequently get flashes of dark-haired, dark-eyed boys running about, or looking frustrated or bored as they pick up a pen, then proud and joyful as they finish an exercise. I must have taught a range of ages, because I get these faster-than-a-blink impressions of boys of various sizes. No girls. Teaching English as a foreign language requires total immersion as the teaching method. This means I would have only spoken English in my classroom. Maybe that's why I didn't bother learning the language. That and the haughty Parisians mocking my attempts. Still, even if that is the case, I can't help being disappointed with my past self. No language learning and a married lover? I feel so uncomfortable with this version of me. Ignorant and deceitful, lazy and disruptive. It's so difficult to wash myself in glory, and don't we all want to be the heroine of our own lives? Did I waste my time in France? That's unforgivable. When I got my diagnosis, I moved straight back here to England, to this small coastal hamlet that I grew up in. Even though I'd been away for years, from what I can gather, not even visiting my dad that often, it was the place I bolted to. The place where I could depend on someone. It makes sense. Cancerous mistresses aren't a thing, really, are they? Married lovers presumably call it quits at that point. Dad has told me about the call I made from my apartment in Paris. He urged me to just get on a train and come home. He sorted out everything. Having my things packed up and shipped back here, dealing with my landlord and employers over there. None of that mattered, he's told me. All that mattered was getting you home. My kind, reliable father. I'm grateful that he sees me in a better light than I perhaps deserve. I think I can add Daddy's Girl to my scant character profile. I don't remember the treatment. It will come back to me, apparently. Or maybe not. As Dad points out, there are better memories that you might want back first. Count your blessings. Isn't that the mantra we're all supposed to live by? I have a feeling it is. I can't quite pinpoint where I am on the scale of optimist or pessimist. Glass half full or half empty? I think maybe I'm the sort who believes my glass is just not quite big enough. So what does that make me? Greedy? I'm lucky. I know I am. I'm lucky that I am here. I'm lucky they detected the cancer early and that it hadn't spread to any of my vital organs. I'm lucky that they cut out all the tumours. I'm lucky that we found a consultant who dared to try this more radical, only chance experimental treatment and that I had the operations, chemo and everything before COVID-19 created a bottleneck in hospital admissions. I'm lucky. 
so damned lucky. But sometimes it doesn't feel like that. Sometimes it feels like I'm very unlucky indeed. I'm scared. My past is bleached to nothing. So my reality is terrifying. Unbalanced. Liquid rather than solid. And I'm drowning. I have nightmares about drowning all the time. Water gushes into my open mouth, up my nose, drums around my ears. Everything is blurred and blunted. My clothes get heavy, bloated, and I kick hard, but the harder I kick, the deeper I seem to be dragged under the waves. I'm drowning in an absence. A darker mood engulfs me. The sun feels as if it is scorching, rather than warming or comforting. I pick up my book, slip my flip-flops back on and head indoors. Feet dragging, heart aching, and my head? My head is simply letting me down. Chapter 9 Stacy. Our lockdown days have settled into a regular pattern. Dad and I take our separate walks. When I return, I prep and cook lunch. This involves lengths of time studying recipes cut from newspapers. I try to tell myself that it's quite fun discovering what I like to eat, that I'm getting a chance to rediscover myself in a way no one else does. Turns out I'm not fond of butternut squash or sweet potato, but other than that, I seem pretty broad in my tastes. Dad is grateful for whatever I put in front of him. From what I can gather, until I returned home, he lived on oven chips and frozen chicken bites. The sort of food you might occasionally, and guiltily, feed your children if you are in a hurry. I try to serve up nourishing and tasty dishes for us both. I think I must have been quite a good cook before. I certainly find the process of chopping, slicing, grating and peeling simple and therapeutic. I'm fully aware what the differences are between blanching, browning, grilling, boiling, stewing, etc. How strange my memory is. So infuriatingly selective. We eat lunch, read the papers or a book. Sometimes Dad snoozes in his chair. If the weather is good, I might sunbathe, but if I'm not in the mood, I amuse myself for an hour or so around the house. There is always something that needs to be done in the cottage. When I first was well enough to start exploring the house again, I was struck by the extent of the neglect. Outside, weeds spring up through cracks in the cemented areas that connect the various outhouses. A shed, a greenhouse, a dilapidated Anderson air raid shelter and even an ancient outdoor loo. Not somewhere I've investigated. There is a lean-to bolted onto the outside of the house, a dubious home improvement that is most likely a legacy of the 1970s. The roof is made of corrugated plastic and has yellowed with age. Dad keeps boxes of things to be recycled in there. Newspapers, card, cans, batteries, textiles... He keeps promising to take them to the appropriate centres, but lockdown has hampered that. The stack of boxes grows ever higher, precariously balanced, always threatening to topple. There is a cracked plastic sledge propped up against the back wall. I guess it must have been mine, and there for about three decades. Inside the house, there is dated wood chip wallpaper in some rooms, Others boast floral patterned papers that, in places, swell. have gone baggy, like an old person's skin. I itch to scrape the paper off and paint the walls in solid dark blues and greys, which instinctually I know are popular and fashionable. The magnolia paintwork of the skirting boards and doors is chipped and darkened with dirt. Fingerprints and lingering smoke from the open fire. The carpets are worn. Dust and grime are ingrained into every surface and ornament. The air in the rooms is always stale. 
No matter if I leave the windows open all day, decades of sweat and smoke have penetrated the furniture. For all his strengths, no one could suggest that Dad is a contender for any house-proud prizes. But I find it therapeutic to lose an hour or so to scrubbing floorboards until the grain and sheen of the wood re-emerges. It's satisfying to paint a shelf or window frame, and it can be interesting to sort through a cupboard or drawer. Plowing through boxes and storage always offers the chance of my remembering something. So the process often has the feel of a treasure hunt. Doing chores is familiar. I have balled socks, deep cleaned ovens, hung pictures, and kept a home in the past. I sense as much. Although I have no idea if I always lived alone or flat shared. I was a poor communicator about such details with Dad, as he's equally clueless. If I shared my life with a significant other, it wasn't someone I thought was significant enough to introduce to my father. This thought makes me feel a little uneasy, a little shady, as it feeds into my theory that I had a married lover. Or am I being dramatic? Maybe there was nothing to hide. Maybe there just wasn't anyone to share. We eat again around 5.30, a light tea. Neither of us has a big appetite, despite all the fresh air and walking. Then we take Ronnie on an evening walk together. Generally, we try to do a couple of miles, heading east all the way along the coastal path, until we reach the most picturesque beach cove. It takes a bit of getting used to. Sometimes we scramble down the hillside, practically sitting on our backsides for the last few metres. Sturdy and stronger than a man twenty years younger, Dad is undaunted by his age or the lack of dignity in this, and we both always have a bit of a giggle when doing it. As we walk, he likes to recall other times we've spent there, banging on buckets with plastic spades, searching for shells, getting damp with spray. He's always hoping to jog my memory. We rarely linger. Our walks, so often repeated since my illness and lockdown, have developed an air of efficiency. There and back again. By 8pm, latest, we're usually back in our kitchen, enjoying a stiff G&T or cracking open a bottle of red. Then, sometimes, we watch TV. Or if there's nothing on that we fancy, we might play cards or dominoes, or we might peruse old photo albums. This is definitely Dad's preferred way to spend the evenings. I can see his excitement every time as he pulls an album off the shelf. He has dozens of them. Old-fashioned things. The photos are not great quality. Faded, aged, some creased or ever so slightly blurry, many with a blue tinge. They were all developed in places like Boots. I know that's not what happens with photos now. We take snaps on our phones and keep them there, rarely bothering to print, frame or mount. We don't give our moments that same sort of reverence anymore. I think that's a mistake. If this illness has taught me anything, it's that we should revere every moment. Dad likes us to sit side by side on the couch, the album resting on his lap. He turns the pages carefully, keeping his eyes on the photographs, giving me space as I try to become reacquainted with my past. He slowly points to pictures of me, him, mum. Sometimes a friend is with us. You remember Mandy Crosby, don't you? And Jed Illingworth. He lived next door to us for years. It broke your heart when his family moved to Manchester. Often his comments are made with a forced joviality that fails to hide his longing. It's so tempting to say, yes, I remember, to unambiguously take ownership of things that I don't recall. It would make him happy. And maybe it would make me feel better too. But the truth is, I don't remember either, friend. I stare at images of Dad, my mother, and my young, skinny-limbed, tomboyish self. 
and don't remember any of us. I try to smile. Sometimes, maybe, I give in and nod a fraction, not exactly a lie, but something to offer him a glimmer of assurance. Or at least, hope. The albums record my life with obvious enthusiasm, until I am in my mid-twenties, which is when I called off my wedding to Giles and ran away to Paris. The photos I took there must all be on my phone. Unfortunately, I don't know where my Paris phone is. Dad said I had one when I came home from France. Perhaps I left it in hospital at one of my many appointments. We've searched high and low for it. I've looked through the suitcases and boxes that my Parisian friends packed up and sent on as per Dad's instructions. There are several of them stacked in cupboards, under beds, behind furniture. I have yet to fully unpack. I tend to retrieve things only when I need them. I hoped I'd find my phone tucked away at the bottom of one of those boxes somewhere, battery flat, waiting for new life to be breathed into it. Obviously, photos of my recent past and lists of friends in my contacts would be very helpful to me. It's another frustration that it too has vanished. Dad says he'll buy me a replacement as soon as we're out of lockdown. There's no rush. Whose number would I store? Tonight, there's nothing of interest on the TV. We miss standing on the step, clapping into the night air, sending our gratitude to the NHS staff. That act was temporarily hopeful and rousing, but the country has collectively decided that the gesture has already had its day. Now, Thursday evenings are like every other evening. We have to duck away from the flat isolation of the horizon and seashore. Fancy a game of cards? I offer. This afternoon, as Dad slept, I searched through a couple of drawers under my bed, hoping to dislodge a glimmer of a memory. Nothing doing. I sorted through discarded makeup bags, old school books and notebooks, broken bits of fun jewellery, odd socks and tennis balls. I didn't recognise a thing. It can be exhausting. Chilling, if I allow it to be. It takes all my energy to believe in a future where things become clearer and I'm once again anchored with a past. Not adrift, as I currently feel. So I'd like a mildly competitive card game to take my mind off the blanks I'm drawing, but Dad clearly has other ideas. He glances hopefully at the shelf where the photo albums are stacked. I pretend not to notice. Root about in the sideboard for the playing cards instead. Tad arguably knows me better than I know myself, and will be inwardly struggling. He won't want to overwhelm me, but he's a parent. There must have been countless times when he's encouraged me to stretch myself, when he's known that persevering is good for me. It is the job of a parent to gently push, to believe in their kids even when the kids doubt themselves. If a child falls off their bike when learning to ride it, it's a parent's job to get them to hop back on. Poor dad. I bet he thought those years of balancing cajoling with encouraging were behind us. He must long for me to place our first holiday, remember sports days and school plays. He'll want me to recall the Easter egg hunts, tea parties, sleepovers, the endless, blissful days searching rock pools, bobbing on boats, and all the other elements of the perfect childhood that he supplied. He weighs that hope against the outcome that experience has shown is more likely. A night of barely smothered frustration and regret as I come up blank. It must break his heart that I can't recall all that he did for me. By not remembering, I'm sort of destroying him too. Memories are richer and fuller if shared. The ultimate affirmation. Since my mother buggered off, there's only me who can validate his efforts and experiences. My fractured, faulty memory has stolen not only my past, but his too.
Tonight, he has a nervous energy about him and is oozing that treasure hunt excitement vibe I can't bring myself to douse. I nod and smile as he stretches for a large green photo album. Family holiday to Great Yarmouth is in this one, I think. With something akin to reverence, he opens the album. Do I imagine it, or do the stiff pages let out a sigh? You lived on sticks of rock, he says, chuckling. Pointing to a photo of me where I'm facing the camera and managing to smile while sucking hard on a yard of rock. Your mum started to worry your teeth would fall out before the week was up. You'll recall that. He states it like a fact, although it doesn't make it one. Even if I could recall Yarmouth, I don't think my mother would have been that worried about my teeth. I look about eight in the photo. She most likely had a foot out the door by then. We visited the Maritime Museum. My choice. Retrospectively, a big ask for a child. Likely, you'd have been happier at the Pleasure Beach or the Aquarium, but you took a lively interest. You were always so amenable. He grins at the young me in the photograph. My eyes are bright, and I shine back at him, the way I must have when he took the photo, radiating love, basking in it. I would do anything to remember that feeling. My dad paints a consistently glowing picture of me as a child. Besides being amenable to museum visits, my virtues included, although were not limited to, being sporty, you always gave everything your best shot. Creative, exceptionally good at art, kind to friends, generous, thoughtful, patient. Look, maybe I was a model child, or maybe because I've had cancer and nearly died, he has a tendency to be a bit selective. Or, and I like this theory the best, maybe his generous description of me simply demonstrates his absolute love of me rather than his love of the absolute truth. Being my parent blinds him to any faults, past, present, or future. I find this comforting. Some parents do simply dote, and only ever see the good in their offspring. Children who are subject to total devotion are so lucky. I feel this in my soul. Loved kids win the lottery. Unwanted kids, lost kids, kids of selfish, neglectful, or warring parents are left with holes. Anyway, I doubt I was as saintly and accomplished as he describes me. Who could be? I wonder if secretly I was a little bugger up to all sorts, just good at hiding it from him. Somehow, I think this is most likely because I have a sense that I'm not a straightforward person, not like my dad. I have secrets. I just can't remember them. We spent a fortune in the amusement park, hook a duck, whack-a-mole, and the rifle range. You always wanted me to win you a cuddly toy, muses dad. You were so certain I could, so I'd end up sinking a fortune to secure whatever piece of tat had caught your eye. He is lost in the memories, but happily so. I'm lost in the lack of them, not happily so. I rally for him. We are a seesaw. If I'm feeling despondent, he buoys me up. If he sinks, I rush to cheer him. The scientists are working on a vaccine, I say. Every brilliant brain in the world is focused on it. It's only a matter of time. Then, once they have that... We'll be out and about again, and I'll start to remember things. You think? Dad looks uncomfortable, not able to hide his doubt. Do you fancy a slice of that coffee and walnut cake I made this morning? I offer. Our harmony comes from knowing when to change the subject. Dad grins and nods, and I stand up and head into the kitchen. I consider a second G&T, but decide against it. I know I have to be careful with how much alcohol I drink following my op. Instead, I pop the kettle on. I'll make a cuppa. I open the back door 
and let the fresh air run through the house. I can smell the sea, salt and sand. I leave the door open as I cut two slices of cake and put them on plates on a tray. I find mugs, tea bags and milk. As the kettle boils, something peculiar happens, swift and sure. I don't smell the sea. I can smell dank and damp earth. I don't suppose it is Paris. In Paris it's car fumes, perfume and red wine, right? But I remember the fusty smell of moist earth. I see a fat worm rooting its way through the soil. I wonder whether it is the plot that I briefly tended as a child. But no, this is not a garden. It's more complicated than that. I sense that there's something confusing and contradictory about this patch of earth. I'm glad of it, and I'm scared of it. Then, like a flicker in a film, I see a grave. I hate this grave. I know I do. I stoop and place flowers. I love the flowers. I don't want to leave them at the cold grave. I will my memory to focus on the headstone. Who is lying under the earth? Who have I brought flowers to? Shudders ripple through my body as I consider that it might be him, the man I bathed with. My heart hiccups, protesting at that possibility. It's simply not fair that I'm just almost remembering him, and there's a chance that he's gone already. Before he's mine, fully, I've lost him. Then I see them. Two small children. A flash, a blink. Baby teeth. Flushed cheeks. Hot little hands in mine. Solemn and sweet. My heart aches for them. They ooze loss and sadness. I bend at my knees so I'm level with them, balanced precariously. One of them snuggles into me. I almost topple, saved only because I put my hand out into the moist earth. Onto the grave. The child's breath is on my face. He smells of Chuppa Chup's lollies. He kisses me. A soft sound as his baby lips pucker up and then touch my cheek. The other little boy has his back to me. He keeps his eyes on the flowers. His skinny shoulders are stooped. I don't know which of them I pity more. Which I should comfort first. There is a man. He turns to me, his dark eyes piercing, pleading. They are kind eyes, but they hold pain and a hint of reserve. He keeps me at a distance while he's asking me to do something. What? What does he want me to do? Who is he? He is not the man I bathed with. And then they are gone. I hang on to the back door and take large gulps of the air. Briny, once again. There's no hint of wet soil, just the salty whip of the sea. I turn to the tea tray and snatch up a slice of cake. I cram it into my mouth to stop the distress and panic spilling out, to stop me saying anything aloud that might upset my elderly father. I need to think this through. A thousand scenarios run through my head, almost simultaneously. The most obvious thought is that the boys are students of mine and I attended a funeral with them as a guardian. I'm comforting them as we're burying one of their parents. How heartbreakingly sad. But I feel incredibly close to them, so possibly they are more than students. I might have been their nanny. Or they could be children of a friend of mine, or a cousin, a colleague. These are my children. My boys. That's the weirdest thought to flash into my head. 
How could I have sons and dad have failed to mention them? Of course not. That's impossible. I sigh. The most probable thing is that this is a false memory, not real at all. I might have seen something on TV that suggested this graveside scenario to me. There's a lot of coverage on the news that funeral attendance is being restricted. It's disturbing, and my subconscious is most likely processing that. As much as I'm desperate to get my memory back, I hope this one is a false memory. Because the idea of these two grieving little boys leaves me feeling inflamed and helpless. Ten Years Ago Chapter 10 Stacy Stacy is looking for Giles. They are meeting tonight at 8pm at his mother's house, but she wants to see him alone, and they won't be left alone this evening. They rarely are nowadays. Just the two of them, cuddled up on a sofa in the pub, taking a walk, is a thing of the past. Tonight, she, Giles, and his parents will sit and watch TV together, or at least she'll try to watch TV, but no doubt, viewing will be frequently interrupted with talk about the wedding. It amazes her that there is anything left to discuss. Flowers, dresses, cars, food, drink, stationery, guest lists, gift list, order of service, timings, have all been ruminated upon, examined, and considered scores of times. Stacy wonders what they will talk about once the wedding is over. She called Giles an hour ago, but it turns out he accidentally left his phone at the farmhouse this morning and has been without it all day. Heidi, his mum, answered Stacy's call and explained as much. I've been taking his calls today. It's so much fun talking to his friends, she said with a laugh. There are few privacy boundaries in the Hughes family. No locks on phones or even on the bathroom door. No qualms about opening one another's post. Stacy thinks it is cosy. Or suffocating. It depends on her mood. Heidi suggests that Giles might be in the South Barn. That's where he keeps his Tiger Supercat kit car. And sometimes, on an evening, after he's finished his work on the farm, but before supper, he works on the car for a bit. Giles is a very sociable man, and doesn't like being left with just his own company. Quickly gets bored of it. So normally, the minute he finishes work, he calls one of his friends, Andy or Jim, and they meet him at the barn. Maybe bring a beer along. But as he doesn't have his phone with him today, there is a chance he'll be alone. Stacy sets off on foot because her dad is still in town and he has the car. They share a car, which isn't often an inconvenience, and even if it was, she can't afford one of her own, so she has to suck it up. The quickest way to the South Barn on foot is to take the coastal shortcut. She walks at speed. Hedges quickly give way to simple wire fences that pen sheep off the road. But soon, all signs of humanity fall away, and there is nothing other than a narrow track and rolling, rabbit-cropped fields. She spots Prue McCullen in the distance. Prue is paused at the stile, and there's no way of avoiding her. Stacy always feels vaguely uncomfortable with Prue McCullen, who was a teacher at the local primary school for over 40 years. Stacy numbers among her past pupils. Practically everyone in the village does. Prue might have finally retired last year, aged 65, but she has retained an air of authority over the population of the village. In her company, Stacy immediately feels like she's forgotten something. Her lunch money or homework, or that she has done something wrong like giggling in assembly. Prue starts talking the moment she claps eyes on Stacy. Her loud teacher voice booms across the field. I'm just drinking in the view. So familiar, and yet never boring. I always say that the quality of light in this part of the world is such that the infinite variety of greens in the trees and fields means that one is offered a new masterpiece every day. Don't you agree, Stacy? 
Stacy nods dutifully. Prue McCullen is the only person she knows who can get away with a non-ironic use of the third person singular, one. I was hoping to bump into you today, Stacy. I have something to show you. Prue nudges a worn rucksack off her back, unzips it with military-style efficiency, and roots around. She straightens up and holds out a length of pink ribbon for Stacy to inspect. It flutters on the wind, and Stacy's heart breaks a little. I got this from Leader's Haberdashery in Williton Cross, Prue explains. Williton Cross is the nearest small town. Most locals simply refer to it as Williton. The local teens, with their natural tendency to denigrate where they've come from, abbreviate to WC. It isn't really a shithole. More of a serviceable mediocrity, with a string of shops that provide everything you might need, nothing you want. I think it's perfect to tie the small flower arrangements to the pew ends. Gary Leader keeps plenty of pink ribbon in stock. Never goes out of fashion, does it? He offered it to me at cost when he heard it was for your wedding. Knows your father, so I took the liberty of putting in an order. Prue beams, happy with her result. She never married, and so has always had time to mother, or at least govern, the entire village involving herself from cradle to grave in everyone's business. She passes judgment on names chosen for babies, offers advice on ways to encourage a shy child to make friends. She always knows which tradesman is reliable, available, and not exorbitant. She visits people if they end up in the hospital, and if you have an old piece of furniture you need shifting, she always knows someone who is looking for just that thing. She will child mind and not charge, providing your child is well acquainted with the magic words please and thank you. Most people are glad of the extra pair of hands at some point in their lives, and so, despite the fact that her interest borders on interference, she brooks little opposition on a day-to-day -day basis. Motherless Stacy grew up knowing that people expected her to be especially compliant, grateful for any help or attention bestowed. It is obvious from Prue's stance that she is waiting expectantly for profuse thanks for her assistance in this matter of pew-end flower ribbons. Stacy had wanted the country flowers to be hand-tied with heavy lace, and she'd said that she would go to Exeter to source it herself. Prue is a good friend of Heidi Hughes, and Stacy is aware that they have shared a fair few conversations about how poor little Stacy knows nothing about hosting a proper wedding. She doesn't have to listen at doors to hear this sort of thing. They say it to her face. Eighteen months ago, when Stacy accepted Giles's proposal and wedding planning started, she explained that she wanted the wedding to be free-flowing, spontaneous and carefree. She said that the dress and bouquet had to reflect that. You know, I want it to look as if I've just wandered through a meadow and gathered up great armfuls of blooms. Native wildflowers like cornflower, bluebells, daisies. Also grasses, because they add texture. Prue looked concerned and commented that Giles Hughes was not a boho wedding sort of boy. No, he was a morning suit, carnation buttonhole sort of boy. A traditionalist. When Stacy first picked out a dress she liked, Heidi commented that it looked like a nightie. She said it with a laugh, but her comment found its aim, and Stacy agreed to a lace dress with a high neck, a tight waist, and a wide skirt. Prue and Heidi agreed that a traditional bridal bouquet, with lilies, roses, and a defined structure, was what was needed, and so they spoke with the florist directly. Obviously, the flowers for the pew ends must match. Prue is quite unabashed about using all her considerable energy to keep Stacy on track. Stacy stares at the pink, satiny ribbon. She thinks it's horrible. It looks like something a seven-year-old might covet, but she hasn't the energy to say so. Very nice, she mutters. It doesn't matter anyway. Not one bit. All she needs to do is get to Giles. Talk to him. She says she's got to dash, 
It started to spot with rain now, she'll get soaked. She climbs over the stile and darts along the track towards the barn. Giles is alone. It's a relief. It's what she wanted. And yet her stomach lurches. It's the last thing she wants. He doesn't stop working on the car to jump up and kiss her like he's in some sort of romantic novel. He doesn't passionately reach for her and take her over the bonnet of the car like something more X-rated. Hi, love, he says. Like they're an old married couple who have been together a hundred years. He glances her way, notices she is wet through. Is it raining? We need to talk. She hates herself. It's such a ridiculous cliche of a line. But what else can she say? We think we're all so different, and yet we're the same. Over the long history of humankind, people have needed to ditch their partners, and the decent ones decide to do it face to face. So there's nothing other than we need to talk. She sees him bring her into focus. Finally. He watches her carefully. Perhaps he's noticing the fine droplets of rainwater hanging around her hairline, on her eyelashes and cheekbones. Maybe he's thinking something romantic, like she looks luminous like a mermaid. Maybe he's thinking he loves her a lot. She doesn't know what he's thinking. But she watches his expression change as the words find a way to stumble out of her mouth. It's hard. The hardest thing she's ever had to do. She manages to say that she doesn't love him enough to give it all up. This isn't what she wants. He isn't what she wants. What? Give what up exactly? He asks, confused. My future. But I am your future. She doesn't answer that. Which says everything, really. Chapter 11 Stacy Stacy thinks the only thing she can possibly do now is run. Leave immediately. She doesn't want to have to unpick the mess she's created. To stick around to hear the judgment and condemnation from nosy neighbours, concerned friends and disappointed relatives who will all have a view. She doesn't want anyone to try to talk her out of her decision. Speaking to Giles took all the energy and courage she had. She's teetering on the edge. She wants to jump and take flight. But there's a chance she might slink back to the safety of a well-worn path if anyone really tries to persuade her to do so. Everyone is excited about the wedding. It wasn't her wedding she'd just cancelled, not even hers and Giles's. It belonged to the entire village. She's stolen from them. Stolen something they were looking forward to. She's aware that people have already bought new outfits for the big day. Those coming from further afield have booked trains and accommodation. How could she be so selfish? And Giles's parents. The thought of them sends a flash of angst through her core. What will Heidi and Ian say? They have paid for the drink, cars and flowers. They will be devastated, obviously. They will be disappointed in her, furious. They'll probably just outright hate her. She is like a daughter to them. They are always saying so. Everyone is always saying so. Except she isn't. Because if she was like a daughter to them, they wouldn't hate her. They'd try and understand her. That's what parents do. Her dad is struggling with it, but she can see he is trying. He's followed her into her bedroom. He rarely comes in here. He respects her privacy. They chat in the kitchen or living room. This is her space, but today he's stumbled into her room, tracked her down. He is wide-eyed with stress. 
he didn't even knock. Heidi has probably already been on the phone. Stacy has the bigger of the two bedrooms in the house. When her mother was still living with them, this was her parents' room. But after she left, her father said it made sense for Stacy to have it. Stacy thought he was simply being practical or generous. She had more toys, clothes, sports equipment. She needed the extra space more than he did. As an adult, she now understands that maybe his decision was more of an emotional one. He wouldn't have wanted to continue to sleep alone in his marital bedroom after the woman he loved had gone. There are layers that evidence Stacy staking a claim on the room, making it hers over the years. Her old school books and notebooks lays on shelves and under her bed. Untouched for ages, but not thrown away, because she isn't the sort to spend time decluttering. Broken bits of jewellery lie scattered on the dressing table, waiting for a day when they will be fixed. Bottles of nail varnish, odd socks and tennis balls languish. There are unframed pictures cut out of magazines, old birthday cards and postcards tacked to the wall. The yellowing sellotape is failing, and the pictures droop, slip, slide. It doesn't matter. Stacy has always believed it's not what's inside this room that makes it special. It's what lies outside. The room faces out onto the sea. The window is enormous. It's sometimes possible to imagine you are standing on the beach, being engulfed by the elements. Buffeted on a windy day, soused on a wet one, cocooned on a warm one. On extremely hot days, Stacy lies on her bed and watches the sun drip over the tiny Juliet balcony, fall through the window and pool beside her. There is no sun today, though. Just a flat sky the colour of a bruise. The downpour has settled into a hopeless drizzle. Her dad watches with obvious despair as she darts around the room picking up clothes off the floor or urgently pulling them out of the wardrobe, then flinging them into a suitcase. She's not wasting any time folding. She's just throwing T-shirts, jumpers, jeans and pants together higgledy-piggledy. It doesn't matter to her. All she wants is as many things as possible packed as quickly as possible, and then she wants to get out of here. Ideally, before a neighbour knocks on the door and says they've heard the news, demanding to know what the hell she's thinking. You don't have to run off, her dad says. I do. The words echo around her messy room, spitefully pinching her. The very words she can't bring herself to say to Giles. Her dad must be thinking the same thing, because colour floods into his cheeks, which happens when he's embarrassed or angry. He does get angry sometimes, infrequently, but incredibly so. He goes red when shouting at the news. Anything about animal cruelty quite naturally makes him boil, as do tourists swimming in the sea when a red flag is flying. Bloody idiots! If they get into trouble, they put others at risk saving them! He tries to stay calm, prides himself on remaining in control. He thinks rowing is uncivil, violence barbaric. Stacy can remember just two occasions in her life when her father really lost it. Once, when Jed Illingworth, her little friend from next door, pushed her onto the road and a car had to swerve to avoid hitting her. They were only messing, he hadn't meant to put her in danger, but her dad went ape. He shook Jed so hard she thought his teeth were going to fall out. And the other time was when her mother left. He smashed plates, put his fists through paintings, tore books from shelves. He was unrecognisable. I thought you were so happy, he says quietly. Not angry then. Embarrassed for her. Of her? Stacy pauses sits on the edge of the bed and faces her dad through their reflections in the dressing table mirror. You know what it's like around here. Lovely, he replies with conviction. Limiting, she counters. He winces. How so? 
Everyone is given a role. I don't like the role I've been given. What do you mean? Well, like Prue McCullen is the village busybody, and Mr. Baxter plays the church organ and likes to play the fool. Always relied upon for the dad jokes. Naomi Thomas is such a good mum, and Tanya Vaughan is no better than she ought to be. Popular opinion is that she'll never be a mother, and if she is, there will be no sign of a dad. Even if Naomi literally ate her kids on the village green, people would somehow blame Tanya. Al Morgan is a solid bloke, going to do well for himself, whereas Luca Sinelli is known as a work-shy feck. No one can change or grow here. What's my role? Your poor Ken, whose wife ran off. I see. Come on, Dad, that can't be news. I'd hoped you were going to say I'm the hot divorcee. Stacy can't help but grin. Her dad is trying to make a joke, trying to understand and be on her team. And you are? Pretty young thing about to marry her childhood sweetheart, destined to become a farmer's wife. Her dad stifles a guffaw. What? Stacy demands, doubting very much that there is anything to laugh at. I'm just thinking about that nursery rhyme. You know, the farmer wants a wife, the farmer wants a wife. e i r d o the farmer wants a wife. The whole village is going to be singing it. Stacy sighs, because it's true and awful. Well, I'm not that woman. For a start, I don't want a child, and that's how the rhyme goes, isn't it? Giles has often said he wants to have at least four children. Stacy always nodded when he said as much. She should perhaps have contradicted him, or at the very least raised an eyebrow, given him some indication that she wasn't buying into the big family idea. She misled him, and she feels awful about that. Really horrible. What? Not ever? Her dad looks shocked. He's obviously never considered this possibility. Most likely, he daydreamed about grandchildren. Four children would ground her, tether her, grind her down. She isn't sure which. I don't know. Certainly not any time soon, she says, panicked. She feels like an animal being backed into a corner. But you are a pretty young thing. That's a fair assessment. Stacy knows she is more than that. And less. Look, Dad, I can't think about this right now, any of this. She stands up and closes her suitcase with an air of finality and determination. She scrambles the combination lock, then goes to her bedside table and roots around in the drawer until she retrieves her passport. It's best if I just leave. It's the coward's way, but it's also the only way. Giles is a good man. He loves you so much. I know. But that's not enough. It's not everything. Her dad closes his eyes, sways back a little on his heels. His shoulders touch the wall behind him. He jumps as though startled but then instantly seems relieved that the wall is there to prop him up. He looks broken. In some ways, this feels harder than explaining it to Giles. Whatever Giles thinks now, Stacy knows he will meet someone else. The farmer will get his wife, a child, a nurse, a dog, a bone. Honestly, Stacy would put money on the fact that he'll marry the next girl he dates and that they'll marry in the local church as he and Stacy were supposed to. They will have the reception in the village pub. He might not even lose his deposit. He can carry it over. It will be the same vicar, same order of service, same hymns and florist. Just a different bride. That is part of the reason she has called the whole thing off, because she's come to realise that she was following Giles's life plan, not her own. She felt trapped by him. She had to break away. But her father isn't in the same boat as Giles. 
he will not be able to get himself a substitute daughter and gamely carry on. He depends on her. She is his everything, his world. And in all honesty, she feels trapped by that too. Her father is a co-conspirator with Giles, Heidi, Prue, the lot of them, because he loves the idea of his daughter settling down on the farm just a couple of miles away from his house. He wants to see Stacy every day, to be part of her life. He doesn't mind sharing her, that's natural and normal, but he can't stand the idea of not having anything of her. Not seeing her. What's wrong with settling down? he asks, his voice almost a groan. It's not just the settling down I object to, it's the settling for. I want to see more, Dad, more than the twenty square miles that we all live out our lives in around here. Well, yes, of course you do, that's natural. But you have had more, you went to art college. I did, yes, and do you honestly think I'm putting my degree to good use by working in the cafe in the garden centre? You're the assistant manager. You make the cakes. People love your cakes, and there's a lot of creativity involved in cake making. Dad, the only people who ever come into the garden centre cafe are people I've known all my life. They are bound to say my cakes are delicious. They've been saying that since I baked for brownie fundraisers. Well, that doesn't make it any less true. I need more. Well, a holiday then, that's what you need. Maybe you and Giles should still go to Ibiza, but not as a married couple. Just think of it as a regular holiday rather than a honeymoon. He is speaking quickly. She can hear the desperation in his voice. It sticks in the back of his throat. You haven't been away together for years, and not since he started saving for an engagement ring, and then you both started saving for the wedding. Going away will give you time to talk. Stacy throws him a despairing look. Seriously, Dad, can you imagine the two of us arriving at an all-inclusive honeymoon package resort and not being married? The place will be full of loved-up couples. It will be all rose petals on the bed and champagne on ice. It would be mortifying. I need to go away on my own. Live somewhere different. She declares it as a fact. Solid. Impenetrable. Non-negotiable. How long for? I don't know. Months? Maybe a year? Maybe longer? She never lies to her dad. Where will you go? She doesn't answer him. She hasn't decided. And she knows that admitting to the absence of a plan will expose her. You won't manage, Stacy. I know you. You're best off around here. Honestly, ask anyone you like and everyone will say the same. I'm your dad. I want what's best for you. Around here are all the people who love you, all your friends who have known you your whole life. Any one of us would do anything for you. They don't know her or understand her. She's sure of that. You think out there there's nothing but fun and adventure, but you're wrong, Stacy. The world is a big and scary place. At least, it can be. He's gasping now, shaking. She stares at him. Every word he utters proves to her that she is right. They don't have a clue. They think she's an innocent, rather naive child who is throwing away her best opportunity. They think she came back from art college with fancy ideas and has since been a bit above herself, with a tendency towards being haughty and distant. It is the opposite. She came back broken. A drug habit that was veering away from recreational and towards dependency. An abortion and a third-class degree had punched the spirit out of her. She has never known how to talk to them about any of it. Giles seemed so clean and good, which was, at the beginning, fascinating and attractive, but has become alienating and remote. She didn't actively choose to be with him. 
It was more a case of him being the hardest person for her to scare away. He is such a confident optimist. So she found herself dating him, then becoming engaged to him. She just sort of drifted into it. Everyone expected it from them. Sometimes it irritated her that he was so damned positive that he was unaware that anyone might be something other. He didn't seem to notice when she was rude to him, which she tried to avoid because she hated herself when she was rude to him. She didn't want to hate herself, but she couldn't help feeling sordid and unpleasant in comparison to him. On occasion, his obliviousness irritated her so much she was flat out nasty to him. He didn't deserve that. But sometimes she couldn't stop herself. He was a sitting fucking duck. She didn't want to fuck a duck. It was kindest just to end it. She'd come back here to hide from the first man she'd really loved. Despite her dad's insistence that everyone around here knew her, no one knew that. She needn't have bothered hiding. It wasn't as though he ever actively looked for her. Even when they were together, he wasn't always aware she was in the room. That was what she was hiding from, really. That utter and total rejection. That sense of not being seen at all. Not mattering at all. When she first returned, she was relieved to be seen. Noted. It was reassuring. She felt more real because they noticed her. The nosy neighbours, her dad, Giles, the dog. She felt validated and healthy. It was easier to be healthy here because it was almost impossible to find drugs. At college, you could hardly move without being offered boys, beans and blow. Here, you had to go out of your way, which she did sometimes, but just for a bit of hash, no pills, no powder. That was behind her. For a while, she really believed that Giles was in front of her, with his round cheeks, his hunter wellies, and his life plan. It seemed enough. A lot. Then, unexpectedly, it seemed too much. What started as concerned interest, notice, soon felt like surveillance. Her every damn move was documented. Their gazes caged her. Be careful what you wish for, that's what they say, isn't it? The worst of it was that they were all looking at her all the time, but no one could see her. Not really. They all thought they knew her. They repeatedly insisted on it. Oh, you've always loved pink. You like a Malibu and Coke, that's your poison. Yes, when she was seven. Yes, when she was 17. But they don't know who she is now she is 27. The scariest thing of all is that sometimes she doesn't know who she is either. She hasn't had time or space to work it out. Giles would never have given her space. And nor will her father. She has to snatch it for herself. I have to leave, she reaffirms with dogged determination. She drags her case off the bed and takes one, two long strides out the bedroom door. More steps take her down the stairs. You are just like your mother! The words are spat out. Clearly not a compliment. Maybe I am. She hopes so, actually. She might need some of her mother's gumption if she is going to just go, no looking back. For most of her life, since her mother upped and left, Stacy has hated her. She's believed her to be beyond selfish, an evil, terrible, ruinous bitch of a woman. But now she wonders was disappearing all her mum had the strength to do. Just enough strength to leave the village, but not enough to take Stacy with her, even though Stacy was only very small for her age at the time and really wouldn't have been any trouble. 
for the first time ever. She feels some sort of sympathy for her mother. Maybe even empathy. Who is to say whether their situations were that dissimilar? She feels a plan form in her head. She opens the front door. I'll text you my address when I have one. He knows her very well. He's probably already guessed that she has decided to head to Paris. That she's going to find her mother. She hugs him briefly. His grasp is tight. She has to wriggle out of it. The door slams behind her. Friday, 3rd of July, 2020. Chapter 12. Fiona. We should do something tomorrow, Fiona says. The suggestion rolls over the breakfast table. She's using her happy, enthusiastic voice. It's not a voice that is honestly very her. She's aware of that. She hopes they are not. She often uses this tone of voice when talking to the boys, and has done for years now. Not because she's a woman without kids and therefore doesn't know how to speak to children, as some might wrongly assume. The opposite. She knows how to speak to children better than most parents. She thinks being happy, or at least appearing so in front of them, is important. Over and over again, she sees parents getting it wrong, not making the effort. Parents snapping at their children, shouting at them, even ignoring them altogether because they are simply more interested in what drivel is on their phones. A C-list celebrity banging out the latest TikTok dance, a mindless meme about recognising anxiety in high-functioning introverts. It sickens her. Honestly, it does. Ungrateful, Fiona has always thought ungrateful and thoughtless. So she chooses to speak to kids like they are miracles, special, valued. But it has become a strain lately. It's been a struggle to remain constantly upbeat. Maybe it's because she's living with the boys now and being grateful and thoughtful 100% of the time is, after all, a big ask. Or maybe because of the pandemic and because everyone, literally everyone on the entire planet, is simply grumpy and fed up. Or maybe it's because Kylie is dead. Under this particular set of circumstances, it is naturally a strain to remain relentlessly enthusiastic, persistently upbeat. The boys don't respond. At least not all the time. Not all of them. And not always positively. There are a lot of knots in Fiona's life now that she has stepped into Kylie's shoes and bubbled up with Mark, Ollie and Seb. A lot of negativity. She never had much sympathy when Kylie used to grumble about the boy's lack of enthusiasm and by boys she meant her stepsons and her husband, which Fiona always thought was a little infantilising, a little off. Before... She just wasn't able to understand Kylie not appreciating every single moment of motherhood and being a wife. She thought perhaps her friend simply wasn't good enough at either role, wasn't trying hard enough to make them all happy. Because Mark was a good husband. The boys are good kids. But now she must admit it can be a little wearing. And she finds herself using the same shorthand, boys, to refer to all three of them. Mark sometimes acts like a lost child who needs looking after. It goes without saying that the circumstances under which Fiona is mothering are more than trying. They are without doubt harder than anything Kylie ever faced. True, Kylie might have stepped on board when they had lost their mother, but they were tiny then. Their needs were uncomplicated. Fiona is facing a much more nuanced situation. Everyone knows teens are unfathomable. She realises she must be especially patient when Ollie, or even Mark, acts as though she hasn't spoken. 
or when Seb is clingy, tearful or nervous and simply won't let her have a moment to herself. He has started to literally stand outside the bathroom when she's having a pee, for God's sake. He wants to know where she is every minute of the day. Follows her around like a puppy. It's not normal. Or sustainable. She needs her space too. Deep breath. Deep breath. Of course it's not normal. She can't expect it to be yet. The clinginess is entirely understandable. Most of the time it's quite flattering, rather comforting. But she would like to pee in peace. She repeats the comment, a little louder and more forcefully. We should do something! It is just possible they haven't heard. Mark and Ollie are often in their own worlds. Worlds she has tried to access but can't. Not quite. Worlds of what? Grief? Regret? Anger? Fear? She's not sure. Something bad. The worlds of nightmares. We should mark the day! Celebrate it! Their eyes stay trained on their cereal bowls. Thank God for Seb. In an instant, her frustration with his neediness is forgiven. At least he acknowledges her, responds to her. He looks up, meets her gaze. Eyes wide, dark and shining. Always shining. Sometimes with something painful, other times with hope. At least they are not dead. The other two have dead eyes. Today, Seb's eyes shine with interest, curiosity. Maybe simply a desire to be entertained, distracted. Like what? He asks. Like go to a restaurant or an amusement park. Her smile reaches across her face but has no chance of making it into her eyes. Smiling hurts. Fiona remembers the day Kylie and Mark got married when Kylie commented that her face ached from all the smiling. She was happy about it, though, smiling even as she said it. Fiona didn't understand. She does now, sort of. Her own face also aches with smiling. The effort it takes. Oh. Seb is obviously disappointed and too young to be disingenuous, even to be polite. What do you mean, oh? Wouldn't you like to visit Chessington World of Adventures? Not me. It's for little kids, chips in Ollie. Thought Park, then. Ollie doesn't respond, so Fiona turns her attention back to Seb, the younger, easier boy. He mutters, Suppose that would be good. But I just thought you meant something different. Well, since we've done nothing other than go for walks for months, I thought that going to a theme park would be different. The 4th of July, Independence Day in the USA, and here in the UK now too. That is the date when restaurants, cafes and tourist attractions finally reopen. Life can start again. Some are calling it Super Saturday. Others are dubbing it Freedom Day unapologetically echoing the American public holiday. Quite un-British, this level of buoyancy, but Fiona is ready to embrace it. She wants to eat food someone else has cooked and drink a cocktail that will be shaken by a smart young man, ideally with an insincere but nonetheless flattering glint in his eye. She can't understand why the others aren't being more enthusiastic. I thought... We'd do something really different, says Seb. Like what? Like look for mum. Fiona freezes. She doesn't know what to say. She glances at Mark, wondering if he will pick up the baton. He doesn't. He continues to spoon muesli into his mouth and chew carefully. She didn't realise how annoying Mark's eating habits were until she moved in with him. It's weird. 
They must have eaten hundreds of meals at the same table over the years. Aware that Fiona was often on her own, Kylie was forever inviting her to Sunday lunch, Saturday brunch, or even a midweek supper if she thought Fiona was at a loose end. Over all those years, Fiona never found Mark's mastication irritating. She didn't even notice it. But now she does notice it. The deliberate, difficult way he chews each mouthful over and over again before he finally gulps it down. It's as though he finds it hard to swallow. Maybe he does. Death affects everyone differently. Mark is losing weight. He looks gaunt and grey. Technically, he could still have worked through lockdown. A landscape gardener who operates as a sole trader could have safely carried on. He didn't do so. He moped around the house. Some days he didn't even get out of bed. As he was no longer doing the manual work that provided his physical exercise, his muscles have quickly turned slack. He used to ooze a taut, healthy strength. Now he appears flattened, diminished, sunken. Fiona, on the other hand, is ballooning. Since Kylie's death, she has gained six kilograms, nearly a stone. She used to be a woman who watched her weight, who noted fat and calorie intake, refused puddings whilst longing for them, said no to cheese, and settled for black coffee when the cream-laden lattes were obviously more appealing. Now, at this critical moment, her willpower had deserted her. Her hand seems to be operating independently of her mind. It repeatedly stretches for an extra biscuit or a second helping. It opens the fridge and cupboards and reaches for sausage rolls, chocolate, handfuls of crisps and nuts. She crams the food into her mouth. Unlike Mark, she barely takes the time to chew, but gulps down the goodies greedily, desperate to satiate the pangs of hunger to fill the feeling of hollowness. The void. Seb is staring at her. His expression is a complicated mix of hope and embarrassment and fear. He wants to believe his mother is still alive, but his older brother has bluntly and repeatedly told him that's hardly possible. He's ashamed of appearing naive and silly. He's terrified an adult is going to tell him not to hope. That would be worse. Fiona doesn't know what to say. She doesn't know how much hope she ought to nurture. Is it kind to allow the boy to continue to fantasize? Dan Janssen has been charged with the abduction and murder of Kylie. He has clever lawyers who have managed to negotiate that he remains on bail in Holland until the trial. Even the trial is likely to take place over Zoom. He is obviously trying to avoid extradition. But she doesn't think he'll be able to wriggle out of a conviction. There is a great deal of evidence against him. Even without a body, everyone is expecting him to go down for murder. Everyone, that is, except for Seb, aged just twelve. He believes his stepmother, the only mother he has ever known, to be alive. Or even if he daren't quite believe it, he is still daring to hope for it. Long for it. Fiona does not believe Kylie is alive. Nor does she hope for it or long for it. She knows Kylie is dead. Because Fiona killed her. Chapter 13 Mark can we, Dad? Can we look for Mum? Mark is aware of his younger son's intense gaze burning into the crown of his dipped head. He is bent over his breakfast and has to force himself to straighten up and look his boy in the eye. It's an effort. He doesn't know what to say. Mark thinks parenting is a prolonged and impossible test. Single parenting is that, but with big doses of isolation. 
There are always so many questions, and he just doesn't have the answers. When they were little, he asked himself endless questions. Things like, should you take away that pacifier now he is approaching two years old? Should you cut back your hours at work to spend more time with them? Is he an especially picky eater? A noticeably poor sleeper? Is he shyer than his friends? Is he rougher? Is he willfully ignoring you, or has he got poor hearing? Will he remember when you lost it and yelled and yelled at him because he mushed his peas into the carpet? Will your pockets be deep enough? Will your knowledge be wide enough? Will your advice be wise enough? Will your love be endless enough? You just want to bloody share it. The responsibility. The weight. Before it crushes you. So when he met Lee, he thought all his dreams had come true. He really did. She was able to absorb so much of the responsibility. She wanted to, it was obvious. She slipped right into their lives, made to measure. And since she couldn't have her own kids, well, she was just thrilled to step up to the plate and mother with absolute conviction and devotion. She was sensible, pragmatic. That first time they met, when Seb fell from the slide at the local park and landed smack on his head, cut wide open, blood gushing out, Mark froze. It was all too similar to that moment he found Francis at the bottom of the stairs, bleeding and broken. But Lee was just wonderful. Obviously a trained first aider, or so he thought at the time. Afterwards, she confided to him that she was acting on instinct and didn't really know what she was doing for sure. Although, just two weeks after the accident in the park, she took herself off on a first aid course because she said, on that occasion, they had been lucky, that her instincts had proved correct, but in the future she wanted to be sure that she could look after them. If ever one of the boys was stung or scalded or choking or drowning, that was what she'd said. Lee saw a future for them straight away, and she started to plan for it. She was very practical that way, willing to learn. She also went on a few cookery courses and a good parenting one. He thought that was a bit crazy at first. A course to tell you how to bring up your own kids. He had to hide his amusement, but as the months went on, turned into years... He had to admit she did make their home life calmer and happier. She always seemed to be in control. She talked a lot about positive discipline and enabling the boys to fulfil their potential. She often spoke about equipping them with the skills that would set them up for life. It was clear she was desperate to do a good job. She was the best stepmother they could have imagined quite unlike any of the stepmothers in the fairy tales. She oozed kindness, generosity, patience. He stopped asking himself so many questions, and Lee was brilliant at answering the ones the boys started to ask. Until she fucked off and married someone else, that is. Mark stares at his younger son, who is all wide-eyed and expectant, waiting for him to come up with an answer. Why can't the kid accept the facts and just enjoy a day trip to a theme park? He glances at Fiona, but she remains annoyingly mute. Normally she prattles on in a more or less constant manner, but apparently she's not going to answer this one. It's not her fault. She doesn't know what to say. Why should she? She's just a family friend. Ironically, Mark is aware that if Lee was here, she would know what to say to Seb. She'd know which words would comfort him, manage his expectations, allow room for grief, and then, eventually, acceptance. Although, obviously, if Lee was here, they wouldn't be having this conversation. The thought punches him, deep down low. He keeps saying he's over it, 
He wants to move on, but Christ Almighty, his wife was a bloody bigamist. He feels such a fool. He still can't get his head around it. Not really. Who could? Fiona would hate it if she knew he thought of her as simply a family friend. He's aware she thinks she's more than that to him. Not an unreasonable idea, as they are having sex. But maybe an unrealistic notion, as they are not sleeping together. They have tight, needy, functional sex, silently in the dead of night so as not to wake the boys. It's neither pleasant nor unpleasant. It's not about that sort of thing at all. They have sex, so Mark can prove to himself that he's still alive. Still here. It answers a need. His need. But it's not about needing Fiona. Sometimes they have sex to release tension. Frustration. At least he does. He has no idea why Fiona has sex with him. They never talk about it. Afterwards, he always gets up and goes downstairs to sleep on the sofa bed in the sitting room. The sex helps him fall asleep. Sleep is elusive, and so anything that helps him with that is a good thing. Fiona has been amazing. Objectively, no one would deny that. She has kept the ship afloat. The main thing in her favour is undoubtedly that she's stuck around. Seriously, it sounds like nothing, but in the end, it is everything. The success of every relationship depends on that, ultimately. It boils down to whether a person is prepared to stay or not. She stayed when it was really hard. When everyone just cried or sulked or sat in a horrible, impenetrable silence. She cooked the boys their favourite meals. Of course, she knew what they were. She'd watched Lee make them often enough. She picked up the reins on Seb's homeschooling, gently cajoling him to at least join the Zoom. He isn't that invested in doing well at the moment, but she has provided some sort of routine. She does the laundry, suggests what they should watch on TV. She made a birthday cake for Ollie. When she first arrived with her large suitcase, Mark's eyes flicked to it and somehow betrayed his surprise at the volume of stuff she was bringing with her. I've never mastered packing light, she said with a laugh. Look, I don't have to stay. I'm not being presumptuous. I just thought we needed choices. Mark didn't choose. Not exactly. The government did. They locked everyone down. He could have asked her to leave at any point. He could still. He sometimes thinks he should, but he never does. It requires a level of energy that he can't muster. Yes, Fiona has been objectively amazing, and yet Mark is ambivalent about what is happening with her. Unclear. Undecided. Sometimes he catches sight of her. Maybe she's in the kitchen, putting dirty clothes in the washer, or it's the end of the day, and she hands him a glass of red wine, and he feels so close to her. He finds himself telling her that she is his rock, that he doesn't know what he would do without her. And he means it. As he says it, he means it. Because sometimes her presence is so normal, so known. He feels like he's been taken back in time to when he didn't know that Lee was a bitch and a betrayer a time when Lee was alive. Then he is so grateful to Fiona for just providing that glimpse of normality, past or present or future. He's not sure where she fits in, but on those sorts of days he manages to give her the type of sex that makes her come. He isn't proud of himself for this inconsistency, but he isn't ashamed either. He is entitled, considering everything. He has to make a new life for himself and for the boys. Other times, he loathes the sight of her. 
sees her and for a fleeting insane moment imagines pushing her out the window or bundling her up in a sack and throwing her away in a river, maybe. Insanity, obviously. He'd never actually do that. It's not a conscious thought, just his subconscious messing with him. He's under a lot of stress. On some days, her being a blatant reminder of everything to do with Lee is just too cruelly painful. He is divorcing Lee. She's missing, most probably dead. But to keep things tidy, he's divorcing a dead woman. A woman who was most probably murdered by her other husband. His lawyer has advised him it's the cleanest thing to do, in the absence of a body, and if he wants to move on. Which he does. It's complicated, and he resents this mess Lee has brought to his door. It's a good job he has Fiona to fall back on, because his Tinder profile would be ridiculous. Marital status, currently divorcing my assumed-to-be-dead wife, who was murdered by her husband, not me, I hasten to add, the other one, because she was also a bigamist. What's the emoji that accompanies that? Smiley winking face? Laughing crying face? As he's thinking of what to say next to Seb, how to answer his question about looking for his mum, Ollie throws down a spiky challenge. You mean you want to spend your first day of freedom looking for Lee's body? Ollie doesn't call her mum. Hasn't for a while. A source of pain for Lee in the last few months of her life. Or at least, so she said at the time, she was always going on about it, rowing, grumbling, sometimes even crying. But now, Mark wonders, who can believe a word that came out of her mouth? Either way, it turns out she only had herself to blame for Ollie's sudden distance towards her. The reason he stopped calling her mum was that, unbeknown to Mark, Ollie had discovered his stepmother's infidelity. Or at least some of it. He thought Lee was having an affair with Dan Janssen. Apparently, last summer, he'd spotted them on the street, strolling along hand in hand as though they didn't have a care in the world. Of course, the teen didn't, in his wildest dreams, imagine that his stepmother was married to this other man. Who would? Ollie is a very angry young man. Very angry indeed. Mark was so relieved when the police started questioning Dan. He hadn't seriously suspected his own son of hurting Lee, but he hadn't ruled it out either. Suspicion had billowed in every direction, like a dust cloud, silent but tangible. It is a terrible thing to think of your own child, but apparently not impossible. Dad, tell him! Seb looks close to tears. He often is. The wetness sits in his eyes like a film of mist. He used to be such a cheerful, happy-go-lucky boy. Bloody Lee. She is to blame. She ruined things. Tell him what? That mom isn't dead. That we should be looking for her, not her body. It is as though a bolt of lightning has sparked through everyone around the breakfast table. Fiona, Mark and Ollie jolt into rigid, upright positions. Stiff, yet unsure. Seb also looks brittle, as well as challenging. Another wrong word, and they all might shatter. Mark has explained to the boys that Dan Janssen is being charged with murder. At the time, Seb commented, But they haven't found her body, have they? No, Mark admitted. He didn't mean to convey hope. He was just stating a fact. Now he scrabbles around for the words that Seb needs to hear. He has to explain the bleak reality, the stark probability. Before he thinks of the right words, Seb adds, You don't think she's dead, do you, Dad? 
Mark longs to give his son firm reassurances, but in all conscience, he can't do that. Mark does think Lee is dead. He wishes the police would simply knock on the door and announce that they found her body, or at the very least, that Dan has confessed to murdering her. It isn't that he wants her dead. He simply doesn't want the uncertainty to stretch on any more. He can't stand this limbo. It's damaging. Draining. But Seb seems to cling to hope, even as Mark drowns under a wave of despair. Seb speaks of Lee every day. Several times. He often starts the day commenting quite cheerfully, I think Mum might come home today and then ends it with a less confident but equally insistent rally at bedtime. Well, maybe tomorrow. He obviously believes there is a chance that she will simply stroll through the door, shame-faced, possibly, but somehow expecting a welcome. A welcome Seb would give, and one he believes Mark and Ollie ought to as well. He is young for his age. Most twelve-year-olds would have clocked the reality by now. Lee babied him. A mistake, especially since she hasn't stuck around to see the job through. The thought is unfair. Mark knows it, but doesn't give a fuck. He hasn't got the emotional space to think about the things she did see through. The things that secured Seb's loyalty and love. She saw the boys through their first days at school. Ollie went in with a grim, uncomfortable fortitude, an attitude that slowly but surely won him many friends, although he was never what you'd call an impressive student. Seb bounced in, believing that he'd love it. After all, that was what his brother and Lee had promised. As it happened, he didn't really settle. Lee spent hours with the teacher trying to ease the transition from home to school by volunteering as a class reader and helping out in assemblies so he'd see her face around. She let him trade his dinosaur lunchbox for a Captain America one, even though he'd insisted on the dinosaur one just weeks before. She'd spent ages helping both of them learn their alphabet, tie their shoelaces. Mark had to admit she had a lot of patience for that sort of thing. She took them to swimming lessons and taught them how to ride their bikes, he remembers her running up the street, straining to hold the saddle as the bike wobbled precariously. She endlessly repeated words of encouragement as the boys took control of the pedals, the steering, and learnt to trust the road and themselves. Yes, you can do it! That's it! And eventually, you're doing it on your own! You're riding your bike! She also stuck on the elastoplasts and administered the magic kisses that made it all better when, inevitably, they did tumble off. The trick is getting straight back on again, she whispered to the tearful, shocked boys as they sat at the kitchen table with bloody knees and bruised pride. Another first was Disneyland. Her idea. Mark remembers dreading it. Disney, right? It's a Marmite situation. You are either into life-size puppets of mice, ducks, and bears, or you're not. Lee was. Mark wonders how many times she insisted they must enjoy life. How many times she had made that happen. Often a lot. Thousands. How could she have done this to them? gone and got herself murdered because she married a bloody psycho when she was already married to him. Why hadn't he been enough for her, him and the boys? If only she had been grateful and happy with her lot, she'd still be alive. Ollie wouldn't be angry and dark. Seb wouldn't be tearful and tortured. Mark himself wouldn't be sleeping with Fiona. None of them would be in this total mess. It was all her fault. This is the first time Seb has asked his father outright whether he believes Lee to be alive. Perhaps his hope is beginning to eke away, edged out by the sun rising and setting repeatedly on her total absence. And he's wanting his dad to bolster him. How is Mark supposed to answer?
there isn't a parenting self-help book that covers this topic. Most of them are about dealing with drugs, alcohol, and sexual propriety. God, those problems seem positively attractive in comparison to the one he is facing. Before he can find the words, Ollie explodes. If she's not dead, where the hell is she? He demands. He stands up, and his sudden and violent movement knocks over his chair. It clatters to the floor. He leaves the room without bothering to pick it up. Chapter 14 Dan Dan quits the daily status meeting, and as the cool, pale faces of his lawyers vanish from the screen, he leans back in his chair, stretches his arms above his head, takes up a lot of room. While he can. The thought hovers in his subconscious. He envies the lawyers. They can quit this madness. Following today's 36-minute consultation, they charge their time in six-minute blocks. They can move on to another client. Another mess, maybe, but always someone else's mess. He can't escape so easily. Can he escape at all? He tries to recenter. He knows that his mother and father, possibly even his younger brother and sister, will all be in the kitchen endeavouring to pretend they are not listening in to his online meeting with his legal team. They will want to appear unconcerned, assured and positive. They are not. Like him, they are desperately worried. He must appear calm and collected. If he leads with that attitude, they might be convinced by his act and find the strength to follow. The fact is, the entire family are terrified he is going to be convicted. Their long, toned limbs, tanned bodies and glossy blondness aren't quite proving to be the shield they usually are. Primarily, the concern is for him. What will happen to him if he is sent to prison, deprived of his liberty, stripped of his reputation, housed with dangerous, desperate men? His mother has nightmares about him being beaten by burly, brutal criminals. The other day, she asked him what it meant to be made into someone's bitch. Presumably, she had been introduced to this phrase over a Zoom bridge party, or at a socially distanced picnic in the garden hosted by her nosy, excitable friends. He hadn't known how to explain it to her. His very silence told her everything. Oh my God, I see, she gasped and put her hand to her mouth. Her eyes had grown large, like dinner plates. She quickly tried to recover her poise because the von Janssens know the importance of composure. Well, it won't come to that. This case will be thrown out of court, I'm sure of it. She's lying to herself or him. Both. They can't be sure of any such thing. It's a strong case. It's looking very bad for him. His father is anxious too, yes, about Dan, but also about what effect the scandal will have on the share price of their business. The besmirched reputation of their family is of course a secondary concern, but it is a concern all the same. His younger siblings are scared for him too, and maybe... This breaks his heart, also a little scared of him. They don't a hundred percent know he is innocent. Only he knows that. In the whole world, only him and the person who actually did abduct and murder Kai know for sure that he is innocent. It's a lonely position to hold. None of his family have asked him outright whether he did it, they wouldn't want to cause offence by verbalising any doubt. They have to appear to believe him and support him entirely, because that's what has got them through PR crises in the past. A united front. A family standing together. Frankly, he wishes they would ask him, because it would clear the air. He'd like to say it out loud. He'd like to be believed. 
he did not kill his wife. He has tried to address the matter of his innocence with his father. He found it impossible to be direct. The words stuck in his throat like needles. If he blatantly insisted on declaring his innocence to his family, he could imagine his father muttering, Our dust protest too much, methinks. His father is fond of old English quotes and idioms. It's a habit Dan has picked up, possibly in an effort to impress his pop. Instead, he skirted the matter by commenting, I think my lead lawyer might do a better job if he knew I was innocent. Don't be an idiot, Dan. It doesn't matter. He's not Atticus Finch, Mr. Janssen Sr. replied shortly. Your extortionately expensive lawyer is the best of the best. What he can prove, disprove, or even cast doubt upon is all that matters. What he believes is irrelevant. Dan felt his father's impatience. He just wants to hear him say he believes in his innocence. For fuck's sake. His own father. He straightens his shoulders and decides what he must do next. He won't go into the kitchen and make coffee and small talk with his family. He can't take on their energy right this moment, or rather their lack of it. He is sad that he's brought his usually fearless, forward-propelling family to this state of apprehension and apathy. But he can't risk his own already depleted resources being further sapped. He must focus. He must stay persuasive, charming and decisive if he's going to be convincing. He has admitted to the police that he screwed Fiona a couple of times, even though he was with Kai. Not his finest moment, but bloody hell, not a hanging offence last time he checked. At first, he thought that was Fiona's motivation for ruining his life, crucifying him. Just that, right there. Simply a case of a disgruntled woman deciding to take out the wife when she discovered her existence. Extreme, but not unheard of. But they were best friends. As soon as he was told that, he knew he was in much deeper and murkier waters. Obviously, he'd had no idea the two women were connected in any way when he shagged Fiona. He's not an animal. He wouldn't deliberately shit on his own doorstep. Over these past few months, he spent some time wondering when Fiona worked out the truth, that he was not only married, but married to her best friend. The best friend she thought was happily married to Mark Fletcher. When this was revealed to her is important. Fiona must have hated Kai. She must have been convulsed with jealousy when she discovered Kai had two husbands. Fiona hasn't even one. And after she punished Kai for having an excess, who better to hang the murder on than the husband? Suspicion always pulls at the door of the spouse, right? People want it to be the spouse. How messed up is that? The real end to the fairy tale that people crave isn't a happily ever after, at least not for others. They want a grisly end. The ultimate betrayal and unthinkable brutality. People are disappointing. He doesn't know who Fiona hated most, him or his late wife, but he knows she has screwed them both. The police have questioned him repeatedly, and during the questioning, he has gleaned some idea as to what Kai was put through in her last few days. She was bound, beaten, perhaps even poisoned, certainly drugged, most probably starved. They worked this out, from blood and stool samples found in the place she was held captive. He can't think about it. It tears him in two. The thought of Kai enduring that is disgusting to him. He wants to vomit, or punch a wall, or Fiona. Yeah, as unmanly as that sounds, as brutal and basic, he wants to hurt Fiona. Kill her. It is obvious to him that Fiona planted his personal possessions in her home near the sea, a place he hasn't ever visited, 
Why would he? He isn't the sort of man who has to drive four hours for an illicit shag. Clearly, Fiona took a wine glass from his apartment, one with his fingerprints on, and then left it in the bungalow for the police to find. It looks bad for him that he said he'd never visited there since they discovered his possessions on the property, but he could only tell the truth. Fiona had access to the protein bars that he bought and put in his own kitchen cupboard. She probably stole them when his back was turned and then fed them to Kai. He tried to explain all this to the police, but it didn't go well. He can see that his explanations are convoluted, hard to accept and easy to dismiss. And how do you explain the phones registered to Kai Janssen and Lee Fletcher turning up in your wardrobe? Constable Tanner demanded with excited aggression. Fiona, no doubt, hid them there last time she visited. Dan's tone was less agitated. He wanted to appear calm, but he wondered whether he simply sounded like a psychopath. He was a wealthy man. The slightly gauche younger cop would be dying to peg him as egocentric, incapable of loving, lacking in remorse and shame, a grandiose sense of self-worth. Very clickbait. And when was the last time Fiona Phillipson visited you at your apartment? Asked D.C. Clements. Saturday the 21st of March, Dan admitted with a sigh. The D.C. twitched her mouth in a strange way. He tried to decode it. Disapproval? Disbelief? I have an explanation for all the evidence, he insisted. He heard his father's voice in his head quoting Agatha Christie. To rush into explanations is always a sign of weakness. He wished his dad's voice would fuck off out of his head. You do. Long, elaborate explanations, but in my experience, the simplest explanation is usually the correct one, replied the DC with an exasperated sigh. It was clear she wanted him to confess. She wanted clarity, certainty, and closure. That was unfortunate. Dan had initially held quite some confidence in D.C. Clements. She'd struck him as tenacious, right, the sort who prided herself on being a truth seeker. Now she seemed to simply want this off her plate. Why would I have kept the phones in my home? I'm smarter than that. He was aware that unfortunately, when he was afraid or threatened, he had a tendency to sound like a tosser. It was his curse. Maybe you were planning to dispose of them, but just didn't have time, said Tanner with a sneer. I'd have got rid of them straight away, not left them lying around to incriminate me, obviously. Dan's lawyer coughed at that point. Apparently, stating that something is obvious is antagonistic. Detailing how you would manage a crime, risky. The lawyer later said to him, you have to act as smart as you say you are. Dan didn't like the comment, but he saw the sense of it. The problem is that the explanation of what must really have happened is elaborate, torturous even. This situation is so murky, so messy. Fiona was Kai's best friend. She had been for years. Years before he married Kai, years before Kai married the other man even. That sort of history is dangerous, lethal. Now he has to consider that her approaching him in the first place was not a coincidence. She said she'd first seen him in the lobby of his apartment building when she was there pitching for an interior design job, and then she'd found him on a dating app with an extremely tight geographical location search. It seemed reasonable enough at the time. Plausible. Besides, she approached him when he was feeling horny. Perhaps the convenience of instant gratification made him sloppy, less rigorous or suspicious than he should have been. He had a working theory that Fiona was in love with Mark Fletcher and had been for several years. He thought Fiona was jealous of Kai, or rather Lee, not because she wanted Dan, but because she wanted Mark. He tried not to let his pride smart under this blow. Fiona had discovered that her friend was betraying Mark, 
worse yet, that she was married to someone else, and she wanted to make her pay. Could it be that way around? Or, and this theory was only just beginning to form in his mind, maybe Fiona and Mark had been in it together all along. Maybe they'd been having an affair, and when they discovered Kai's bigamy, they decided murder was easier than divorce, or at least more profitable. It would certainly be more satisfying if they managed to hang the murder on Dan. Dan has tried to explain all these theories to his lawyers. They admit that the scenarios he has presented are possible. But I can't go as far as probable. Dan feels sullied, morally doubted, grubby. And since the comment about acting as smart as he believes himself to be, he thinks his intellect is being doubted too which is disproportionately galling. He feels trapped. So he has taken matters into his own hands. Chapter 15 Stacy The early evening is chillier than we've come to expect, and the clouds are swelling up from the sea. We've had a run of hot days when the sun has shone with real determination, and so the coolness is a shock, even though it shouldn't be. I remember that a warm July isn't guaranteed. Feeling cold and rain in the air is just as likely. Grey British drizzle that leaves everything feeling saggy and disappointing is familiar to me. Although the crocs I wear are not. Sidebar, I can see how crocs are practical and useful when stomping along beach tracks into rock pools, etc. But I struggle to imagine the moment when I handed over hard-earned cash for a pair. They are so damned ugly. Wellingtons and flip-flops seem to have my shoreside shoe needs covered, surely. Yet at some point I must have thought differently because I own a pair of red crocs. Furthermore... They are decorated with smiling daisy charms. It's unfathomable to me. I am unfathomable to me. Dad and I are enjoying what we both believe to be one of the last days of silence in our little cove. We technically own the tiny strip of beach from our garden to the sea, and Dad has a sign-up that says, Private Land but he admits it's not much of a deterrent. Determined day-trippers do spread out their picnic blankets regardless. Tomorrow, the vans selling chips and ice cream will reappear and park up within spitting distance of our cove. The shops just a bit further up the coast, selling colourful airbeds, cheap cotton sarongs and buckets shaped like castles, will open too. And inevitably, masses of tourists will start flooding back to our tiny, tucked out of the way spot. I'm delighted at the prospect of this rediscovery. Super Saturday seems exactly that to me. But Dad is wary and talks about it like it's Armageddon. You still need to continue to be shielded, Stacy. We have to be careful, he insists. I don't want hundreds of people setting up camp right outside our door, bringing God knows what with them. I understand why he is protective of my space. I've agreed that obviously I can't go to shops and restaurants yet. I'm not going to actively seek out the masses. But I can't help but feel a little excited that some level of normality might return to my life. To everyone's. I'm not going to lick them, Dad. I just think it will be nice being able to see new faces. Yes, but if they're on our beach, it means you can't be. You'll have to stay indoors. Well, I don't need to go that far. I can stay in the garden. He eyes me warily. I can watch them from a distance. It will make a change from watching the waves. I turn and do exactly that right now. The waves struggle up the beach, backwards and forwards. They dump a layer of fresh shingle each time, 
the debris inching towards our home, the water swallowing up the beach. It's the fag end of the day. The wind has a definite nip of salt to it. If I put my tongue out, I can taste it mixed up with the grit of sand that is blowing about. We have about 30 minutes before the sand vanishes. I know, as I watch the tides every evening and have become quite the expert when it comes to timing the ebb and flow. I am itching to get a life. I literally can't wait to feast my eyes on something unpredictable. Someone new. Someone other than the old woman in the wheelchair. Because every day it is the same. I watch the tides, and the old woman watches me. In the morning, when I take my walks with just Ronnie for company, I've seen her idling in the distance. She's nearly always on the narrow plank walkway that follows the line of the beach. As she's in a wheelchair, she can't come any closer to the water's edge. We haven't spoken, which seems odd to me. But then nothing is normal at the moment, so I can't quite gauge it. I'm recovering from cancer. She's elderly. Following government guidelines, of course, we must keep our distance. On the third or fourth occasion that I noticed her, I did wave. A self-conscious, discreet hand gesture that I admit didn't commit to being out-and-out out friendly. More of an acknowledgement that we were both in the same vicinity. That we often are. I don't know if she saw my wave. She certainly did not return it. She's not usually around in the evenings when I'm with Dad. Seeing her now, in the distance prompts me to ask him, Who is that woman in the chair, Dad? Do you know her? My father lifts his large, paw-like hand and waves in her direction. His wave is broad and open. He uses his entire arm, as though he is stranded on a desert island and trying to catch the attention of a passing ship. Unmissable. The woman nods tightly in response, but keeps her bony hands clasped around the travel blanket that lies over her knees. That's Prue McCullen. She was your teacher in junior school. I look again at the old woman, to see if this new piece of information causes anything to shift, to see if I might recall her features. Shall we go and say hello? You know, safely, socially distanced and all that, I suggest. Dad hesitates, then explains, Poor woman. She isn't what she once was. She's often confused. Used to be sharp as a pin. She's a great pal of Giles Hughes's mother, Heidi. He rolls his eyes and throws out a funny mock grimace. Oh, I see. Well, maybe that explains why she's always glowering at me. Yes, she's always been one to hold an opinion and a grudge adds dad with a grin. It's been over a decade, I point out, sighing. Well, we haven't had anything more exciting happen around these parts since you did the full-on runaway bride stunt, so you're still the talk of the town, darling. At least you were of interest to the older, gossipy lot. Grinning, dad encourages me. Come on, don't let that frighten you off. Let's go and say hello. I pretend to be interested in playing with Ronnie. He has his jaw clamped around a stick, and I play at taking it off him, causing him to prance and leap, kicking up sand as he does so. I hide behind the attention he is drawing and examine the old woman more carefully. She wears her hair in a long plait over her right shoulder. I have recently started to dream about carrying around a pair of hairdressing scissors and chopping off people's hair. It's not just because I'm practically bald and want to even the score. It's because everyone else is so unkempt, since hairdressers have been closed for months now. Super Saturday will see them open their doors. And although I personally won't be visiting, I'm as delighted as it's possible to be. Even newsreaders on TV look a mess. Apparently, they have to style their own hair and apply their own makeup before they go live. 
shock, horror. I suppose some people might find the stripping back honest and refreshing. I just find it depressing. I think I can surmise from this reaction that I like glamour. I am currently very far from glamorous, but I still value it in others. This attitude most likely comes from living in Paris, where people take grooming seriously. When I watch the news, I find myself losing track of what they're saying as I fantasize about trimming their dead ends. I'd like to slice off this Prue McCullen's plait, which might once have been golden or ebony and a source of pride, but is now white and wiry. Weight has settled on her breasts and around her trunk, although her arms and legs are skinny. She's wearing pale blue tracksuit bottoms, cheap and unsuitable for her age, but I presume easy to slip on and off if she needs to get to the loo in a hurry. Her knees jut at sharp right angles, yet her grey shirt is too tight and gapes at the buttons, exposing her flesh which is wrinkled and vulnerable. She looks angry, pale, depleted by age or illness. As I stare at her, she catches my eye. The look she launches causes me to shudder. No, it's okay, I mumble. She doesn't look like she's in a chatty mood. Dad glances over towards the scowling pensioner. Well, you might be right. Another day. He looks out at the sea, and no doubt reaches the same conclusion I have. The walk along the beach is almost over. It's time to find higher ground or go home. I think I'm ready to head back now, he says. I might just walk Ronnie a little further on up the cliff path. I only gave him a short walk this morning, and I feel I ought to make it up to him. Fine. Well, don't be too long. It's colder than usual tonight. I won't be. Dad hesitates, and I think for a moment he's going to offer to come with me. Should I put the kettle on? Or open a bottle to let it breathe? You could have a small glass. The latter, I reply with a grin. I watch Dad walk away, his head bent into the wind, and I feel a pinprick of guilt. I know he wanted me to return to the cottage with him. Ronnie doesn't really need the exercise. He has already had a perfectly adequate stretch. But the truth is, I want to talk to Prue McCullen. I realise that she is likely to be a bit snippy with me, since she is a friend of the mother of the man I jilted. But after days of silently casing one another out, I think I ought to face her. I'd simply prefer to take a dressing down on my own, rather than in front of Dad. If this Prue woman is rude to my face, Dad will get protective of me. I know he will. There might be a scene, something that escalates and causes more gossip. I can do without the aggro. Hello! I yell. The old woman doesn't respond. Perhaps she didn't hear me. Maybe my voice flew away with the wind and was drowned by the sea. Or maybe she is ignoring me. Hello! I yell again, louder this time. I pull my jacket closer to my body and walk towards Prue McCullen, not meeting her gaze but instead watching my wet shoe prints in the sand. When I'm in front of her wheelchair, I look up. Who are you? she demands. Stacy Jones. She squints at me. Come here at once, she snaps. There's something in her voice that makes me follow her instruction, despite medical advice and government imperative. I suppose as she taught me as a child in my formative years, I had that response instilled into me. I move closer to her. Kneel so that we are eye to eye. She's clearly not only old, but unwell. Most likely dementia has thrown a veil of confusion over her. She examines me carefully, 
her cold gaze rolling over and through me. Whatever it is she's looking for, she doesn't seem to find it. I empathize with her loss. I want to tell her she doesn't need to be embarrassed. I don't know or recognize things either. What are you doing? She demands. Taking the dog for a walk. No, I mean, what are you doing here in Kenneth Jones's house? I heard Stacy Jones had run off to Paris. Her voice is a complex mix of accusation, irritation, and challenge. Nothing good. I was in Paris. I've been ill, I explain carefully. I've come back to live with my dad while I recuperate. She moves her head slowly from left to right, as though she is denying what I've just told her. I've been watching you with Kenneth Jones. Yes, I know. I've seen you. I was going to come and say hello, but... I don't finish the sentence. She shakes her head again, faster this time. Impatient. He's a good man, Kenneth Jones is. Suffered a lot. Yes, I sigh. Wife ran off, no better than she ought to be. What can I say to that? Brought his daughter up on his own. Made the best of it, he did. Managed quite admirably. Her vocabulary doesn't fit her disheveled state, and I feel sorry for her. I guess her carers are more concerned with practicalities than dignity. Elasticated waistbands, rather than a smart, belted pair of trousers. My sympathy is somewhat tested when she adds, But she turned out to be a dreadful, selfish type. That's me. I'm his daughter. I try not to take offence. I remember the woman is elderly. Some older people do have a tendency to be abrupt. I suppose they think they've earned it. Her gaze sharpens, and her eyebrows rise in surprise. Stacy Jones did a flip to broke his heart. He retired then. Damned shame, he was a brilliant GP. I don't bother contradicting her, explaining that my father gave up being a GP when my mother left. Old people do get muddled about dates. He's been through enough. I wouldn't want to see anyone take advantage of him, she mutters crossly. I'm not. I'm... Do you know who I am? She demands, interrupting me. You're Prue McCullen, my old school teacher. He told you that. Well, yes. I don't actually remember you. I don't remember anyone or anything. Her teeth seem too long for her face, and they're yellow. She's not the generation who have ever considered teeth whitening strips. It's madness for me to feel nervous of her. But somehow, I want to charm her. Make her my friend like in one of those quirky little indie movies. Old cancer girl befriends wheelchair-bound dementia victim, Oscar contender. Miss McCullen has other ideas. Bullshit. You don't remember me because you've never met me before. You are not Stacy Jones. Who am I, then? You're the dead woman, she replies. Chapter 16. Dan. He is breaking the conditions of his bail. He knows that. It's not that he doesn't care. It's the opposite. He has never cared about anything more. He is a man who has always had a colossal amount of self-belief. The sort of man who assumes he knows better than anyone else about most things, and on the whole, this attitude has served him well. He is sure he's doing the right thing, no matter what the lawyers advise, no matter what the law dictates. 
technically, he's tampering with witnesses. He doesn't see it that way. He's simply reaching out, utilizing a resource. Fiona obviously killed Kai. He is being set up, and only she could have done it. He has to prove her guilt in order to prove his own innocence. He thinks Kai's boys might help him do that, either inadvertently or through deliberate cooperation. He's been monitoring both the boys for weeks now. They were not difficult to track. It still blows his mind that she had sons, that she was a mother. He knows she didn't have these boys inside her body, push them out into the world, feed them from her own breast, hell, he simply can't imagine all of that. But anyway, she was a mother. She mothered for years and must have wiped noses, taken the kids to school, to the dentist, to sports fixtures, all the things his own mother did for him when he was a child. It's extraordinary. And amongst all the many odd things this situation had presented, this is such a peculiar thing to get his head around because Kai never struck him as the mothering type. She always insisted she didn't want children. Now he understands. She didn't want children with him. It would have been a complication too far. He doesn't know how he feels about that. Women usually want a slice of him, as much of him as they can get, in fact. When he was a young man... Some even tried to play fast and loose with contraception in an attempt to trap him. He soon learnt to never allow for that possibility. He read all the press reports about the case and they quickly led him to Ollie, aged 16, Seb, aged 12. With their names, ages and locality, it didn't take long to find details of the schools they attended the swim clubs and scout groups the younger one participated in, the local football club that the elder went to. From the latter, he found details of past fixtures and team photos. The names of the players were listed proudly in Black Times New Roman font, kids who were potentially in Ollie's friendship group. Dan searched Instagram and found five of them with open accounts. Unguarded. One of these was a gamer who liked to post his Warzone progress. His gaming name was Shoot to Kill. Dan started playing Warzone 2 and became Shoot to Kill's gaming friend. From there, he was able to access a list of all the friends that Shoot to Kill played with. Ollie's gamer name was Slayer123. Soon, Dan was playing Warzone with his dead wife's son. Jesus, there really ought to be a law against what the papers print. Far too much detail is given. His motive for finding the Fletcher boys was honest. Well, honest enough. But imagine if some paedophile wanted to track them down. There are plenty of people with nefarious motives. Do parents have a clue how easy it is for their kids to be found, targeted? It makes him angry, because he feels strangely protective of Kai's boys. She is dead, and can't keep looking after them. But he feels annoyed that no one else seems to be. It's clear from the press reports that their father has swiftly shacked up with Fiona. Neither of them appear to be keeping tabs on the kids. He knows this because he is talking to both boys now. The younger one has recently started playing Warzone as well. Certificate 18, Dan notes. Seb was thrilled to be invited by one of Ollie's friends to become a friend of his too. The kids don't know who he is. They have no idea who they are really talking to. And even though they lie to him, it doesn't seem to enter their minds that he is lying to them. It's a convenience and a concern. Through the game chat, he has led them to believe that he's a 19-year-old Swedish skater gamer with ambitions to become an influencer, which means they think he is everyone, anyone, no one. 
He confesses that he's living at home with his parents, that he fills his days playing games, that he likes peri-peri chicken and watches Hot Ones on YouTube. It feels a bit grimy, pretending to be a teen to get access to their world. Basic catfishing. Dan Janssen is an upstanding alpha sort. A leader. A winner. A golden guy. People look up to him. Of course, he always had secret profiles when he was married to Kai. No one could have expected him to admit to his marital status on his dating sites. That would have been madness. But that standard trickery in relationships isn't unusual. What he's doing now, this level of amateur sleuthing with fake identities, seems beneath him. But then so is prison, and there is a serious chance that he'll end up there if he isn't careful. It isn't even a case of being careful. Careful is too recessive, too apathetic. He must be proactive. He must sort out this mess and prove his innocence. In Warzone, teams of four fight for survival on a vast map of Verdansk. A maximum of a hundred people can participate in one go. Throughout the game, players must work closely with each other to achieve their intended goal of surviving and winning. Parents universally dismiss video games. But Dan has started to appreciate that they can require a lot of team effort and cooperative strategy. At first, all he and Ollie talked about was game tactics. Using floor loot and gear works okay at first, but basically, man, you need like $10,000 in cash right away. Go, go, go! Always plate up. Jeez, man, you need to make an effort to complete contracts. Ollie really knew his game, but Dan wasn't there for the kills, at least not the online ones. He knew he needed to find a way into conversations about other subjects. It wasn't easy. There were only limited opportunities because the squad was four people. He couldn't overfocus on Ollie, or it would be suspicious. He intermittently complained that he was bored of lockdown. Hardly news, or especially personal. Everyone felt the same way. During one game, when the other two squad members were dead and had quit, he seized the opportunity to ask Ollie, So, man, what is it that bugs you most about lockdown? I miss clubs, Ollie replied. Dan thought that this was most likely a lie. He very much doubted that Ollie, who had just turned 16, had been to any nightclubs, let alone enough to miss them. But of course, that is the joy of technology. No one has to be who they are if they don't want to be. Right, a kiss-ass venue with a throbbing mass of beat-hungry clubbers, Dan responded. He had no idea where this phrase came from, how the words formed in his head and tumbled out of his mouth. Something he'd heard in a movie, maybe. He didn't really understand what he'd said. Ollie didn't respond for a moment, and Dan felt his breathing tighten a fraction as he panicked that his youth speak was unconvincing. He'd been playing up to the fact that English was his second language, hoping any mistakes he made might be interpreted as a matter of translation, but his palms started to sweat as the silence stretched between them. The only sounds were game enemy footsteps, Plating, coughing in the gas. He couldn't afford to lose the boy's trust. Then, as he listened to an enemy loadout dropping, revives, shooting, reloading, he considered that as Ollie was pretending to be a couple of years older than he really was, he was maybe flailing about for the right way to respond. Finally, the boy countered, Yeah. I'm down with hard, fast, euphoric elements, trance, techno, fast house. On me! On me! Dan took a shot. The enemy fell before Ollie could be taken out. Dan moved the conversation on. What else do you miss? He asked. Honest burgers, replied Ollie, without skipping a beat. So good. I could live on them if I was allowed. It was a slip-up. 
an acknowledgement of his age and parental control. Dan decided to help him out, and to appear to believe him. Girlfriend won't let you write. Ollie made a noncommittal sound. So, who do you live with? You never said. Didn't I? Are you with your girlfriend, or friends? I don't have a girlfriend, like, at the moment. It's too much, right? No chance of hookup, anyhow. What's the point? So, do you live with your parents? Dan felt like he was attempting the verbal equivalent of a cat burglary. Stealth was all. Yeah, my dad and sort of stepmother. What's her name? He regretted the abrupt question as soon as he'd asked it. It was clumsy, but he desperately wanted to know who Ollie was referring to when he mentioned a sort of stepmother. Lee, the missing bigamist stepmom, or Fiona, his dad's new girlfriend and the killer. Ollie didn't reply, so Dan quickly corrected himself. I mean, what's she like? Do you get on? She's all right. They both quietly concentrated on landing a helicopter away from the highly populated spots, the hospital and the superstore. Then Dan muttered, I miss my girlfriend. Won't your parents let you see her? Are they, like, strict about the COVID rules? It's not that. Dan felt hot and cold at once. His chest hurt. Because you could get out the house, right? Meet her somewhere. Most of my friends are doing that. No, that's not possible. Why not? She's dead. Right. Sorry, Ollie said. He didn't splutter in shock or embarrassment as most 16-year-olds might have. Instead, he sounded weary. Dan allowed the thought to settle. He felt bad that he'd put this on the kid, another layer of grief. It wasn't fair of him, but he somehow had to blast past the small talk. At least he wasn't lying. Okay, so it wasn't a girlfriend who was dead. It was a wife. Or a non-wife. But he did miss her. Her body, her smile that little sound she made when she was on the edge of coming. He missed her funny habits, like keeping lists of dinner guests and seating plans, the fact that she appeared to be the epitome of sophistication but ate chicken legs with her fingers. He missed her telling him the plots of books she was excited about and knew he'd never read. And he was furious with her. Why the fuck did she have to be a bigamist and cause all this trouble? Why the fuck did she have to go get herself killed? He wished he hadn't met her. He'd had that thought a few times. Articulated it to his family, friends and lawyers, anyone who would listen. The secret he hadn't shared with anyone was that the reason he wished he hadn't met her was because if he hadn't, then most probably she'd still be alive. He hated her for humiliating him, for ruining his life. But he also loved her more intensely than he'd ever loved anything, and just wished she wasn't dead. Have you ever lost anyone? He asked. The beeping and shooting stopped. Ollie had left the game. Dan hasn't played with him since. If the PlayStation app on his mobile buzzes informing him that Slayer 123 is playing, he hops onto the game, but Slayer 123 immediately quits. It's clear Ollie is avoiding him. What is not clear is why. Usual teenage embarrassment, or something deeper, maybe suspicion. Dan burns in frustration. Seb is somewhat easier to deal with. Obviously, he lies about his age. He says he's 16, but he's honest about everything else. He talks about his dad and his brother, freely offering up their names. 
He says his dad is probably doing it with his mum's best friend. This was confided to Dan late one evening, when they were just hanging out together in the game lobby, as Seb checked his stats and changed his loadout. He doesn't think I know. He thinks I'm too young to work it out, even though I'm like 16 and everything, Seb added hurriedly. He isn't a convincing 16-year-old. He conveys uncomplicated integrity and flat desperation. Both betray him for the age he is. He gets openly excited about the play, not bothering to appear chill. He talks about his teachers all the time, because he's young enough to think they're fascinating. He giggles when mentioning a girl he really likes. Actually giggles. His voice hasn't broken. It's only his youth that gives him the confidence to think anyone believes he is 16. Dan is worried for him. He doesn't want him online, exposed and vulnerable. But then his real life is just as disturbing. At least when he is online with Dan, Dan knows where he is. When he's not online, he could be talking to Fiona, a murderer. It is sickening. Terrifying. I've been thinking when we play next... We should use the gas to rotate around, rather than heading straight to the center, Dan suggested. Why waste time? We should go straight for it. It's too obvious. Let's rotate around in a pinwheel motion instead. The reason for this is so you can use the gas as a shield of sorts. It prevents enemies from taking you out from behind. That's smart, said Seb with approval. You have to watch for that, added Dan ominously. He bit down on his tongue. He wanted to scream out a warning to the boy. Run, run, you're living with a fucking nut job. But he couldn't. Where would the kid go? So, are your parents divorced? Seb asked. It had been a hot day, and Dan was playing Warzone in his childhood bedroom. His parents are too stylish to be the sort to sentimentally cling to his old possessions. His sporting trophies, books, and clothes have long since been sorted into piles, storage, charity, bin. However, the room was familiar, and evoked a long-ago time of his life when things were less complicated, and everything had seemed rosy. Just the way the light still fell through the drawn curtains made his chest ache with yearning for those simpler times. No. Are yours. No, not exactly. Dan heard the aching uncertainty in Seb's voice. His childhood had never been simple and golden like Dan's own, and now it was totally shot. Where's your mum then? Why don't you live with her? People think she's dead. Dan wondered if his jagged breath might somehow cut through the confessional air, break the sense of confidentiality, and that Seb would stop sharing. People do, he asked gently. I don't think she is. I'd know if she was dead. Seb sounded certain. It broke Dan's heart. A child believing in fairy tales. I'd feel it if she was dead, but I don't feel it. Where do you think she is then? I don't know. Hiding, I guess. Her other husband abducted her. What? She was married to two men at the same time. My dad and this posh banker wanker. It was in the papers. You can read about it online if you don't believe me. I think he's still hiding her. Or she's hiding from him. Oh, right, yeah, I did read about that. But didn't the other husband go abroad somewhere? I think I read he was from the Netherlands. Dan placed this fact down carefully. He wanted the child to see sense, even if seeing sense meant losing hope. It was cruel to let him keep hoping that his stepmother was alive, because facts had to be faced. Yeah? So? Well. 
how could he have got her out the country? But then, if he was still hiding her when he went abroad... Dan broke off, surprised to find that he couldn't bring himself to be more explicit with the boy. You think she'd be dead, right? Because she'd starve if she was locked up somewhere and he'd skip the country. Dan winced at the stark, flat reasoning. She isn't dead, though, repeated Seb. So I guess she must be hiding. But why would she need to hide from him if he's left the country? Seb didn't reply. He obviously hadn't asked himself this before. Stubbornly, he repeated, She isn't dead! I would know! Dan felt like an imposter. A ghoul. He shouldn't be talking with Seb. He wasn't sure what he was hoping to find out from the boy, but the last thing he wanted to discover was this steely determination to believe an improbable thing. It was heartbreaking. He didn't want to encourage the fantasy that she was still alive, but he needed the kid to look into another direction for the killer. The boy needed to be alert. To keep safe. Well, I suppose she could be hiding from someone else. She'd know who she was hiding from. Maybe Dan Jansen didn't kidnap her. Seb didn't answer. I've got to go. My dad's calling. We're having a barbecue tonight. Chapter 17 Dan Right now, the app on Dan's mobile is buzzing, informing him that Ollie is back online. Tries not to get too excited. This doesn't necessarily mean the boy will stick around if Dan joins the game. Most likely he'll just quit, as has been his way of late. Still, Dan hopes. What has he besides hope? He quickly reaches for his headphones, fires up the PlayStation. The seconds lost to the blue screen are frustrating. He joins Ollie's game and crosses his fingers. Dan doesn't know the other two players in the game. They are French. Ollie tries a few schoolboy phrases to establish whether they speak English. Comment allez-vous? Um, parlez tous anglais? His accent is appalling. The French guys snigger. Tu parles français comme un vache espagnol. Dan is considerably more fluent than a Spanish cow but he doesn't feel the need to prove the point. He's annoyed that they are rude to Ollie. Defensive for him. But he knows better than to openly defend him. No 16-year-old appreciates being bailed. It just draws attention to weakness. He's sure Ollie will quit the game, embarrassed. But it appears he's made of sterner stuff. Maybe he was going to jack it in when he saw Dan's handle, but he can't now as it'll look as though the arrogant French boys have scared him away. Instead, he makes three kills in quick succession, underscoring his right to his handle, Slayer123. Dan hopes the French boys can't speak English well, too nationalistic to bother with another language, an attitude frequently encountered in both the countries that warred with one another throughout the Middle Ages. What's up? Haven't seen you online for a while he comments. He waits a beat, unsure whether Ollie will even bother to reply. Eventually, after a brief, aggressive and effective gunfire spurt, Ollie mumbles, Nothing, as per. Dan admires the kid's cool. His mother has been murdered. He is the center of a media storm. There's a global pandemic, and his first public exams have just been cancelled and yet he maintains that nothing is happening in his life, as usual. Nerves of steel, emotionally lobotomized, or a liar? Dan isn't sure. You play with my brother, right? Ollie asks. Dan wanted the conversation between them to move on, but hoped to control the direction. He doesn't know where this is going. Ollie asking about the connection with Seb 
will inevitably lead to some level of unmasking for them both. Is he ready for that? So much seems out of his control nowadays. Since Kai walked in and then out of his life. What's the handle? He asks, playing for time. Get wrecked A.H. Uh, yeah, I think so. Sometimes. He's only 12. Ah, so maybe this is why Ollie has been avoiding Dan. He doesn't suspect him of being his missing stepmother's other husband. He thinks he is a nonce. Well, that's a relief, of sorts. Shit, I didn't realize. Really? Well, yeah. I knew he wasn't 18 or whatever. I thought maybe 15. You shouldn't play with him. If he asks again, you should refuse his request. Right? No problem. All the same to me. Left, left, on your left! Ollie's character is shot in the game. He lies in a pool of blood. Rest me! Rest me! Ollie demands to be resuscitated, or resurrected. Dan is not sure what the proper term is. Neither of the French boys responds beyond muttering insults. It isn't the best move strategically, but Dan realizes that saving Ollie in the game might help ingratiate him in real life, so he risks it. He sends his character across the deserted parking lot at speed. He's made himself an open target, but the gamble pays off. Ollie mutters, Cheers. Once Ollie is up and running again, Dan asks, Why are you being all protective? Is your brother okay? Is there a problem? I just want him off my PlayStation, right? We share it, and he's always on it when I want a game. Gotcha. Dan forces himself to wait. If he probes too obviously, Ollie is likely to clam up. It's a matter of pace. They play in silence for a few minutes, the only conversation coming from the French boys, who continue to berate Dan and Ollie for their play tactics. Dan is glad that Ollie's French isn't up to comprehending their constant haranguing and insults, although he suspects their tone is internationally comprehensible. Ollie isn't an idiot. Dan feels uncomfortable. He befriended, if befriended is the right word, Ollie and Seb, because he wants more info on Fiona. But as the weeks have gone on, he's found he feels something more for them. He's sorry for them. He wishes their stepmother was at home with them, but that's never going to happen. So he wishes, at least, that Ollie won't be further humiliated by the mean boys. He doesn't know what to say. All he can think of is complimenting Ollie's play. Nice shot. I'm not 18 either. Right. Dan should probably ask how old Ollie is, but it seems disingenuous at best, creepy at worst. Nor are you. It's an accusation, but stated as a fact. So, how old are you? Dan wonders whether he should lie. He decides against it. There's no point. He's unlikely to be believed. Besides, if he's going to get the boy on side, he needs to do so quickly. Time is running out. He has to reveal himself. I'm 39. Are you a fucking pedo? No. It's not something that should be overly denied or explained. I thought you said you were a student. I don't think I did. But you said you were into peri-peri chicken and hot ones. I am. Like, as an influencer? No, I'm certain I didn't say that. Dan was, of course, subtle. No self-respecting influencer would ever say they were an influencer. He depended on that, talked around the subject, 
and allowed Ollie to draw what he wanted from the pauses and inferences. So what do you do? At the moment, nothing. I know, Covid, blah, blah, but I mean, usually, what do you do? Pre-pandemic. I work in the city, in London. I'm a banker. But you decided to do lockdown with your family. Are your parents, like, old and sick and stuff? Dan thinks of his virile father, his energetic, petite mother. No, that's not why I'm staying with them. There's a pause. Dan doesn't see it coming, and afterwards, he will ask himself if that is going to be his lot in life from now on, not seeing things coming, always being a step behind. Hell, he hopes not. He'd hate that. It's so damned aging. You're him, aren't you? Says Ollie. It's not a question. Who? You're her other husband. You're Dan Janssen. His fingers freeze for a moment. A sniper takes him out. He lies bleeding on the floor. Ollie does nothing to resuscitate him. Yes. Dan dare not breathe. The French boys are shouting in their own language, demanding to know what is wrong with Slayer 123, why he isn't saving his friend. They call him a fuckhead and question his patriotism. Qu'est-ce qui ne va pas chez vous? Putain de tête! They are not prepared to save Dan, though. In disgust, they rage quit the game. Enculé! Dan waits to see if Ollie will quit, too. He wonders what he can say to influence the situation one way or the other. Then he realizes there is nothing. It's the boy's choice. The constant sound of gunfire pounding through his headset into his brain is beginning to rattle him. The flashing explosions, the yells and footfall jar. He feels sweat bubble on his top lip. He's not usually a man who sweats. You must hate me, right? He says finally. I don't ever think of you, replies Ollie. Dan knows this has to be a lie. Maybe the biggest lie the boy has told him so far. How did you work out who I am? You sound old, and I watched your gaming play pattern. You only play with me or Seb. At first, I thought you had to be a shit-scum journalist. You said you were Swedish, but when I asked what tunes you like, besides the mainstream crap that told me you were 30 upwards, you mentioned a bunch of bands I'd never heard of, like... Blackbriar, Hyderocious, and Sinister. I checked them out, thinking they might be cool. They are three bands from the Netherlands, death metal and punk. Weird for a Swede. My mum... Lee always said people lie about a lot of stuff, but not the music they like. She would know, right? Dan doesn't interrupt although he would love to know if his wife had kept separate Spotify accounts for Kai and Lee, the way she had separate wardrobes and husbands. Then I worked it out. An old Dutch guy. You're the man who murdered her. There is no noise now. The game is over. The silence is deafening. I didn't murder your mum. She's not my mum. I didn't kill Lee Fletcher or Kai Janssen, Kai Gillingham, whatever the hell you want to call her. Whatever. Dan thinks the nonchalance has to be fake. Ollie challenges. Why did you track us down? Are you going to kill us too? No, no, of course not. Why would I do that? Dan splutters his indignation. I told you I didn't kill your mum. I found you because... I want you to know that. Yeah, but you did, Ollie says flatly. 
No, I didn't, Dan insists. I don't fucking care anyway. She didn't love us. She's a bitch. She did love you. Dan doesn't refute the bitch part. Look, it's important you believe me. I want you to know I didn't kill her because that means whoever did kill her is still out there. I don't believe you. You are a weirdo fucking worm that murdered a woman who made a dick out of you and now you're creeping around me and my brother. I'm going to the police. Fiona did it, Dan blurts. She's living with you, right? You and your brother are not safe. That's bullshit. I was framed. She framed me. You would say that. Anyone would say that. Probably. But it's true. Think about it, Ollie. You're a clever young man. You don't know me. I might be a moron. And don't patronise me. I'm not a young man. I'm a kid. His voice breaks. He's exhausted and frantic. Dan wishes he could help him. Even more, he wishes that Kai, or more potently for Ollie, that Lee, could wrap her arms around the boy and tell him it is all going to be okay, as she must have done on many other occasions, right? Dan wonders, was she that sort of mother? Kind, comforting, reassuring. He thinks she probably was. She was a kind wife. He'd have said her most compelling characteristics were her sexiness, her wit, the way she offered a challenge. But also, she was simply kind. He tries again, because he wants to protect his dead wife's kids. Just let the possibility into your head, and then you can decide if you dare to ignore it. If Fiona killed your mother... Doesn't she deserve to be punished for it? I don't care who killed Lee. Ollie's voice is flat. He's crushed by pain and loss. You do! You must! Dan's voice is high, squeaky. For him, desperation and fear have trumped pain and loss. He needs this boy to understand. Fiona is a killer! You and your brother are living with a killer! You don't think my dad had anything to do with it? Dan lets out a deep sigh. He doesn't know whether he should lie or not. Which will the boy best respond to? Which will keep him safest? It's possible, he admits. You are in a unique position to find out. But why would I do that? You're going down for it. If my dad did have anything to do with it, I don't want to know. We're all okay. He seems happy enough with Fiona. And Lee lied to us. She was married to you. She was having sex with you for years while pretending to love us. Your mother wasn't pretending to love you. She's not my mother. But she is, Ollie. We both know she is. She loved you so much. Dan's voice rasps with the strain of wanting to be believed. I never saw her with you, but I know better than anyone in the world how much she loved you. That makes no fucking sense. I offered her everything, Ollie. Everything. Do you understand? A penthouse apartment in one of the best properties in London. It has a pool and a gym. You should see the views. I gave her a life of ease and wealth, where she socialized with the great and the good. Actors, artists, politicians and journalists. The people who are zeitgeist. Dan is speaking quickly, not sure how much time Ollie will give him. I gave her an elegant extended family who liked and admired her. She had a life of unfettered joy, free from hardships and responsibilities, full of beautiful clothes, shoes and handbags. You know how women like shoes and handbags, right? But guess what? She couldn't leave you. If it had just been a choice between me and your dad, I'd have won. There is no doubt in my mind she loved you and your brother more than anything. Piss off. Ollie quits, and Dan is left alone with the tragic truth 
of what he's just admitted. Chapter 18 Stacy It's crazy to be unnerved by an old woman with dementia, but I set off back to the cottage at pace. What did she mean? You are the dead woman. Well, nothing, obviously. She has dementia. But still, it's a weird thing to say. The gaps are gnawing at me now. Initially, all I thought was important was surviving cancer. Living. But now I feel defined by my absence rather than my presence. And it's creating intense anxiety. I am exhausted with trying to work out who I am. I should not be unnerved by the crazy ramblings of an old woman, but I am, because I'm a house built on sand. There are no foundations. At any moment, I could crumble to dust. The days without knowing who I am have turned into weeks, months. And it's terrifying. As I dash home, I try to repeat my usual ritual that I use to try to calm myself. Normally, I recall what I do know. General knowledge, facts about history, politics or popular culture. But that's not adequate today. And I realise I have been kidding myself, pretending that it is enough to help. Instead, more ephemeral memories start to jump into my head. The few shadowy possibilities, things I dismissed as false memories or impossible dreams, jostle for attention, demanding I face them once again. The ginger-scented bath, rich and luxurious. The expensive dresses, carelessly discarded. The sex that left me helpless, quivering. The blonde man responsible for said sex. The grave that I hate. The children that I love. The garden full of flowers and hope. The other man, silently pleading for help, but also throwing me a lifeline. I sense that. It wasn't a one-way thing. Who are they all? And where are they now? I want to pull out my hair, slam my hands against my stupid head to somehow force some focus through the quagmire of these half-memories. I don't know what is real. The sky seems to be reflecting my unsettled mood. It's looking ominous. Dense, engorged clouds are being buffeted by the intensifying wind. And after the weeks of sunshine, it feels especially mean and taunting. Rain starts to fall and slices into my body at right angles. It feels as though sharp needles are being thrown at me. I run the last 50 metres with my head down, and so I simply barrel into him. The shock of the physical contact makes me freeze. I haven't touched anyone for months, other than the occasional hug or arm squeeze from my dad. This body is stout, and if not quite firm, then certainly substantial. I feel the soft cotton of his T-shirt against my cheek, and the slip of the nylon of his waterproof as I automatically reach for his arms to steady myself. I can smell the detergent his clothes have been washed in, and there is an intimacy. Unexpected and fleeting, but absolute. I feel dizzy. Our eyes meet. Giles Hughes. I know him instantly. His clear, bright eyes, his easy smile, his ruddy cheeks. Features that combine to make him look like a children's TV presenter. Kind. In control. I wait a beat. Sorry, sorry, he wasn't looking where I was going. I gabble. I'm embarrassed, but also so delighted that I know him, that I think I might fling my arms around him in relief. Turned awful, hasn't it? He doesn't seem to expect an answer. His hood is pulled down low, and he's barely glanced at me. He starts to stride on, 
Then he spots Ronnie and pauses. He glances at me again, obviously placing me now that he's recognized the dog. I try not to be offended by that. Hi, Giles. I smile. He squints at me, pulls his face into an expression of surprise. Yep, it's me, Stacy, I say with faux brightness that I hope hides some awkwardness. I recognized him. This is really exciting for me. I want to gush and tell him so, but realize that it might be a bit much. There's a ring on his left hand. He's unlikely to welcome the news that he's the only person I've placed since my operation. It is a lot to load onto a person. He steps further back, widening the distance between us. Evening, he mutters. Then he abruptly turns, dashes off, head down against the wind and rain. I watch his bent back as he shrinks on the horizon. I want to talk to him some more, but this isn't the moment. The rain is pouring, a ferocious surprise of a summer storm. I'm quickly going to be wet through to my underwear, so I sprint in the opposite direction from Giles's disappearing figure, towards Dad's welcoming cottage. When I explode into the kitchen, the back door swings on its hinges, the gusting wind making it crash against the wall. It feels like the entire building shakes. Dad is so startled that he nearly drops the bottle of red wine he's opening. Oh my God, I need that, I say, practically snatching the glass from him, even as he's still pouring wine into it. I glug it back like water, and then hold it out to him for a refill. Steady, he smiles. Remember, you're on medication. It's a well-meant observation, but I hate it when Dad monitors my alcohol consumption. He often mentions that the doctors say I have to take things steady. I glower at him. What's up? He asks. I've just bumped into Giles Hughes. Dad stares at me and waits. You recognized him? I did, I grin, and Dad gets it. He beams right back at me. This is momentous. Can't say it was exactly the warm reunion I might have hoped for from the very first person I recognized, but I guess I can't expect that from him. There's obviously going to be some embarrassment between us, and the storm and everything didn't help. What did he say to you? Not much. He mentioned the weather. I laugh at the Englishness of this. The ordinariness of it. An embarrassed ex taking refuge in small talk. It seems so normal. And as I'm generally very far from that state, it feels like a delightful relief. Dad laughs too. He never was much of a conversationalist. We beam at one another and clink glasses. It has really cheered me up. That Prue McCullen freaked me out. Why? Oh, nothing. I decided to speak to her, but it was a mistake. She was rambling. What she said didn't make sense. Put her out of your head. Poor woman. As I said, she's not well. So sad. Dad sympathetically dismissing Prue McCullen and not lending her any credence is just what I need. He always knows how to cheer me, what to say. Go and get some dry PJs on. I'll dig out some crisps. It's a good night. After I change into pyjamas and towel dry my hair, we settle down to a game of cards. I feel buoyant that I recognize Giles, and it seems that, consequently, something in my mind has melted. Relaxed. Or maybe that can be attributed to the fact that Dad and I drink the best part of two bottles of wine. At the end of the evening, I throw the bottles in the recycling bin and swill the glasses under the tap. Not exactly a wash, more of a cat's lick. Who said that? My grandfather? Yes, I'm sure it was. I can hear his voice. I feel the weight of lowering a frying pan into sudsy water. 
then lifting it out again almost immediately and far from clean. He gently ribs my efforts at washing up, but I'm very young, so he's not criticizing. There's a sense that he admires that I've tried. Classical music is playing in the background. Did your father live with us when I was a child? I ask Dad. No. Oh, I thought I remembered him. A grandfather, my grandfather. Dad pauses, then smiles. He visited in the holidays, though. Okay, that will be it. I remember him. I beam. What do you remember about him? I liked him. I can't visualize my grandfather, and I don't recall Dad showing me any photos of him, but I feel a sense of warmth and safety seeping through my body at the thought of him. Like you, he enjoyed a fried breakfast, right? Who doesn't? Dad waits to see if I have anything more to offer up. Retrieving a memory is like pulling on a cobweb thread. Gossamer thin. He doesn't want to yank at it, cause it to snap. Though that's all I have, I meet his eyes and smile. Things are starting to come back to me. It seems that way. I go to bed, a mix of excitement and relief. The night before Super Saturday shimmers. I think there must be millions of people up and down the country lying in a pool of anticipation. Excited at the pull of pubs and restaurants opening. The possibility of meeting people from outside their own household. Seeing old friends again. Yet I suspect very few of them are as hopeful or eager as I am. The prospect of seeing faces that might trigger memories and allow everything to fall back into place is making me giddy. I know Dad wants me to be cautious and continue shielding, but I'm not sure how I'll resist hunting people out. I fall asleep knowing that Super Saturday will allow me to find some answers. Saturday, 4th of July, 2020. Chapter 19. Ollie. The train is packed. Like, there's not a spare bit of space to move in. They are lucky to have seats. Some people are standing. Mostly groups of older teens, who are rowdy and drinking beer from cans, even though it's only early morning. It's so hot, some of these lads have taken off their shirts, and Ollie can smell their sweat. As usual, he tries to avoid looking at other teenagers, especially older ones. That would be asking for trouble, something he really doesn't need to do. Trouble obviously finds him. There are families too, mums and dads with their kids, with cheerfully coloured backpacks stuffed with activity packs and Tupperware boxes of treats. Ollie doesn't like looking at them either. The entire crappy world seems to have decided to go to Lyme Regis, home to famous Georgian fossil collector and paleontologist Mary Anning. The words just tumble in his head. That's what Lee always said when she mentioned Lyme Regis. Home to famous Georgian fossil collector and paleontologist Mary Anning. She recited it in a little sing-song voice. It was one of those funny, not very funny, family things that all families have. They'd all join in, like a chorus. At least they did when they were younger. Now he thinks that was a bit pathetic. A dead woman fascinated with things that had died millions of years before her. Boring. Still, the tourist board make as much of it as they can, naturally. That and cream teas. They visited here often. Yeah, over the past few years, since Fiona bought a holiday home here. But even before then, they came all the time, 
because Lee said it had everything a family needed for a holiday. The sea, a beach, ice cream shops, boats, and a sub-four-hour door-to-door journey, whether by train or car. She said it was ideal. Funny that Fiona chose to buy a holiday home here. Did she also love the Dorset coast? Or did she do it to please Lee? To keep Lee close. Keep them all close. Ollie doesn't know. The thoughts buzz around his head, unsettling, and creating a tightness in his mind that he can't grapple with. It's like reading an English comprehension exercise at school. There's a sense that something is just a bit out of his reach, layered and perplexing. He's never thought about Fiona's motivation to buy a holiday home before. He just thought it was great that they could always go to Auntie Fee's on every school holiday. His life used to be so simple. Lee really had a thing for Mary Anning. She was always going on about her independent thinking and how hard it was for her in a man's world. Annoying stuff like that. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, he got it. In hindsight, Lee was stifled. Lee wasn't happy. Well, fuck off, Lee, because no one is happy now. Every time he thinks of her, he feels hot with fury and sick with sadness. He hates her. And he hates her most for being dead. Seb has to be reminiscing too, possibly longing for simpler times because he asks, do you remember that year when it rained and rained all week and the holiday was total rubbish and so Mum dressed up as Mary Anning and went on the beach to look for fossils? Ollie keeps his gaze above his brother's head, but nods. A reluctant acknowledgement of the comment. Of the memory. That was so funny. Everyone came out on the beach, like from the other houses, didn't they? People were cheering up, laughing and joining in. Seb's eyes are shining, and Ollie hates it. Hates his hope. Hates his grief. Hates that his baby brother is stuck between the two things. She kept saying Mary Anning wouldn't have been put off by a bit of bad weather. Mere drizzle. It was not drizzle. She was drenched. I wonder where she got that costume, said Muses. The charity shop. What? Don't you remember? She dragged us in there and got us to help her find the bits she needed. That was all part of the game. She bought a black blouse, a long black skirt, an old-fashioned apron thing. Ollie remembers her eager face as she pounced on the apron, surprised by the perfect suitability of the find. This is just the thing! It kills him that he recalls this, but he does. His mum, Lee, was determined to create some fun for them. He was about nine years old at the time, young enough to be excited by her nutty enthusiasm for doing odd things. Of course, that was before she met Dan Janssen, before she went a step too far in terms of eccentricity and following the beat of her own drum, etc. Bitch. Ollie looks out of the train window and focuses on the countryside whizzing by. The trees look an especially dazzling green after months of seeing nothing other than the dull greys of buildings and roads. He can't wait to be outside in the fresh air. The closeness of other people's bodies is making him anxious. Not because of the COVID thing. He doesn't really care about all that. Kids aren't getting sick from it anyway. It is an old people problem. His angst about how close everyone is to him and Seb is that people are untrustworthy fuckers, all of them. On the station, and when they were boarding the train, he kept reaching for Seb's arm and pulling him close, scared that his brother was somehow going to be snatched away. He wishes they were younger, and he could hold his hand, or younger still, and he could have him in those training reins that some parents keep their toddlers on. He wishes he could strap Seb to his back, Fucking swallow him whole or something, just to keep him close, 
and always know where he is. Fuck, that's mad. He is losing his mind. Ollie rubs his eye sockets with the heels of his hands. His breathing is too fast. His palms are sweating. Seb doesn't seem to notice. He is just so thrilled that he's been invited along. Ollie doesn't think Fiona is a killer. That is mad. Just mad. She makes them chili con carne and tacos for fuck's sake. Still, Lee was also a good cook and a bigamist at the same time. Culinary skills don't rule out being a total bitch. The whole thing is such a head fuck. He is exhausted by it. And frightened. He just needs to get away from them for a bit. From the house that holds Lee's ghost in every corner. From his dad and his stupid depression. From Fiona and whatever threat she might be. Obviously, even the slightest possibility that Fiona killed Lee meant he couldn't leave Seb in London. He couldn't leave him alone. He wouldn't let Seb wake up and find him gone. Not him, too. Honestly, Ollie doesn't have much of a plan at all beyond keeping Seb safe. Seb is extra. He'll slow things down and ask a lot of questions. He will go on and on about being hungry or thirsty or hot or cold or tired. He's like that. He thinks his physical comfort is of interest to everyone and so always gives a running commentary. Lee used to encourage that crap, pander to it, strive to fix it by having a constant stream of snacks and drinks and layers of clothes. Seb should now get used to the idea that his updates on his bodily comfort are of interest to precisely no one. This morning, Ollie woke up literally at the crack of dawn to a chorus of birds squawking and crowing outside his open window. Bird song is supposed to herald happiness at the start of a new day, but the noise sounded more like an alarm bell, disturbing, like the wail of an ambulance siren. He packed them a bag with food and drink, sunscreen, caps, because although he doesn't want to pander to Seb, he can sort of see what Lee was doing all these years, just like making things easier. He packed their passports too. He has no intention of going abroad, couldn't even if he wanted to, but it never hurts to have your passport with you. If he needs to speak to the police, for example, he'll have to prove who he is. Look, that's not his plan. He doesn't expect things to turn out that way. He sneaked into Seb's room and gently shook him awake. He held his hand over his brother's mouth so he couldn't yell out any surprised questions, then put a finger to his own lips. Seb nodded his understanding. Eyes wide, he quickly, quietly hopped out of bed. Ollie threw a T-shirt and a pair of shorts at him whispered that he had to keep completely silent as he got dressed. Downstairs, they found their dad asleep on the sofa bed in the living room. They crept past him, eased open the front door, left. Ollie only let Seb put on his trainers at that point. Then they rode their bikes to the station. They pedalled fast, got on a train to Axminster, it never crossed Ollie's mind to leave a note. Are we looking for her? Seb asks. Pathetically hopeful. It annoys Ollie. No, she's dead. Seb shakes his head a fraction, the way he does every time anyone tells him this or even implies it. An act of defiance. Or maybe just shaking off what he doesn't want to hear. So why are we here? He asks as they finally dismount at Axminster Station. They stand on the small platform as everyone around them streams with purpose and certainty one way or the other, towards town, the taxi rank, or a bus. Ollie is frozen. Usually Lee drove them to Lyme Regis, but they have been to this station before a few times. 
Sometimes they would head to the coast by train if Fiona was already staying in her second home. Then she'd pick them up from the station in her car. Other times, the three of them would take a cab to her place when it was empty. And then their dad would join them at the weekend, bringing the car. If he is honest with himself, all he has to admit, they have had great holidays here. Holidays where they visited the Jurassic Play Park, rode on the Seton Tramway, searched for fossils, mucked about on Fiona's little boat, and then warmed up again by drinking hot chocolate and feasting on salty chips. He allows himself to recall these happy days, sometimes with his dad, sometimes with Fiona, always with Lee. Think of it as a holiday, he tells Seb. The station empties out. Crowded buses full of excited families pull away. The longed-for space now seems too much. The boys feel deserted. The familiar place made unfamiliar without a guide or a waiting lift. Dad is going to kill you, mutters Seb. You think? I think they'll like having the place to themselves. So they can shag and he doesn't have to sleep downstairs pretending they're not. Seb is trying to sound nonchalant and unconcerned. He fails on both counts when he turns pink. Ollie is aware that they are starring in their own grim fairy tale. It has all the elements. They are alone. They have an indifferent father, a wicked stepmother. It's the classic setup. He just isn't sure which woman is the wicked stepmother. He isn't sure either why he's come here, what he's hoping to find. Not Lee. He knows she's dead. Unlike Seb, he's accepted as much, and he knows that the police have already searched Fiona's property for clues, for a body. They didn't find a body. So what is it that he's looking for? I think we'll find her here, says Seb confidently. Ollie pities him, and sort of admires him at the same time. They both gaze around the empty station. It's a hot day, but a wind is blowing through, buffeting them. Across the road is a builder's yard and a giant pet store. There's a supermarket a hundred metres away. These are solid, normal things that should offer some level of reassurance. They are not in a different world. They are not in the same one either. Ollie takes a deep breath, fills his lungs with the country air, checks the bus timetable, then fishes out a ham sandwich from his rucksack and hands it to Seb. They wait fifteen minutes and then hop on the next yellow bus, which takes them into town. I can see the sea, mumbles Seb, as they approach Lyme Regis. Ollie nods, acknowledging the long-established game they've always played. What the hell is he doing here? What is he hoping to find? Chapter 20 Stacy. I just can't resist. I know Dad is concerned about shielding, so I plump for the path of least resistance. I don't tell him I've decided to go into town. But how can I not go after the breakthroughs yesterday, recognising Giles, remembering my grandfather? I'm on a roll. Damned Covid has stolen enough from me, and everyone come to that. I have to seize the opportunity of doing everything I can to maximise my chances of remembering more as soon as possible, which means I have to take myself to familiar places. Hopefully meet more people who know me. My plan is that when Dad takes Ronnie for a walk, I'll grab my backpack and set off along the road. I won't take the beach route because I'd have to pass him. It seems a little cloak and dagger considering I'm a grown woman in my late thirties. 
I should perhaps simply stand up to Dad and tell him this is what I need to do. But somehow having cancer, and more specifically losing my memory, has temporarily infantilized me. It's only as I'm leaving the house that it crosses my mind that I don't have any money. I haven't had use for a handbag, purse, or bank cards during lockdown. Going into town without a bean isn't a sensible move. I need enough to buy a cold drink, and maybe lunch, depending on how long I'm there. The past months of rummaging through drawers and cupboards means that I know where to find some loose change. I unearth eight pound coins and pick up a tenner that's been propped behind the mantelpiece clock for weeks. That's plenty. It's a hot day, and although it's not even 9am, the air feels still and sticky. The tarmac on the road shimmers. I've brought an ordnance survey map with me, because while the countryside feels generally known to me, I'm not totally certain of the exact route into town. This is galling, as I obviously must have done it hundreds of times before. The roads are narrow, room for only one car at a time. Mother Nature has flexed her muscles during lockdown, and a number of robust tree branches, gangly, bold and verdant, reach, bend and drip over the road, causing the few cars that are trundling this way to swerve and dodge. Grasses growing from the verges whip my legs, and I have to keep vigilant to avoid stinging nettles. According to the OS map, the journey into town is just over four miles. I don't come across any other pedestrians. This route is the most direct, but it isn't as picturesque as the beach and field trails, and not many people opt to travel this way on foot. A few cars pass me, and there are slightly hair-raising moments every time a bus trundles by and I need to swiftly scramble onto the bank at the side of the road. But, all in all, the walk is a success. It has an undeniable sense of excitement and independence to it. As I approach Lyme Regis, my excitement builds. I feel I am being wrapped in a huge, welcoming hug. The town is perfectly, reassuringly familiar. I see the sea. I recognize the stone walls, the curve of the road, and the Georgian and Victorian houses, most of them white, but some painted lemon or blue, the same shade as sugared almonds. The joy I feel causes my heart to speed up a little. I approach from Langmore Close and am delighted, as I correctly predict, that there is a bookshop on my right and a fudge shop on my left. Knowing what to expect to see is wonderfully reassuring. My constant anxiety and sense of isolating uncertainty recedes a little. It's a small town, but made to feel bigger today because it's rammed with joyful tourists. They move like bees swarming around a hive, industrious, purposeful. Dad was right to be concerned about social distancing. It's impossible to keep, so I wear my mask. Many other people do the same, as face coverings are required indoors, and those who are popping in and out of shops presumably can't be bothered with repeatedly putting them on and taking them off. I, like almost everyone else, migrate towards the coast. I suppose a lot of these people will have come from inland towns and cities and are desperate for a paddle. I've had the luxury of being by the seaside throughout, but head in that direction anyway, hoping that there will be more opportunity to spread out on the beach than there is on the streets, that I can make a plan as to how best to utilize my time here. The moment I see the beach... I realise my mistake at thinking there would be more space. Every spare inch seems to be covered with a picnic blanket, a windshield, a deck chair. I drink in the sight of groups of buoyant teens, loved up couples and families, nuclear and extended, sprawled over the pebbles, 
laughing, chatting, flirting, reading, bickering, sulking, shouting, and even in one case, singing. Dogs are barking. Music is blaring from people's phones and speakers. The place teems with life. Over and over again, I am reassured by things I find familiar. The mini golf, the amusements and the antique centre. I recognise the Dinosaur Land Fossil Museum, although I can't think it's likely I've been there since I was a child. Coming out today was the right thing. I feel confident that my memory is going to return to me. It would most likely have done so before now, if only we'd been living in a more usual way. The absolute isolation of these past few months has hampered my rediscovery. I realise that milling around with the ice cream eating populace is not necessarily the best use of my time. I thought I'd pop in and out of shops to see if any of the staff recognise me. However, as masks are necessary, and it seems many of the shops are staffed by teens, I'm not sure that plan is likely to be fruitful. I decide to visit the library to use their internet. I'm ready to look up my Facebook and Instagram accounts. The thought sends adrenaline carousing through my body. The idea of discovering more about who I am is like unwrapping the ultimate surprise gift. Chapter 21 Stacy. The library is an oblong red brick building, most likely built in the 1970s. I don't have to check on a map to know where it is. I am able to recall its location, which sends a little thrill through me. I imagine I spent hours here as a child. There are three mothers with children waiting outside in a queue. One of them turns to me and explains that there is currently a system that allows just two families inside at a time to keep everyone safe. I resist commenting that nothing can really keep us safe. How could I have avoided cancer? And instead nod with what I hope looks like understanding. She glances at her watch and sighs, a theatrical display of impatience. Close is at 12.30, though, so I hope Naomi Thomas and her mob aren't going to be much longer. Hogging all the books, hogging all the time. Naomi Thomas. I play the name around in my head to see if it's by chance one I recognise. Plead in von Traps, the woman goes on. Five kids between the ages of fifteen and five. One more than the Queen, just to make a point. Although I can't imagine what lockdown must have been like in their house. She sniggers, obviously delighted at the thought of someone else's domestic trials. This woman has just one child with her, a girl aged about seven, who is sitting on the grass nearby, contentedly making a daisy chain, leaving her mother the job of keeping a space in the queue. I'm not being funny. Me and Naomi have known each other since school, so obviously I'm saying this with affection, but my God, she makes a huge deal of everything. She rolls her eyes in mock despair. I nod, trying to show a polite interest. I'm not sure what the normal response might be to this sort of gossip. Somehow, it feels familiar. I think it's a universal default setting. One mother gossiping about another to a third party. I believe it happens at every school gate. I must know this from my teaching. I didn't realise the model might be recreated anywhere. The thought of a supposedly innocuous queue outside a library oozing entrenched rivalry somehow exhausts me. Still, what can I do other than let the woman talk? This is her first time outside our village since lockdown began. She took the stay local thing to heart, scowled at other people's kids if they were out longer than the hour of permitted exercise. Daft bitch. Some say she's a paragon of virtue, the best mum in Williton Cross. I let my Violet play outside all day if she wants. Fresh air is good for them. I'm from Williton Cross, I interrupt excitedly. Well, close by. I went to primary school there. My dad lives by the sea. 
I am surprised and delighted at the connection. Stacy Jones! I pull off my mask and beam. For a moment, this woman stares at me blankly. Then her entire face shifts into a wide-eyed expression of astonishment. Oh my God, Stacy! I haven't seen you for years! It's me, Tanya! Tanya Vaughan! Well, Tanya Cunliffe now. Has been for eight years. Name lasted longer than the marriage. How are you? Didn't you go abroad? Yes, Paris. Oh my God, yes, you jilted Giles Hughes, didn't you? Talk of the town, that was. She laughs as though this is the funniest thing she has ever heard. I feel a small flare of irritation reverberate through my body, but I let it go. I'm just so thrilled to be with someone who knows me. I chase her name around my head, hoping it will spark something, as Tanya starts to give me a potted history of her life since we last met. She met an out-of-towner, got pregnant, got married, got divorced. There's been a few fellas since, but they all turn out to be bastards in the end, don't they? Like everyone, Tanya must have been short of company over the past few months and has forgotten the art of conversation, where not only is one person supposed to inquire after the other, but they're also meant to wait for a response. Instead, she rambles on about herself. I don't mind. It's great to be inside someone else's head for a while. After about ten minutes straight of Tanya speaking, an elderly woman leaves the library, and it's Tanya's turn to go inside. Bloody Naomi is still in there! No doubt picking out the classics and pushing them at her kids. For all her hopes for Mother of the Decade Award, she's oblivious to the fact that her eldest smokes weed in the bus shelter. Tanya winks at me, and then disappears into the building. I want to keep talking to her and hope to take her phone number, but she's in and out before Naomi Thomas and her brood emerge. The strict one-way system means we can only wave at one another. I have to go inside or lose my place. I look forward to the opportunity to connect with Naomi, but I'm disappointed that once inside, we are kept at a distance from one another by an officious school-age volunteer librarian. It takes a bit of negotiating to be allowed to use the library computer. One librarian says it's simply not possible, not hygienic. A second suggests plastic gloves would be the answer, and says she has a pair in her handbag. What on earth are you doing with a pair of plastic gloves in your bag? asks the first. They come with the kit for dyeing your hair, but I never bother with wearing them. I thought they might come in useful. Proper Boy Scout I am. I gratefully don the gloves and excitedly turn on the computer. My optimism is immediately tested when I Google my name. There are over 400 Stacy Jones profiles on LinkedIn, 70 registered in the UK People Directory, 192.com, and countless Instagram and Facebook members with my name. I take some consolation in the fact that it's a name for winners, clearly, because there are pages of articles about Stacey Joneses throughout the world. The various incarnations include, although are not limited to, women in the film industry with IMDb entries, a famous basketball player, a professor of paediatrics at the University of Arkansas, a VP of exploration at Golden Planet Mining Corps, and the star of the second season of NBC's The Apprentice. This Stacey Jones has a jewellery and accessories range. Apparently, it's doing very well. My own achievements have, of course, been significantly more modest. I'm not expecting to feature in news articles. The searches on social media are going to be most fruitful for me. It's a blow, therefore, when I can't access the Stacey Jones profiles on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, because I'm not registered on any social media. Or rather, I'm sure I am, but I don't recall my passwords. I go through a frustrating process. If I had any hair, I would most certainly be pulling it out. As I try to guess at the passwords that will give me access to my accounts, I eventually admit defeat and so try to re-register. 
This is an equally confusing and complicated process because every time I try to make a new account, I'm reliably informed that I already have one and am asked for my password. The passwords I can't remember. I go around in a Dante's hell of ever-decreasing vicious circles, clicking on pictures of bridges and traffic lights to prove I'm not a robot. I finally set up my new Instagram account, just as the sweet librarian who gave me her plastic gloves says she's very sorry, but the library must close. We do a half day on Saturday. But I'm just getting somewhere, I groan. You can come back on Monday, dear. Can I suggest you write down your passwords somewhere? I know they advise us not to, but I've watched you struggle. I have a terrible memory, so I sympathise. I nod and write down the password for the Instagram account I've just managed to open without bothering to go into details as to exactly how terrible my memory is and why. I also don't confide my belief that my dad will veto any more trips to the town until they've discovered a cure, or at least a vaccine for this virus. Of course, I'm exaggerating, but I do believe he might be a bit non-compliant. I'm itching to start searching all the Stacy Joneses and find my old account. The idea that relatively recent photos of my friends, and possibly lovers, are just a few clicks away is so infuriating. I know I'm close to discovering who I truly am, getting my memories back. I feel it. Just as I'm leaving, I impulsively check. Can I take a book out? At least with a loaned book and the threat of a fine if it's not returned hanging over my head, I might have an excuse to come back into town. Are you a member of the library, dear? I was a long time ago. I think my membership will have lapsed. Well, let's have a look, shall we? What's your name? I tell her my name and address, and she types it into the computer behind the desk. Yes, here you are. We have you. I feel a surprising sense of delight and relief, too. Oh, you're Kenneth's girl, aren't you? I can see the wheels turning in her head. She beams at me. Oh, my dear, I am so happy to see you doing well. I realise Dad must be friends with this woman, and she is aware I've had cancer. Of course you must take a book. You can have up to four. You go and pick, and I'll start wiping down the tables and chairs. It's just so wonderful to see you well. She pauses, her face flooded with sympathy. I wonder what my chances of recovery were, whether my father ever sadly speculated with his friends about whether I would survive the big C. The librarian reaches out and squeezes my gloved fingers. Moved by this intimacy, I blurt, Did we know each other before? You know, when I was a child. She looks confused. I point to my head. I can't remember everything clearly, I explain. No, love, I only moved to Lyme four years ago. We've never met before. I nod. Do give my best to your dad, won't you? I'm so glad you came home eventually. He's missed you so much. Dreadful circumstances, obviously, but so nice to have you back in the community, Stacy. Chapter 22 Seb it has been sort of a good day. They are at least doing something. After months of doing nothing. Seb feels the relief of this. Ollie keeps saying he isn't looking for their mum, but obviously he is, because why else are they here, in the town centre, where living people are? If she was dead, her body wouldn't just be lying around Lyme Regis. That's just stupid. Someone would have found her by now. So they're not looking for a dead body. Anyway, if she was dead, Seb would know. He's sure of it. He misses his mum so much that he feels a hole inside his body. He aches from the inside out. 
It feels like he's a Halloween pumpkin, and he's been hollowed out. His innards are probably lying in a big gloopy mess somewhere. That's stupid. He knows it. He's just saying it's how it feels. He can't tell anyone that. Can't explain it without sounding like a pathetic kid. He could have told his mum, if she was here. She understood him when he tried to explain complicated things like that, and she never laughed at him. It's embarrassing that he misses her so much. He knows she lied to them all, and liars are bad people. She was always telling him not to tell lies. Yet she was a liar. He knows that, but he misses her anyway. Ollie says he doesn't miss her. But that just makes Ollie a liar too, because he has to miss her. Maybe he's lying to Seb, or to himself, but he's definitely lying. People do. Ollie keeps talking about going to Fee's house. Do you think Mum will be there? Seb asks. Ollie sighs. No, because she's dead. Seb turns away from his brother, looks out at the sea. He hates it when Ollie does that. He doesn't think his mum is at Fee's house, because the police have been there already, and she'd know it was being watched. If she is hiding, that would be the last place to go, so he isn't in any rush to get there either. He doesn't want to leave the town yet. He feels close to his mum here. The memory of her, and the possibility of her. We could walk there. It's a few miles up the coast, says Ollie. He looks doubtful, though, as neither of them are big fans of walking. They both used to hate their mum and dad's enthusiasm for a Sunday afternoon walk to settle lunch. Yeah, but there's a really steep bit at the end, points out Seb. It is a sticky, hot day. At the end of the route, they'd have to do a basic rock climb. He can't imagine how they're going to do that. To discourage Ollie from that plan, he adds, Probably, if we go there, Dad and Fiona will be waiting for us. Ollie considers this. Maybe. We'll just stay in town tonight. Get a room somewhere. How would we pay for that? Asks Seb. I've got money. Where from? A friend gave me it. Which friend? Shut up, Seb. Seb tries not to appear hurt by the curt dismissal, but he probably doesn't do a good job because Ollie looks impatient and regretful at the same time, then offers, You hungry? Should we get some fish and chips? They sit on the pebbles, facing out to sea, and gobble down the hot, greasy, vinegary food. They don't bother using the little wooden forks that have been provided. Then they agree that an ice cream is needed. There is a shop that sells about a million flavours. Over the years, they have tried them all and established that cookies and cream is Ollie's favourite, mint choc chip is Seb's. Today, though, they can't be bothered with the queue that snakes right around the corner, so they buy 99s from the van, which has a slightly shorter queue. They also have a cream scone each and buy some sweets. Ollie pays for everything with a quick tap of his bank card. Most of the afternoon they spend on the beach. Everyone around them has brought beach towels. Ollie remembered sunscreen, but not towels. The pebbles are uncomfortable, but it doesn't matter. Neither of them tries to lie back and sleep or read the way the people around them are. Both of them sit bolt upright, alert. Ollie is staring out at the horizon. Seb is more interested in who is on the packed beach. His eyes scurry across the tangles of families, the clusters of people tightly crammed together as he looks for her. When the heat of the afternoon starts to slacken and the first whisper of evening approaches, they move on to a cafe where they can buy Cokes and then sit at a table outside. The table wobbles, but Seb likes the view. The cafe is on Broad Street, 
perched above the marine parade. He glances about. The streets are as busy as the beach, even now. People walk up and down, dragging their flip-flopped feet. Directionless, but just glad to be out. It might be better if it hadn't been quite so hot today. Fewer people would mean she would have been easier to spot. Seb feels sweat under his baseball cap, but he keeps it on because the peak allows him to look around better. Who gave you the money? He asks for the second time that day. He has been thinking about it and can't imagine any of Ollie's friends handing over cash, let alone transferring funds into his account. Grandparents do that, and his dad and mum. No one else just gives you money. Why would they? None of your business. Usually, if Ollie says something like this, Seb accepts the close down, doesn't dare fight him. But things aren't usual between them. They are more like partners now. Partners in crime, as they've run away together, so he persists. Tell me! The condensation on his coat glass glints in the amber glow of the sinking sun, but his throat feels dry and scratchy. Ollie sighs. Dan Janssen. It takes Seb a moment to place the name. Her other husband? That knob? Yeah. Seb feels his skin prickle as though he's been stung. How do you know him? How has he given you money? Isn't he in prison? He's still in the Netherlands. He's on bail, so he's allowed to live at home. Ollie pauses and then adds, You know him too. You're talking to him. I am not! Seb is furious to be accused of this. He'd never talk to that man. He hates him. That man stole their mother. He's Golden Warlord. What? But the outraged one-word question is hardly out of his mouth before he comprehends. People are never who they say they are, least of all online. Teachers are always going on about stranger danger on the internet. He is stunned that he hasn't made the connection before. Why did he give you money? Do you know something? Has he paid you to keep quiet? Seb's eyes widen in panic. Ollie, if you know something, you have to tell the police, no matter how much he's paying you. No, I don't know anything. At least, I don't know, know anything. So why does he give you money? He wants me to find things out. He says he didn't do it. And you believe him? No, not really. But I don't not believe him. This is where the boys sit a lot of the time now, in a quagmire of uncertainty. Anyway, what does it matter if I believe him or not? He's a rich twat, right? Free money. He owes us a holiday, wouldn't you say? Ollie shrugs. When he asked me to help prove his innocence, I told him I couldn't go anywhere or do anything, as I'm just a kid and can't afford it. He got the hint. He asked for my Monzo number and sent money. When? When did all this happen? Last night. Well, this morning. I texted him at about 4am. No one is getting much sleep. What does he want you to look for? How are you supposed to prove his innocence? Ollie shrugs again. Dunno. So why did you come here? Dunno. There must be a reason, Seb insists, infuriated with his brother for not letting him in, not quite. Ollie is scared. It doesn't help Seb knowing this, but he's his brother. He knows everything about him like different branches of the same tree or something. He did that in French at school, had to draw a family tree. It was just a stupid way to remember grand-mère, but also it wasn't totally stupid. 
because it made Seb think how he and Ollie are connected and always will be. Even when Ollie says things like he wishes Seb hadn't been born or had been born without a tongue, something he says fairly often. Seb knows Ollie is scared because of the way he holds himself. Sort of stiff, as tall as possible. He juts out his chin purposefully and repeatedly brushes his hair off his face and he glowers as though he wants to see more, stare extra hard, spot anything that might be heading their way. As if. They never saw any of this coming. Ollie is definitely hiding something. No, just a holiday, really. Something to do. He stands up abruptly, reaches for his mask. I'm going inside for a pee. Don't move. What a stupid thing to say, thinks Seb. Where would he go? He recognises her instantly. It is so weirdly perfect and stupidly unexpected at the same time that he finds himself acting like someone off a comedy TV show. He literally jumps up from his seat he jolts the table, and one of the empty glasses that held Coke wobbles over. Mom! Mom! He screams really loudly. Loads of people look his way. They probably think he's just some overdramatic kid saving a table for his mother and trying to get her attention. The glass rolls to the edge of the table and then falls to the ground. It smashes, and the slivers of glass skitter across the cobbles. There is a dog under the table next to them. Its owners look really pissed off. Seb doesn't care. Mom! Mom! It's me! Mom! He yells again. He waves his hands in the air. She doesn't turn towards his voice, even though everyone else is staring quite openly now. She is on the road, beneath him. Just about ten metres away, but down the steps. And there are about a million people between them. Stupid people just standing around, eating ice cream, drinking beer, chatting and laughing and stuff. Seb hates them. They need to move. They need to get out of his way. He starts to push towards her. She is arguing with an old man. Well, not arguing exactly. She isn't saying much, but she is giving him filthy looks and doing that heavy, exasperated sigh thing that she sometimes used to do to Dad. Her shoulders would go up to her ears and then basically slump to about her waist. It is such a well-known gesture to Seb. He wants to laugh out loud at its familiarity, even though, in the past, it used to make him feel a bit uncomfortable and sad when his mum did it to his dad. Now he celebrates how known, noticed and particular it is. Although his father never seemed to notice it. Was that a problem? Should his dad have spotted when she was pissed off? He has all these thoughts as he runs down the steps towards her, as he shoves through the bodies of people who smell of sweat and sea and sun cream. He pushes against their backs and elbows, stands on his tiptoes to get glimpses of her. It is unbearable losing sight of her even for a second. Mom! Mom! It is a noisy street, full of chatter and drunk laughter, but surely she can hear him. Why doesn't she turn to him? Instead, she gets into a car. The old man slams the door behind her, then quickly gets in the driver's side and drives away swiftly. He moved really fast for such an old bloke. Seb starts to run after the car, his feet slam down hard on the pavement, his breathing is ragged and stays in his chest. At one point, he is only a couple of metres away from them, but he has to keep dodging around people milling about who are just idiots and can't see how he needs to get them out of his way. The car revs and accelerates up the hill. Seb keeps running, but the gap between them widens. Seb! Seb! What the hell, Seb? Ollie shouts. Seb is bent double, resting his hands on his knees, trying to get his breath back, trying not to cry. The disappointment throbs through him. He thinks he is going to be sick. He feels Ollie put his hand on his back, hot and heavy. He wants to shake it off. Run off that car, Ollie, 
he gasps. Which car? Ollie looks up the road. The car is out of sight now. Seb wants to cry. He mustn't cry. He can't. A grey Honda, old looking. What, why, did they nick something? Ollie looks around frantically, probably searching for their backpack. Seb knows he left it at the table. He hopes someone will have looked after it for them, but he doesn't really care that much. There is nothing in it that he values. Everything in the world that he values is in the Honda. He feels his stomach roil and his bowels clench. Mum is in the car. He stands up straight and stares at Ollie. Eye to eye, he might be believed. They are brothers. Seb still sees Ollie as an extension of himself, although he is never certain this is a two-way thing. It is possibly a younger brother thing. But he needs Ollie to believe him. Help him. Help their mum. What? I saw her. I saw her get in the car. No, you didn't. Ollie's response is flat, devoid of any emotion. I called out to her. Did she respond? Well, no, but... Ollie sighs, looks at his trainers, then puts both his hands on Seb's shoulders. You imagined her. You want it so much, you imagined it. You've thought of nothing other than her since we arrived, and so you've seen someone who looks a bit like her and imagined it's mum. But it's not her, Seb. I'm sorry, but it's not. Seb shakes him off and starts running up the street after the Honda, although it is long gone and he knows it's pointless. He stops halfway up the hill, admitting that his efforts are futile. She's cut off all her hair, he yells. She would never. She was really vain about her hair, replies Ollie quietly. Do you think she's hiding from someone? The person who took her? For fuck's sake, Seb, mum is dead. How many times do I have to tell you? She's not. She's really not. I saw this man put her in a car. She didn't want to go with him. What, he forced her? Lifted her into the car? Um, no, not exactly. But he took hold of her arm and sort of marched her towards the passenger door. Marched her? Kind of led her. She didn't want to get in. Did this woman scream out? Did she protest at all? Why isn't anyone else chasing this car if a man just kidnapped a Lee looky likey? Seb can't explain it. A blank opens up inside him, eating his words, his reason, his ability to expound. He has felt this happen before, a number of times since she left. It seems like in his life there is a massive crevasse. He's scared there always will be this feeling. He has to find her. If there is always this emptiness, he'll fall into it. He knows he will sooner or later. He's too young to avoid it without her. Without his mum. He needs her. He starts to cry. It is the worst thing he can do. It makes him seem like a kid. Then Ollie puts his arms around him, and that is worse still. He feels his own body quake. Ollie will assume he's crying because he is sad, but he's not. He's howling because he is not being heard, because he is frustrated and because it is unfair. The whole bloody, horrible, bloody, stupid, bloody thing is unfair and a nightmare, and he wants to scream and scream and scream. Crying is actually an act of self-control. He struggles to free himself from his brother's embrace and heads back to the cafe. The server is on her knees with a dustpan and brush, sweeping up the pieces of broken glass. 
Seb thinks of the last time he saw his mum. She'd been cleaning the kitchen, because their cat Topaz had got at the Sunday lunch chicken that was on the counter in a greasy baking tray. Topaz had made a load of oily footprints everywhere. Seb was worried she was going to choke on a chicken bone. His mum had got scratched when she tried to get the chicken carcass from the cat, and then she'd washed the floor. Seb, Ollie, and his dad had gone out. Left her to it. He remembers looking back over and seeing her kneeling next to a bucket of hot water. Later that night, they came home and she was dancing in the sparkling clean kitchen. He tries to remember her dancing. But usually when he thinks of her, he remembers her plunging her hands into the sudsy water. It makes him feel weird. His tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth. A group of women in their twenties are hovering around the table Ollie and Seb were sitting at, waiting for the glass to be cleared up so they can swoop into their seats. A couple of them are holding the backs of chairs purloined from other tables. One of them is holding Ollie's rucksack. She hands it to him. It's all really embarrassing. Seb keeps his head down, but he can feel their sympathetic gazes burning into him. He knows Ollie will be glaring at the young women. Fury burning from his eyes. Ollie hates people feeling sorry for them. Seb doesn't care. He feels sorry for himself. He wants people to feel sorry for him. They should. He has just watched his mother disappear for a second time. Chapter 23 Ollie Coming here, to this place where they spent so many summer holidays when they were young, was a mistake. He'd triggered his brother, who was in a really fucked up state, which was not his intention. He is trying to keep him safe. Even though Seb is as annoying as hell, on some molecular level, they are attached in a way that is different from everyone else in the world. Even when they experience different things, think different things, they are in some weird way connected. And he's the oldest, so he's responsible. He is doing his best, but the whole thing is so fucked up, he doesn't know if a best is even possible, and if it is, he sure as hell doesn't know what it might look like anymore. He swears a lot in his internal monologue. As he does so, he imagines Lee telling him off for it. You're cleverer than that, Ollie. Use the vocabulary I know you have. Show the world you are brilliant and articulate. She was the only one who thought he was brilliant. He is dyslexic, and his teachers sometimes just think he is a fuck whoop. An imbecile, he self-corrects. Not that Lee can hear him or anything, but he does it anyway. What was the point of coming here? He stubs his toe into the pavement, grinds the end of his trainer into the curb as though hoping to make an imprint, an impression. Why is he here? He just had to get Seb out of the house. That was the important part, really. He could have gone anywhere. Once he had the cash, he could have gone to Scotland or Manchester. It's most likely banging up there. He won't acknowledge that he feels sentimental about Lyme Regis, and that he was perhaps drawn here because it is a place where he used to be happy. Maybe it is simply habit that brought him here. He found his way here on autopilot because this is where they always came. It isn't a stretch or a challenge. He's simply here because he's lazy. Or maybe it is more than that. The thing is, he can't shake off Dan Janssen's words. He doesn't trust or believe him exactly, but he decided to test him. Just in case, 
because this isn't a situation where he can risk not checking every possibility, no matter how off the wall the possibilities seem. He sent Janssen a message via the PlayStation app and said that he and Seb would look for evidence to prove Janssen's innocence and that Fiona was involved with Lee's disappearance, but they would need money to do so. Like resources. Dan sent a thousand pounds to Ollie's Monzo account in just minutes. It was unbelievable. A thousand pounds. Why would he do that if he was guilty? Just give away cash trying to prove something unprovable. He wouldn't. So he had to be, well, not precisely innocent, but maybe something in between. And if Janssen didn't do it, someone else had to have. Because she didn't chain herself to the radiator, did she? Ollie shakes his head. He doesn't have a clue, and it is almost too much to think about. He just wanted to have a day off. Really, the only good thing coming out of this is the fact that he's had an all-expenses-paid day at the beach. Or at least it was a good thing until Seb started hallucinating and then having a breakdown in the street. What the fuck? They are sitting on a bench now. Ollie has bought them both hot chocolate. They don't need warming up, exactly, but sweet things are good for shock. He remembers Lee giving him tea with about eight sugars when he fell off his skateboard once during a particularly complex trick and needed stitches. Seb isn't drinking the hot chocolate. He's just staring at it. Ollie hates Lee for leaving him all the parenting. Really hates her. But he isn't being totally fair. Then again, why should he be? What is fair about this? Truthfully, he isn't doing all the parenting stuff. Fiona is washing their clothes and making meals. His scalp seems to shrink as he thinks two things simultaneously. One, his father should have taken over the parenting. Two, Fiona should not have. Ollie looks about aimlessly. There is a young family sitting on the bench next to theirs. A mother with a baby in her arms, and a dad with a sleeping toddler on his lap. The toddler is sprawled, exhausted, no doubt, after a brilliant day making sandcastles and getting high on seaside sugar treats. The dad is managing to drink from a can of beer above the kid's head. There is a carton of chips wedged between the parents. Now and again, the dad feeds one of the steaming, greasy chips into his wife's mouth, or his own. He does so silently. The wife never requests or refuses a chip, just chews them down happily. Her hands are full holding the baby, which is feeding from a bottle. The mother is playing with its toes and keeps murmuring, There, there. Just a moment ago, the baby was screaming its head off, hungry or hot or a combination. There are still tears on its cheeks, but now it seems really content, stretched out in the mother's arms, trusting that she can and will fix everything. Always. Ollie aches. He wishes someone would just walk up to him and take over, fix everything. Obviously, he is too old to sit on a parent's knee, to have his feet stroked. But he longs for someone to pat him on the back and say whatever the equivalent of there, there might be when speaking to a teenager. I got this, or over to me. The weight of it is extraordinary. He feels his life bearing down on his back like a physical load. Exhausting. Ollie starts to wonder about Fiona. Could she be responsible for Lee's abduction and murder? It is unimaginable. Auntie Fee, a killer. He's known her practically his whole life. 
She was Lee's best friend even before that. Would she, could she have hurt her? It is a thousand times harder to believe than blaming a stranger. Harder, but not impossible. If Fiona did have anything to do with it, how can they prove it? He doesn't know exactly, but he supposes starting at her house is as good a place as any. The police have searched it, yes, but they don't know the place like he and Seb do. The two of them might see something the police have missed. Like what, though? He doesn't know. It is all mad. He doesn't believe it. Dan Janssen is fucking with him. His dad will go mental. The sun is totally over itself now, drooping behind the clouds, just a sliver on the horizon in the way that a day-old party balloon drops behind a sofa. Day-trippers are slowly packing up, reluctant to leave the good times behind them. Ollie watches as they file off the beach and head to their cars or the bus. He envies them their sense of purpose, somewhere to go. The air is beginning to cool. The night feels unsettled, unsure. The plan to get a room somewhere seems unrealistic as the time to do so grows closer. Ollie starts to wonder whether he actually dares to walk into a guest house and try. Won't he draw attention to himself and to Seb if he does that? Two kids booking a room without parents is weird, right? He's never had to do anything like it. Besides, since he said that's what they'll do, all he's seen are signs in the window saying, no vacancies. The streets are still full of people eating and drinking. There are more drunks now, loud and leery. He isn't scared or anything. He lives in London and knows when trouble is likely to land. These coastal drunks aren't looking for fights. They're looking for hookups. It is just a different vibe from earlier, and he doesn't want Seb to get scared. He glances at his brother, who is still crying. Silently now, but with a sort of irritating determination to be sad. He isn't the only one who feels like crying, but he is the only one who ever gets to do it. This stupid obsession with thinking Lee could still be alive is boring, and now Seb has completely lost it, imagining he's seen her. Although, if Ollie is being totally honest with himself, he might admit that he went through a stage a bit like that. The first month after she disappeared, he'd think he'd seen her at the end of the street, or jogging, or walking a dog. But the woman he thought was her never was. Obviously, Lee didn't jog, and they didn't have a dog. It was just a case of mistaken identity. Loads of women had long brown hair like hers. Close up, the other not-Lee-after-all women always had funny teeth, or eyes that were too close together, or something else not quite right. The thing is, he doesn't think Lee is alive. But he does think the right person should go down for killing her. He lied to Dan Janssen about that when he said he didn't care. The eternal default setting for teens. In fact, he does believe in justice and people paying for what they've done. Loads of his mates jump the barriers on the tube all the time, but he always pays his way. He is the sort of kid who owns up if he's done something wrong at school, and he thinks others should do the same. There's this one kid in his year, a total shit, Thomas Dobbs, who's always doing sneaky-as-fuck stuff and letting other kids take the blame for it. Sports equipment, stolen and sold, the smell of weed in the classroom at lunchtime, homework he's copied, ideas he's plagiarised, that sort of stuff. He's a straight A-grade student, though, so teachers never think he does any of this crap. He never owns up to anything, even if it means an entire class is put on detention. 
It doesn't sit right with Ollie. Do crap, yeah, but own it. We should go to Fiona's after all, Ollie says to Seb. He has to have a plan of some sort. Sleeping on the street isn't an option. He points to Seb's mask, a dingy blue disposable one, lying forlornly on the bench. You should keep it on. No way! Why would I? People will be looking for us. Dad will have called the police. Really? You think so? Seb checks the time. It's 9pm. I feel bad. Ollie is unsure whether Seb feels bad because their dad will be worried, or because the layers of treats feel heavy and sickly in his belly. The matter is cleared up when he adds, Maybe we should ring him and say we're fine. Tell him where we are. No. Then send him a text message at least. No. Ollie has brought the key with him. When the police returned it, Fiona hung it up in the understairs cupboard where there is a wooden wall-mounted key holder with the words, So good to be home, painted across it. Lee must have bought that. Fucking hilarious if you think about it. As Ollie took Fiona's house key, easily identifiable because it was attached to a fossil key ring, he noted that Fiona had three pairs of trainers and a pair of heels, some sliders, and two pairs of sandals in the cupboard too. That's like loads of shoes. The recent days have smudged into weeks and months, many of them hot and heavy, all of them empty and endless. He can't remember. Did Fiona move in when they were still looking for Lee? Wasn't the deal that she was coming just to keep them company while they waited for news? When did she bring her enormous suitcase, her Kardashian-worthy selection of shoes? He isn't sure. The shoes suggest she knew she was staying a while. Forever? Does she know they're never going to find Lee? The thought makes his blood slow, leaves him clammy. But his next thought is worse. The next thought makes him want to find a toilet. What has his dad got involved with this time? Chapter 24 D.C. Clements Mark Fletcher is frantic. His boys are missing too now. Clement's gut response is, this bloody idiot man. But she works swiftly, automatically, ever the professional. It takes just moments to conquer her gut response and bring her reason to the forefront. She has to establish whether she should pity him or distrust him. A missing wife, now two missing sons. Other people limit their carelessness to car keys or their reading glasses. Has someone taken the boys, or have they run away? No matter which, the two minors are in danger. That is Clement's priority. They've run away, Mark asserts. He must know this looks bad. Is there a note? asks Clements. No. When did you last see them? Last night when they went to bed, or at least when they went up to their rooms, they were playing video games. What time? About 9.30. 23 hours ago. It's 8.30 p.m. now. Clements waits a beat. You haven't seen them or heard from them all day? She is aware that she sounds exasperated. She is. Many, many parents will have lost track of their teens today. Thousands, probably. Kids are desperate to flex, to hunt out some fun, some contemporary companionship, some rebellion. A lot of beat bobbies have spent the day breaking up drunken spats, encouraging worse-for-wear revelers to go home, sleep it off. When Mark says, slightly apologetically, slightly defensively, It's Super Saturday. When we got up this morning, we just assumed they'd gone out early to make the most of it. 
Clements has some sympathy, but for fuck's sake, his kids are not like everyone else's naturally curious and buoyant teens. His kids are in the eye of a media frenzy. They are grieving. They are mixed up. He should have taken more care. She tries not to be judgy, but truthfully, it's her default setting. Her job would be much easier if people weren't so damned irresponsible. She probably ought to feel sorrier for Mark. He too is in the centre of a media frenzy. He's grieving, mixed up. But she finds she's just a bit irritated with him. Stupid, careless man, never quite noticing what is under his nose. What isn't? We, she challenges. She knows the answer, but wants to make him say it. Me and Fiona. He sounds cautious. Clements recalls one of her earliest conscious snap judgments of this case. Mark Fletcher, family man. Dan Janssen, ladies man. How does that sit now? She has the ladies man under arrest, awaiting trial for the abduction and murder of Mark Fletcher's wife. But the trial hasn't even come to court yet. As the parlance goes, Kylie Gillingham isn't cold in her grave. In fact, there isn't a grave. They haven't even found her body. Clements is aware that the grieving process might not be straightforward in this case. When is it ever? But she feels the family man's behaviour is a bit shoddy. Cozying up with the best friend at such a speed is, at the very least, confusing for the kids. Cozying up? or shacking up. Fine line. Separate beds, obviously, Fletcher says with a forced laugh. Why did he feel the need to add that? Clements hadn't asked for clarification, and she doesn't have to now. He's clarified something he probably was hoping to hide. More likely than not, they are sleeping together. So... Fiona's behaviour? Clements has to consider this too. Fiona's actions don't quite add up. If she's moved into the Fletcher household to care for her missing friend's boys, as she repeatedly reiterates, shouldn't she be doing a better job of it? From the moment Clements picked up Kylie Gillingham's case, she's cared a little bit more than she should. She is aware of that. She cares for all the incarnations of the woman, her entire messy whole. Mark gave her a photo of Lee Fletcher when he first reported his wife missing, a woman with big, soulful brown eyes. She was beaming in the snap, a broad, determined smile. But there was something about her eyes that made Clements wonder from the outset. She looked weary, drained done for. More tired than most working mums, who generally are set too exhausted. Maybe she knew on some level where this was all heading. She must have known she couldn't get away with it forever. Although, she could never have imagined she'd end up chained to a radiator, starved, beaten, dead. Not many people die for their crimes. Even murderers brought to court might expect a matter of years. Life doesn't mean life in the UK. Clements wishes it bloody did. But Kylie hadn't murdered anyone. She was just a bigamist, a crime that carried an average sentence of two years. Clements also cares for the other version. Sleek, groomed, ostensibly indulged Kai Janssen the woman who kept a logbook detailing who came to dinner when and what they were served. That level of organisation, control, paranoia, fascinates her. It's clear that Kai Janssen did not sit comfortably with the great and the good that her husband brought home to eat with them. Her meticulous notes about entertaining, her obsessively neat wardrobe, clothes catalogued and hung by colour, her lack of contacts in her phone all suggest a tightly controlled life, one that was clipped, 
pinched and measured, despite the abundant wealth and the obvious resources that should have meant possibilities. Clements thinks that perhaps Kai refused to take advantage of all that was on offer. Perhaps the weight of her position, the fact that she was cheating her way into the opulence, sat too heavily, and she couldn't quite enjoy it. Although, she couldn't quite give it up either, could she? Maybe the sex was wild and abandoned. Maybe that was the irresistible draw to the other man, the second life. Clements hopes so. She wants Kai to have had as many good times as possible, considering how everything turned out. Yes, Clements likes every version of Kylie Gillingham, the woman who spat in the eye of convention. She can't see the criminal in either incarnation, and she loathes the fact that the woman has been turned into a victim, a statistic. It's the hardest part of the job, having a front row seat to the filthy underbelly of humanity and keeping count of those who suffer at the hands of others. At least Kylie managed to defy convention for a time. Until the ducking chair slash burning at the stake mentality, or whatever the hell it is that always seems to win the day, reasserted control. It seems convention has it that rebellious women must be punished brought into line. There is no patience or space for those who refuse to conform in this world. Sometimes Clements finishes that sentence with the word, yet. Other times she finishes it with the word, still. It depends on how her week is panning out. The fact is, the moment when she and Tanner ran into the destroyed apartment room where Kylie had been held and found it empty was one of the worst of her career. She was so close. So damned hopeful. For a fleeting second, she allowed herself to believe they would find Kylie alive. That they'd save the day. Tanner wants a body or a confession. Clements once more. She hardly dares think it, certainly won't articulate it, because they have a case. All the evidence points directly at Dan Janssen. Basically open and shut. Basically. But something still nags at her. It's as though someone is breathing on her neck. Not breathing down her neck, not accusing or watching her as such, just reminding her of their presence. She doesn't believe in ghosts, but she does believe in her gut, and she does believe in doing a good job. A good job in a murder case means finding the correct culprit, obviously. A case being basically open and shut is an oxymoron. Yes, all the evidence points to Dan Janssen yet Clements has started to wonder about something in particular. As she lies awake at night, staring at the ceiling, she finds herself asking why Dan Janssen reported his wife missing in the first place. If he murdered her as revenge for her bigamy, he would have known that even though her life had been lived in duplicate, there could only ever be one body he did not have to associate himself with her going missing at all. Kai Janssen could have simply vanished, and her disappearance could be explained to Dan's friends and family as a sad but not unusual marital breakup, the subsequent lack of contact justified through a desire for a clean break. Kai didn't seem to have any friends of her own. It was unlikely anyone would have vigorously pursued the matter of her whereabouts, if Dan had killed her, the clever thing to do would be not to report her missing. It would have been a less risky move, a less humiliating one as well. If a body had ever turned up, that body would be identified as Lee Fletcher. Dan did not have to make himself known to the police. Mark was not in the same position. Lee Fletcher had friends, children, family. She would have been missed. 
There was no way he could have killed her and then pretended she'd simply walked out on them. Mark Fletcher had no alternative but to go to the police, whether he was the killer or not. Mark Fletcher, who is now living with his wife's best friend and whose sons have vanished. Should Clements be concerned for Fiona Philipson or concerned by her? She allows the thought to roll around her mind. It's brutal to think that women live in a misogynistic world with the dice weighted against them, the cards dealt unfairly, often with nothing up their sleeves, encountering insults, prejudice and violence at male whim with horrific regularity. That is hard to swallow. But there is something worse still for feminist Clements to contemplate. The fact that men are not the only enemy. They have a case with a lot of physical evidence, but she can't quite dismiss the thought that the evidence is... What? Circumstantial? No, not quite that. Convenient? Maybe. It's always the best friend, doesn't have the same ring to it as it's always the husband. And yet... She shakes her head. She's conscious that she is often told she has too much imagination for a cop, that she ought to keep it in check. It is a fair point, perhaps, although only ever made by the unimaginative. Sometimes she secretly congratulates herself on this particular character trait. She views problems through a different lens. And that is often a good thing in life. Still, she has to admit, it's perfectly possible that she is reading too much into the home share arrangement. Clements knows that she can't think about Kylie Gillingham's case at this moment. What is most important right now is the whereabouts of the boys. What have you done to find them? she asks. We've called their phones. They are both switched off. Seb often turns his off. He's not so dependent on it, but Ollie never does. It's definitely out of character. And you've left messages in case they turn them on again? Of course. Voice and text. No response. Do you have any sort of tracking on their phones? Find my iPhone, that sort of thing? Yes, but as they've turned them off, the last place they're registering is here at home. Have you called their friends? Of course, and their Aunt Paula. I've called everyone I can think of. No one has seen them. It's not like them to go off without telling me what they're up to. We're all quite careful with each other, you know? I can imagine. Clements knows there are set questions to ask about children who have potentially run away. For instance... Has there been any upset at home? Obviously, she already knows the answers to this. Are the children under any pressure? Have there been any changes in mood or behaviour? Are they speaking to strangers? Maybe the boys are just making the most of Super Saturday. It's not late. The night is young, in fact. They could be hanging out at a cinema or bowling alley, doing something wholesome. Maybe. Hopefully. Possibly not. She tucks her phone under her chin and starts to fill out the missing persons information log. She confirms the boys' full names, asks for date of birth, height, weight, and whether they have any particular identification marks. What clothing were they wearing last time you saw them? Pyjama shorts, I guess. I don't know. Well, they're unlikely to have left the house in those. Is there any chance you can work out what's missing? Not really. I don't keep track of the T-shirts. They both have loads. Check to see if rucksacks, water bottles, bikes, etc. have gone. She creates a crime reference number. She's supposed to go off duty in ten minutes. She's never off duty. I'll come over now and take a full statement. We'll get eyes to start searching the areas the boys are known to frequent. We'll check local hospital admissions and start reviewing CCTV footage. We can look at their computers, see if we can get an idea who they're speaking to. Clement sighs as she hangs up. She feels the weight of this latest development. She speedily briefs Tanner. 
your initial thoughts? He asks. She's surprised he hasn't just dumped his own as per. She realises that he's beginning to respect her experience, her instincts. Obviously, I'm hoping they've taken themselves off, rather than this being another abduction, but nothing can be ruled out at this stage. But if we do assume they're runaways, do you think they're running towards or away from something? That's one of the things we have to find out. Maybe they know something we don't, or at least think they do, suggests Tanner, about their mother or her murderer. Possible. All I know is that happy kids don't run away. Chapter 25 Fiona Fiona can't understand why Mark is fretting. To her, it is obvious where the boys have gone. How has he not thought of it? Her hunch is confirmed when she checks the rack in the cupboard and discovers the key for her bungalow is missing. Mark has nothing to fear. The boys know the area. Ollie is 16 now. He has done the train trip quite a few times. He's a responsible brother. He'll look out for Seb. They will turn up sooner rather than later, most likely when they are hungry. They can't have much money on them. Neither of them is a saver. They'll soon discover that Lyme Regis isn't the holiday resort of their imaginings once they realise they don't have an adult with endless pockets on hand to pay for ice creams and hours in the amusement arcades. They'll most likely call and ask to be picked up at some point soon. Mark keeps muttering about it being like Lee all over again. Which is crazy. The boys haven't been abducted. They aren't going to be pushed off a cliff. There really isn't anything for Mark to be concerned about. Nothing bad will happen to them in Lyme Regis. Fiona, however, has a lot to be concerned about. Not only is it really annoying that her first day of freedom has been commandeered, no shopping or haircut for her, as it would have looked callous if she hadn't demonstrated some concern for the boys' whereabouts, but, more importantly, Ollie and Seb dashing off like this is unpredictable something she hasn't accounted for. The more she thinks about their unpredictable behaviour, the more uncomfortable she is. By late afternoon, she would go so far as to say she is actively agitated. She has to concentrate very hard to think clearly. She needs to be a step ahead. She needs to have thought of everything. That's how a person gets away with murder. Most likely, the boys are looking for nothing more than somewhere to let their hair down. They probably just want a break, to get away from London. After all, they have been locked down for months, and she'd guess they simply don't have the imagination to think beyond the holiday destination they've frequently visited in the past. She repeatedly tells herself that is what is most probable. However, it is impossible for her not to be aware that she murdered Lee at said frequently visited holiday destination, so she doesn't like the thought of the boys snooping around there. She doesn't like it at all. She can't imagine they will find anything that might incriminate her. She's been careful. The only things to find were the things she planted for the police to discover, which they duly did. In Fiona's experience, people tend to see what they want to, which worked against her when she trusted Lee, believed her to be her best friend, and was so blind to her treachery and lies, but worked to her advantage when the police were looking to pin Kylie's abduction and murder on one of her husbands. They quickly reached the conclusions she'd hoped they would. Still, she doesn't want the police to go back to the scene of the crime and snoop further. If they work out where the boys have run off to, they might pursue them. The thought makes her uneasy. She has to consider all possibilities, even the inconvenient or distasteful ones. What if she and Kylie were seen by a neighbour 
or a stranger back on that night in March. She doesn't think they were. No one has ever come forward and said as much, but memories are intricate, capricious things. People might remember more if they recognize the boys. They may recall seeing them with their stepmother on a past holiday, or even with Fiona herself. That sort of connection would be dangerous, because then someone might remember seeing Kylie with Fiona that final time. It is possible that they were spotted. Fiona doesn't recall seeing anyone, but it was dark and stormy and she was distracted, obviously. Killing a person takes a lot of brain space. She accepts that there might have been an individual forced out of their house, despite the inclement weather, out walking their dog, for example. A witness who may have remained cloaked by the dark sky. Her head is pounding now. A loud, distracting banging that pummels her reason and nerves. It is tricky to think clearly, something she absolutely must do. She can't deny it. Sometimes she is frightened by how things have turned out. Scared and surprised by what she has become and what might yet lie in front of her. She doesn't sleep well, even with the use of medication. She never imagined she'd become a murderer. Who does? It wasn't her plan. She just wanted to punish Kylie, teach her a lesson. Things simply got out of hand, went too far. Fiona repeatedly reminds herself that it was Kylie who became a criminal first. Kylie, who set them both on this path towards such vile darkness. Fiona really wasn't left with any other choice. All she wanted was some acknowledgement of the chaos caused, an apology, maybe. But Kylie was so damned smug, so unrepentant. Besides, once both Dan and Mark were aware of her disgusting duplicity, her casual cruelty, what sort of life could she have ever gone back to? Neither of them would have wanted her once they knew what she really was. Her lives were over before Fiona killed her. Fiona couldn't be blamed for that. Sometimes, though, Fiona thinks about the early version of Kylie. That woman fights her way into Fiona's fitful sleep and her waking subliminal mind. She doesn't want Kylie there, persistent, noisy, sad. Her presence is annoying irritating. And yet, sometimes, she finds a strange comfort in seeing her old friend, the woman she once loved, before she hated. They met not long after they both graduated. They were looking for their first job and had signed up to the same recruitment agency. Just a chance encounter in a waiting room. But it shaped both their lives. Fiona doesn't want to get too sentimental about that. After all, what is life other than a series of chance encounters that people grab at and try to grapple into meaning? The two young women instantly clicked, and they became really close. There was a point when they were totally there for one another, no questions asked. Inseparable. Thoughts, aspirations, cravings, all aligned. They were each other's people. Although even at the time, neither thought that was the ideal situation. Both wanted to find a husband and then have kids that they could love more than they loved each other. Of course, it only happened for Kylie. Twice. The thought burns Fiona, as though someone is holding a match to the soft, fleshy bit of skin on her upper arm. Kylie betrayed Mark and Dan. Everyone gets that, but she betrayed Fiona too. Way back before the bigamy, she betrayed her when she married Mark and left Fiona alone. Fiona had to suffer endless blind dates without even the comfort of returning to their flat and knowing that Kylie would be there, ready to laugh at the night's antics the way they often had when they were both dating. 
She was doomed to creating humiliating internet profiles alone. She endured countless meaningless shags, morning after rejections, ghosting, and catfishing. Without help or companionship, she faced the conundrum of whether she ought to present as a cool girl, who didn't expect commitment, exclusivity, or even decent communication, or risk being labelled insecure and clingy. Supportless, she negotiated the many weird stages that were part and parcel of the run-up to being in a relationship nowadays. Texting, talking, seeing each other, dating non-exclusively, then exclusive but not actually in an official relationship, and all of this in the hope of finally reaching the nirvana of a full-blown relationship. People could be so damned mean. Of course people do fall in love. People do marry. Fiona gets that. That wasn't the issue. Fiona believes the ultimate betrayal that Kylie committed against her was not that she fell in love and married Mark. No, the treachery was that she didn't consider Mark enough. In Fiona's opinion, Kylie didn't split herself in two, Lee and Kai. She had, in fact, doubled. Gobbled up two men. She should never have done what she did, considering all that she'd had with the first. If being married and a mum couldn't make Kylie happy, what the hell was Fiona striving for? There's no point in romanticising her now, just because she's dead. Fiona recalls that Kylie hadn't had much idea or drive back in the beginning when they first met. Her ambition was limited to a desire not to be a server in a coffee shop forever. She mentioned that an office job would at least mean she had an excuse to buy decent clothes. She used to present her early career as a textbook approach to resilience and persistence. Fiona thought it was more of an example of chaotic indiscrimination that eventually led to Kylie stumbling into an unwarranted opportunity. If you throw enough mud, some sticks. Fiona watched as Kylie wormed her way up to an undeniably impressive management position in a global consultancy. She was delighted for her at the time, of course. She took her out for champagne to celebrate every one of her promotions. Yes, delighted. And also a tiny bit irked, because the truth was, everything always sort of landed in Kylie's lap. And that just didn't seem fair. It was always the same with Kylie. Often as not, someone would take a liking to her and just offer her something she hadn't really earned. Like free food at the restaurant she was working at when they met. Or a tip-off as to where a decent flat was being advertised. Or a hint as to what might be a wise next rung on the career ladder. People just seemed to want to help her. Mark did the same thing, when you think about it. He'd just taken a liking to her and offered his ready-made family. Fiona was in the play park when Mark and Kylie first met. It could just as easily have been her who caught Mark's attention, who he welcomed into his family, his bed, his home, but somehow, as always, the good fortune landed at Kylie's feet. Just because she was the one to dash up and perform first aid on Seb after he fell off the slide. She didn't even know any first aid. She said later that her response had been instinctual rather than expert. It was really rather risky of her. Some might say she just poked her nose into another person's business. Made herself important. Kylie didn't really value her high-flying position that she'd hustled her way into. She chucked it in the minute she inherited off her father, because she was running a double life and couldn't hold down a job as well as two husbands. She must have been delighted when her estranged dad unexpectedly came through for her and afforded her the opportunity to deceive both her husbands. A lifetime of neglect made up for in one fell swoop. The luck the woman had was unbelievable, Kylie always landed on her feet. Fiona allows herself a small internal smile at the subconscious choice of metaphor. There is no way that Kylie fell on her feet when she tumbled over the cliff. Her luck had finally run out.
Well, all good things come to an end. Eventually. Fiona herself always had a much clearer idea of what she wanted out of life, and she worked hard to achieve it. She had to. It's unfair to think things never panned out as easily for her. She was never handed anything on a plate. No one ever rushed to help her. She hasn't inherited a penny. Both her parents are still alive and still together, insisting on living their best lives, which means they seem pretty determined to spend all their money before they die. Kylie was always going on about how lucky Fiona was to have two loving, adventurous parents, but there will be no unexpected windfalls fluttering Fiona's way. She has always known she'd have to make her own way in life. When the two women met all those years ago in the recruitment office, Fiona had a clear passion to work in fashion. She envisaged herself as a buyer for a decent-sized department store, going to catwalk exhibitions where they showcased the new seasons, ultimately setting the trends as to what people might decide to wear, perhaps through writing for a magazine or working as a consultant in one of the big fashion houses. However, fashion turned out to be an incredibly competitive industry. The best roles went to the anorexically thin women with trust funds, or the gay guys who all stuck together. Fiona wasn't either. It wasn't fair. So she diverted her creative talent, her colossal ambition, and her work ethic towards interior design. No one could call her a quitter. The interiors industry tends to be dominated by middle-aged women with wealthy husbands and a little bit of flair, but no ambition to speak of, so she cleaned up. But it is all her own hard work. She sighs. Thinking about Kylie is uncomfortable for her. She wishes she could simply put her out of mind. But considering everything, she knows that is never going to happen. She recalls every moment of their last encounter in lurid detail. The narrow, winding path, the ground wet underfoot, having to shout to be heard above the wind and the sea, making Kylie finally decide. Tell me which one of them you love the most. I don't know why it matters. It's not as though I'm going to get to choose between them. Just pick one. I took immeasurable risks for Dan. I lost friends for him. Th that shows I love him. You don't know what love is. But I do. Twice over. I love them both. That's not allowed. I know. But who decided it wasn't? Pick one. Mark. Mark, Ollie and Seb outweigh Dan. I guess they always did. I was never able to leave them. I choose Mark. Right. Good. I'm glad we've got that cleared up. Finally. She remembers the feel of Kylie's body through her clothes as she brought up her hands and shoved hard. It was solid yet soft. Not at all resistant. She folded into the fall. Accepted the inevitability of it. Her face was so white, it was almost transparent. Her features spun through a myriad of emotions in that split second. The initial shock as she tumbled over the edge was almost immediately replaced by horror, but then, and Fiona is almost sure of this, she looked glad. Relieved it was over at last, most likely. Fiona likes to think that on some level, her friend knew she was doing her a favour. Sorting out the mess Kylie had created. She shakes her head, tries to dislodge the thoughts. Difficult, since everything around her belongs to Kylie and is a reminder of Kylie's life with Mark. Maybe she ought to redecorate. She has no intention of moving out. That would be such a backward step unthinkable after everything she's gone through to get to this point. 
Could Mark ever be persuaded to sell this house and make a fresh start? It would be a good move for everyone. She swallows down a couple of paracetamol tablets. She doesn't bother with water. She has been taking a lot of medication recently, and she can knock tablets back like shots. Even so, these painkillers aren't doing much to combat the pounding in her head or the rage in her blood that seems to flow through her, poisoning her. Truth is, the fury against Kylie hasn't subsided, even though she has been dealt with, even though she is dead. It sometimes settles in Fiona's throat, growing there like a cancer. She feels like there is a tie around her neck, a tie that is pulled too tight. She is choking. She needs to hold her shit together, stay calm, stay a step ahead. She has a lot to play for. The husband, the house, the boys. And she has a lot to lose. The thought of prison makes her freeze. She doesn't want the police tracking the boys. It's best if she deals with them herself. Mark, I'm going out to look for Seb and Ollie. Should I come with you? I didn't the police suggest it was best that you stayed here, in case they rock up, which, by the way, I'm sure they will. She smiles at him, risks putting a hand on his arm, squeezing. She's never certain how much physical contact she should initiate. She's careful about that, lets him take the lead. She never knows when he'll knock at her door at night, peel back the duvet, climb between her sheets. She always readily submits whenever he does, shows clear enthusiasm. There will come a time when she approaches him in that way. She has to believe that. But she's not certain when that time might be. Where are you going to look for them? He asks. He has no ideas of his own, and that irritates Fiona, to be frank. He should have. I thought I'd start at the skate park on the south bank. Ollie likes hanging out there. I'll have my phone on and I'll keep in touch. Don't worry about me. Mark nods and turns his attention back to his phone. Checks his messages for the hundredth time. Fiona smothers the thought that her last instruction was unnecessary. There is nothing about Mark's demeanour that suggests he has ever spent a single moment worrying about her. Chapter 26 Stacy It is starting to get dark, as the journey home takes far longer than it should. Traffic curls around every winding road. The lanes are soon clogged. On three occasions, a stream of vehicles are forced to reverse on a single track road to give way to oncoming traffic. Some drivers appear flustered or incompetent. There's a lot of posturing. My dad manages all the manoeuvres steadily and skillfully, but the atmosphere is still charged. Tension rolls through the car like a sea mist. It smells of us. Bodies that wash in the sea more often than in the shower. Dusty plastic dashboard. Feet. I press the button to open a window. Nothing happens. It's broken, Dad mutters. These are the first words he's said since I got in the car. I glance his way and catch his gaze. Cold. Cross. He's furious with me for slipping out of the house and going to a crowded town where I might become infected. When he found me in Lyme Regis, he was purple in the face, incandescent. He repeatedly spat out the words, All these people, Stacy! So many people! I am equally furious with him because he forced me to abandon my research trip. I feel like a naughty teen who has ignored her curfew and whose parent has crashed the party, turned off the music, switched on all the lights and exposed the teenagers who are smoking dope and copping off. 
it's mortifying. Because of the traffic jams, we're driving incredibly slowly. In fact, we're often completely static. I could get out of the car at any point and walk back to the town that was gifting me some memories. I'm not trapped. I'm not being restrained. Yet somehow it feels like I am. Because considering Dad's worry for my health, acting independently leaves me feeling selfish. Eventually, the traffic loosens and falls away. And in the last stretch homeward, Dad puts his foot down and travels at speed. Too much speed, in fact. He takes the bends aggressively, no doubt as a way of venting his frustration at me. I wish he'd slow down. If the cancer doesn't get me, a head-on collision with a tree most certainly will. At one point, my head almost touches the car's roof as he takes a bump at speed. The car is old, and the suspension does little to cushion the impact. The headlights bounce on the road ahead, and startled animals scamper out of danger, their eyes glinting with terror. I hope to hell no child of a holidaymaker strays out in front of us like the rabbits, foxes, and mice have. A child wouldn't be as quick or knowing about getting out of the way. Slow down, Dad. I grip my library books, and my knuckles turn white. Oh, now you want to be sensible. He bites back with uncharacteristic sarcasm. I turn my head away from him and study the farmhouses in the distance. These homes are filled with people living ordered lives, lives they understand and control. They will have pasts, presents and futures, memories, purpose, ambitions that they will quite naturally take for granted. I feel envious. It's perfectly possible that the people in these houses were once great friends of mine, but their lives are unknown to me now. Not surprisingly, as I am only just beginning to know my own life again. Hope bubbles up. And even my father's furious disappointment in me can't pop the excited swell of possibility. Today, I met a school friend, and I recognised the geography of the streets. Real progress. As we approach our cottage, Dad's profile is illuminated by a light on the corner of the property. He's waxy, yellow, like a corpse. There's no hint of his usual warmth. His eyes are black, like bodies of treacherous still water. I don't think now is the time to tell him of my triumphs. He pulls up close to the house and switches off the engine. My legs feel heavy. I don't want to go inside. I'm not done with outside, only just starting. His protectiveness of me is veering into something annoying, restrictive. I want to yell at him for picking me up and forcing me to come home, but I can't. I know he's worried about me and means well. My protest manifests in a silent mini sit-in. He sighs, gets out the car. Come on, let's be having you. You need bath and bed. You need to take things easy, Stacy. He opens the back door, ushers me inside. He oozes a sense of ownership and father knows best that irritates me. Ronnie bounces about, his claws scratching on the wooden floor, his tail wagging so enthusiastically it beats my leg and the kitchen units. Thump, thump, thump. He nuzzles our hands and I pat him. I realise that meeting Dad's fury with my own irritation is pointless. So I am about to offer to put the kettle on, but Dad turns from me, reaches for the whiskey bottle and pours. He seems to pause, as though considering whether to include me or exclude me. I watch his back bent over the glasses, and I'm relieved when he eventually turns and hands me one. He drains his quickly flops into the armchair. Have you eaten anything? I ask. I haven't eaten all day, he snaps. The onus of his omission swells in my conscience. 
Should I make supper? I offer. Dad looks at me for a long time, as though I am a puzzle to him that he is trying to solve, which I suppose I am. He chews the nail on his thumb. I'm not hungry. His attitude is unbecoming and honestly fairly annoying. As I don't remember our life before, I have no idea if he has a propensity to sulk or how long it might last. I don't know if it's a case of waiting it out or whether I can coax him back into a better mood. Even though it is a warm night outside, the cottage is nearly always cold. I drop to my knees and start to build a fire in the hearth. I scrunch up newspaper into balls, add kindling. Once that's taken, I carefully layer on sticks, then logs, crisscrossed and increasing in bulk. By the time the fire is roaring, Dad is asleep in the chair. I suppose today has exhausted him, and once again I feel a flare of guilt flash through my body. I wonder how I'm going to manage his concern and my own need to explore and reintegrate, because somehow I must. However, that feels like a question for another day. I put the guard around the fireplace and sit in the chair opposite Dad's, sipping the large whiskey he poured me. The amber liquid dances and catches the light from the fire. When I sip, it burns my throat. His mouth is slack, and his forehead has a sheen to it. Sweaty panic. After a time, his head falls forward, and I can see his pink scalp beneath the slick of silver hair. I study him as he studied me earlier. He's not a puzzle, exactly. In some ways, he's an open book with large, easy-to-read print. He's simply a man who loves his daughter dearly above everything and everyone else. Yet he is unknown. I keep hoping that if I look at him for long enough, I'll recognize him. That I'll remember us. I sit for the longest time, and then I stand and lean close to him. I put the tip of my nose to his head and inhale, because I think heads smell quite distinctive. I think I will remember him, as today I remembered the smell of freshly baked pasties, slick with fat, drifting up Bridge Street, and the briny air near the flotilla of small boats bobbing close to the shore. I take two or three deep inhalations. Nothing. Chapter 27 D.C. Clements What are you doing? Jesus, Tanner, you made me jump. D.C. Clements almost knocks the box she is rooting through off the shelf. What are you doing in here? Tanner's tone is cold, suspicious. The evidence room is a prosaic place, less glamorous than the name suggests. More of a cupboard, really, painted in a vanilla tone, rows of shelves that house boxes that hold lives. It's not especially prepossessing, but it is sacrosanct. It has gravitas. This is where a deal might be sealed and a criminal trapped, something they collectively work for. They all have hunches and theories and thoughts, but evidence is what it boils down to. There are procedures to get access. Electronic and physical signing in is necessary. Visits are generally only made in pairs. No one wants to be accused of tampering with evidence. Clements is alone, late at night, rooting through the boxes of evidence that pertain to Kylie Gillingham's case. She knows she looks shifty. I'm looking for something. Yeah. Obviously. What? She is impressed that Tanner is challenging her. Pleased with him. Other senior officers might take offence, 
but Clements feels a swell of pride. She is as straight as an arrow, but there are bent cops, and it is up to the good ones to root them out. The not so good, the bad, the downright evil. She respects the fact that Tanner is prepared to challenge her, that he distrusts her a tiny bit. It also makes her think his instincts are a bit off. Daft bugger. Nothing bad, Tanner, although nice call out. His jaw remains jutted, his teeth set. No, seriously, well done. Always ask what a copper is doing in this room after hours. There is cash and drugs, and police officers aren't saints. Often far from it. However, I was looking for this. She triumphantly holds up a wine bottle in a plastic bag. It was never sent to forensics. What is it? A wine bottle. Ha, ah, bloody heart, you know what I mean. It's the bottle I found that day we searched Fiona Phillipson's house. I remember a wine glass, not a bottle. The glass had Dan Janssen's prints on. Correct, but this bottle wasn't in her house. It was on the clifftop. So maybe not anything to do with the case. Anyone could have left it there. They could have. That's what we thought to begin with. That's why we didn't send it away. Why waste the resources when it was a long shot? We thought maybe we'd send it if the other evidence didn't cough up anything. Which it did. As I say, the glass had Janssen's prints on it, which placed him at the seaside place he insists he's never visited. Correct again. Great recall. Tanner looks uncertain. Clements has seen him wear this expression before. The one that says he isn't sure what his boss has up her sleeve, but he is sure there is something. They both know she is always a step ahead. He likes it about her, and it exhausts him at the same time, because he wants to keep up. She likes that about him. As you say, this bottle could have been left on the cliff by anyone. I'm just wondering if anyone is someone in this case. I want to send it away and have it checked for prints. I need you to pull in favours, get someone to push it through ASAP. Tonight, ideally. You think they'll get a read on the prints after all this time? If we're lucky. Depends what elements the bottle was exposed to before we bagged it up. I'll leave that with you. I need to get moving. Clements is almost out the door as she says this. Where are you going? To look for the boys. Tanner doesn't need to ask which boys. He knows that his boss has been consumed with this case for months. Where do you think they are? Everyone likes to be beside the seaside, beside the sea, Tanner, says Clements. At Lyme Regis, you can still find Knickerbocker glories, non-ironic ones, pink sausages, artery-clogging pasties. I want in on that. I'll get on it with your mates in forensics and I'll meet you at the bungalow. Good lad. Clement smiles to herself as the door bangs behind her. She doesn't need backup, but she'd like him there all the same. Chapter 28 Ollie It takes ages to walk to Fiona's place. About a million times, Ollie wonders whether they're making the right call by bothering to go there at all. But he can't think of what else to do, or where else to go. So he puts one foot in front of the other and plods on. Not exactly committing to a plan, not exactly rejecting it either. He's beginning to think that's what life amounts to, plodding on. He hopes not. Probably Lee would have laughed at him if she'd ever heard him say as much. Thrown her head back and barked out an enormous guffaw, insisted that he was too young to be so sapped and cynical. She was always challenging him on what she called morose teenage stuff. She maintained it didn't suit him, insisted that life was for leaping into, charging at. 
she would have insisted on being all positive and motivational. She almost always was. She'd maybe have said that he'd come across a few dead ends, but there would always be wide avenues and open fields to dash towards, mountains to conquer. It is sort of weirdly helpful imagining what she might have said, if she could. Funny, because Ollie used to find it hideously embarrassing and awkward. She hoped for so much for him and for Seb. She believed their lives were going to be brilliant. He used to find it intense, and most often he just left the room when she got that fervent look in her eye. It was too much. Now he sort of misses it. Her confidence, her assurance, her belief in him. Part of him regrets treating her like crap for the six months before she died. Well, specifically, he regrets seeing her with Dan Janssen and knowing that she was a lying bitch before everyone else did. So feeling compelled to treat her like crap. It made things harder for him. Sometimes he wonders whether things might have turned out differently if he'd just challenged her back then when he first saw her strolling along the south bank, holding hands with that prick. Maybe if he'd called her out then, things would have ended differently. Yeah, there would have been massive rows, consequences at the time. Probably a divorce. And he'd been so scared of that then. But now he sees that wouldn't have been the worst thing. She wouldn't be dead. Is it his fault? The thought flashes in his head, and he longs to hear Lee's voice. She would give out to him for blaming himself. He tries to imagine her saying something like, Damn straight it isn't your fault, Ollie. I made my own mistakes. Don't take this on. He knows she would have said that because sometimes when he caused a fight between her and his dad, say, because he wanted to stay out late for a party and she thought it was okay and his dad didn't, she'd tell him it wasn't his fault that they were disagreeing. Your dad and I decide what we want a discussion about. It's not all about you, she'd joke. They did fight about him, though. Like when he wouldn't call her mum anymore. She begged his dad to intervene, which he didn't. She still didn't blame Ollie. In fact, she went to quite some lengths to avoid him hearing the disagreements that were about him. Those usually played out in hissed whispers late at night. He listened to them through walls, or from the top of the stairs. His ears burn now when he remembers that he liked hearing them row that he got a sense of satisfaction from it. The morning after, he would always make a point of asking Lee if they had been arguing, trying to get a reaction from her, trying to make her feel bad. But she always said everything was fine. She'd smile at him, tell him not to worry. At the time, he thought she was just trying to protect herself, Avoid discussing anything that might expose her as an adulterous bitch. But now he wonders whether there was another reason she always pretended everything was okay. Like maybe it was possible that she was trying to protect him from anything upsetting. His hands feel sweaty, and his mouth dry thinking this. He keeps thinking too about what Dan Janssen said. Not just the bit about Fiona being a killer. Clearly he absorbed that on some level, or why else is he here? But the other bit. The bit about how much Lee loved him and Seb. The fact she couldn't leave them. Was Janssen right about that? He shakes his head. It doesn't matter. It's too late either way. She's dead. But if it is true, if she did love them in a way no one else did, then that's... Ollie can't pursue the thought. He doesn't know why that is. It makes him feel so, so sad, and yet somehow relieved. 
if she loved them that much, it's... Well, it's something. His dad loves him, obviously, and his Auntie Paula does too. But if Lee loved him, them, like a mother, is that better or worse because he hates her so much for dying, for being a bigamist, for letting them down? Seb doesn't whinge once as they slog up the cliff path towards Fiona's place, which is surprising. When they used to walk on Sunday afternoons with their parents, both boys voiced their discontent repeatedly, batting complaints between them like a game of ping pong. Ollie wonders whether Seb is also thinking about Lee's rallying calls. Her stupid motivational stuff is deeply embedded, hard to shake. Or maybe he's still sulking because Ollie wasn't prepared to indulge the fantasy about him seeing Lee alive and her being kidnapped by some old geezer. What the fuck was that? They quietly let themselves into the bungalow, sneaking about as though they fear waking anyone, which is mad because they're alone. Very much so. The place feels stuffy and neglected. It smells of burnt dust. Ollie thought it would feel familiar, and maybe even comforting, so he's disappointed. He turns on the immersion heater so they can have showers, if not now, then in the morning. He looks in the pantry and finds some tins. Do you want tuna and sweet corn mash or baked beans? He asks Seb. Seb turns away, refusing to show an interest. Ollie opens the beans because it's marginally easier than opening two tins and mixing the contents. He doesn't bother to heat them up. They eat straight from the tins, rather than creating washing up. They eat in silence. Afterwards, they collapse onto the beds in the spare room that they always thought of as theirs. Ollie on the left, Seb on the right. No discussion. It's just habit. It takes a matter of minutes before Seb's breathing settles, and Ollie knows he's asleep. Exhausted from the walk, the emotion, the crying, and ultimately, he supposes, the disappointed hope. Ollie is surprised to find he can't fall asleep as easily. He feels oddly jittery, something like he does before a big football match, or before he tries a new trick on his board, but not as good. He's not sure what to do next, what he'll do in the morning. He doesn't know who he trusts or believes. He doesn't know why he came here. The whole thing is a mess. His father is going to be furious, or worried, or hurt. Something bad. Thinking about his dad makes him turn on his phone, even though he knows it's a risk. He can see that there are a number of messages from him. He doesn't open them. He can't face that right now. Just as he's about to turn the phone off again, it flashes, announcing a message from Dan Jansen. Wanker. The insult drifts into Ollie's head without malice, just through habit. He doesn't feel any focused loathing towards Janssen anymore. It's more of a general frustration at his existence, simply a wish that the man had never been born, because his existence has ruined everything. How's it going? Ollie isn't sure what to reply. He has to say something to justify taking Dan's money. We're at Fiona's. The response is almost instantaneous. Find anything? No. Ollie thinks that whilst true, that response is perhaps a bit discouraging. He is discouraged, but feels a responsibility not to pass it on, so he adds, Not yet. Keep looking. He resents being given instructions, especially from Janssen. He switches his phone off, rolls over to face the wall, his back hunched like a shell. 
He lies there for a while, but just can't get to sleep. How is it possible to feel so jaded and yet so alert at the same time? Exasperated with himself, he gets up and starts to mooch around the house. Directionless, but somehow believing he might as well. The walls are all painted pink, peach, or orange. He recalls Lee saying it was like the sunset could be inside and out, that it was warm and cocooning. Ollie thinks that at night the place looks like a bad trip. The orange is more of a threatening blood red, and the walls close in around him. More claustrophobic than comforting. He moves from room to room, looking on shelves, rooting through drawers. It's hopeless and pointless. He's unlikely to find a signed confession from Fiona, or indeed anything that incriminates her. If there was anything here, the police would have found it already. It's easier to go back to hating Janssen and trusting Fiona. He should just pocket the grand and not think about it anymore. It seems like an easy solution, but nothing in Ollie's life is easy, really. He worries whether it's legal to take the money if he's not using it on legit expenses to investigate. Whatever the hell that might mean. Should he tell his dad about it? But then, does it matter, as Janssen is most likely going to prison for years? The whole thing is a mess. His life is a mess, and running away has just made it messier. He roots around the kitchen and finds a big bag of crisps. Salt and vinegar flavour. He flops on the enormous couch and stares at his own reflection in the large window opposite him. It usually affords great views, but in the black of night, all he can see is himself as he shoves handfuls of crisps in his mouth. That's when he spots it. It's not exactly a case of finding evidence. It's a little less than that. But it is something. He's found an absence. There was always a whole selection of framed photographs on the coffee table, all in different, not real, silver frames. Ollie remembers because he has always thought it was a bit annoying. The frames were in the way if you wanted to put your feet up on the coffee table when you were stretching out watching TV. Whenever they wanted to play a game of Monopoly or cards on a wet day, they had to carefully move them all to one of the shelves. Fiona was really into taking photos. She had loads of them all around the house. Ollie had often idly looked at the pics, vaguely wondering about other people's good times or good times he was part of, but could only loosely recall. Christmases, holidays, birthdays. Many of the photos were of the Fletchers. Most of them, he realises now. He hasn't given that much thought before. Never questioned where photos of Fiona's family and other friends were. There were some really old photos of Fiona and Lee, from before Mark, Ollie and Seb were part of their lives. In those, the two women looked drunk and skinny and were smiling like loons, arms flung around one another. There were some of him and Seb when they were really young and at various milestones of their lives. First day of school, collecting football trophies, that sort of thing. Thank fuck the end of year prom was cancelled because otherwise Fiona would have insisted on taking like a hundred photos of him in a suit, which would have been mortifying. There were photos of them with their dad in TGI Friday, where Seb was wearing a hat made of balloons, messing about on Fiona's boat here in Lyme Regis. Ollie gazes at the familiar display and realises it is no longer that. The photos of his mum and Fiona are gone. The ones of them skinny and smiling, and the one taken on Fiona's 40th in Paris. In fact, all the photos of Lee are missing. There was one of her toasting marshmallows on the beach, silhouetted against the sunset. A sleepy Seb propped next to her, 
Ollie always liked that photo. He knew it was taken the first time he tried cider. There was one of his mum and dad's wedding, a formal one, taken by the official photographer. Fiona was in the shot too, because she was the bridesmaid. His dad was always making that lame joke about a thorn between two roses. Pathetic, but memorable. And there was a photo of Ollie himself with Lee, perched on a branch of a tree they'd both climbed. He was 13 at the time. Seb tried to follow them up, but just didn't have the height. Ollie recalls sitting on the branch and enjoying the feeling of sneaky triumph that he had his mother to himself for a few minutes. But where is Lee now? He stands up and swiftly moves around the house to check the other places where he knows Fiona displays photos, the fridge, the dressing table in her bedroom. There are no photos of Lee. She's disappeared. She's been eradicated. It's possible that Fiona took down all the pictures of Lee because it made her sad to look at them. People do that, and other strange things when they're grieving. But when would she have had the opportunity to do that? She told the police that she hadn't been here since October. He remembers hearing her confirm that to the woman police officer, who put him in mind of the small terrier that lives next door, tiny but punchy. It's possible that someone else took down Lee's pictures. Possible, but not likely. Because who? No one has been allowed to leave their house from the week after she went missing until today. Ollie is trying to be calm and logical, to use the clever brain that Lee believed in to prove her right. He doesn't want to be an impetuous kid too ready to jump to fanciful conclusions. All that said, he is sure that Fiona made his mum vanish. He reaches for his phone, switches it on, and then quickly types. Got something. Got her. He's so sure, and the thought terrifies him, but also lights him up. He's solving this for his mother. Well, for Lee. Whatever. The ticks do not change from grey to blue, which is frustrating. Ollie feels alert, agitated, pumped. He waits for another twenty minutes, and the ticks stay resolutely grey. Eventually, he accepts that as they are an hour ahead in the Netherlands, Dan Janssen is probably asleep. His own eyelids are getting heavy. He yawns and goes back to bed, pulling the duvet up to his chin. He can deal with this in the morning. Chapter 29 Fiona Fiona stands outside the bungalow and considers what to do next. The curtains are drawn suggesting her hunch was correct. The boys are most likely inside. Probably asleep now because it's almost two in the morning. They've no doubt made themselves at home. They know where the sheets are kept, how to switch on the immersion heater. Her eyes scan across the lump of mud-coloured beach. She doesn't like the bungalow. Never has, really. She bought a place here because Lee liked this part of the world, and the boys did, and Mark. She reasoned that if she had a property in the area they wanted to holiday, she would become central to their plans, their lives. And her strategy worked. Kylie and Mark would never have been able to afford a second home. Some years they could hardly afford a holiday. That's why this place became useful. They always jumped at the opportunity to holiday for free here. By buying the property, she avoided feeling like a spare part. She was integral. God knows why Lee liked this spot so much. 
The beaches on this coast are sand or pebbles in most places, but right where Fiona's bungalow is situated, it's more of a case of fifty shades of mud. Spring, summer, autumn, and winter, all year. The coastal bit, a paler mud. The cliff top, darker mud. The sea sometimes looks like mud too. Liquid mud, like brown sauce, slow and gloopy. But Kylie could never see it. She thought being here was joyful. There was nothing she liked more than walking along the beach, searching for shells, getting damp with spray and then insisting that they warm up again by drinking tea from a flask and eating tasty sandwiches that she'd prepared that morning before any of them were even out of bed. Fiona remembers how much of a fuss she made, peeling back the tin foil and announcing, Ham and mustard! Or egg and cress! As though she was revealing the lottery numbers. The boys and Mark would indulge her, act as though eating a few sandwiches on the beach was really something special. The fuss they made when she brought along sausage rolls. The whole thing was ludicrous disproportionate. They were all in her thrall. Kylie was spoilt. Fiona remembers the time when Kylie suggested they build a fire pit on the beach and roast marshmallows. The boys drank hot chocolate. The adults drank cider. Ollie begged for a sip. And when Mark wasn't paying attention, Kylie allowed him to have one. He then proceeded to act far drunker than could have been possible after just a couple of mouthfuls, playing to the crowd. They all laughed a lot. Then he picked up his guitar, something he was often shy about doing. Maybe the alcohol had emboldened him, or maybe just Kylie's encouragement. They listened to the waves accompanying the music, and eventually Seb was lulled to sleep. Mark carried him back to the bungalow, all the way up the steps. It was a wonderful night. There was a lot of laughter. Fiona remembers that. And the thought makes her want to kick something or someone. Because it isn't fair. It isn't fair to have all that and want more. To mess everything up for everyone else. Truthfully, there hasn't been much laughing since Kylie went missing and died. Technically, Fiona knows that is her fault, but really, the blame lies with Kylie herself. It should have been enough for her. She should have been grateful. Fiona is the one carrying the load here. She is the one left to pick up the pieces. She knows that she needs to make the boys smile again. Laugh. They have to trust her and like her if she is ever going to replace Kylie completely. And why shouldn't she? It isn't unreasonable to think that one day she might become their stepmother. Mark and the boys need her. She is needed. They just don't necessarily know how much they need her yet. She sighs at the enormity of the task. First, she has to get them to go home. Get them away from here. This place gives her the creeps. It is impossible not to think of that final night. Not the happiest of things to recall, obviously. Details keep smashing into her head. Kylie's bruises, her blistered mouth, her filthy body. Fiona is not a monster. She doesn't want to think about that sort of thing. About Kylie's last moments. Better to think about the kindnesses Fiona showed her. She made a pasta supper, poured bath salts into the bath, warmed a fluffy towel for her. She didn't have to do any of that, but she did. Kylie got what was coming to her. Her just desserts, but still... It was uncomfortable dwelling. Fiona tries the door. It is locked. She keeps a secret spare key in the shed. Something she's never told anyone.
not even the Fletchers. Despite all the occasions they've stayed with her, there has been no need. It's a matter of security. Privacy. Her senses are on high alert, and as she eases open the shed door, she is hit with the smell of bagged manure, rust and dust, with a heavy kick from the tar on the roof, still warm from the day of sunshine. She retrieves the key from under a pile of plastic plant pots and quietly lets herself into her house. She nearly trips on the boys' trainers, which have been kicked off and abandoned at the door. She recalls the hundreds of times Kylie yelled, Shoes off, boys! Don't trail sand and mud everywhere! They listened, which Fiona ought to be grateful for, but somehow this act of obedience niggles. She feels Kylie's influence stretch like a shadow late in the afternoon. She locks the door behind her and then pockets the key Ollie